Okay, we are recording and back. <laughs> Maybe you can. We're almost back. There's <laughs> Tammy. We have a few discussions going on and we'll be get right to our work session. Okay, so we did print out, so if you guys want to take notes. So, oh, good. yeah, Yay. just because otherwise it's a lot of information. So, so I'll give you the agenda. You guys probably have the agenda, but okay, I'll give you guys the handout. And then I'll also, everything will go up on the screen. But. <laughs> <clears throat> should help if you want to take notes. And then um Peggy, um if you want I can if you want paper copies of this stuff, um I can email you a packet. Please do that because okay. I have a printer here. So I've got the agenda already. Okay, then I'll do that. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. No, just just one. I'll hand them out as they come. Yeah, Otherwise it's a big know. stack and it's hard to yeah. I didn't want it to, yeah, feel overwhelming. Rebecca, are you are you ready? <laughs> Who's first? Good morning. First. Good morning. I don't think I'm first. You're not first. Oh, no, first Melissa. Melissa. oh sorry, Melissa. Melissa, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, do you want me to wait for Janina? All right. No? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Good. I'm going to kick things off if you don't mind. Please. Excellent. So, um, commissioners... I'm going to acknowledge up front that this is going to be a long work session for all of you. So please take care of yourselves, um, stand, use the restrooms, get water, do what you need to do to feel comfortable today. Uh, we do have lunch coming in and have a, a lunch break planned. If you want to make that alert working lunch, we'll leave that up to you. Um, today's goal is really to Hope you have a better understanding of the programs that are um, operated by the State Library and our current goals, as well as the goals for the coming biennium, and then to help you understand the resource needs and gaps that we have that we can then talk about as we're thinking about what our legislative requests look like. Um, Every presenter has a handout for you. I really encourage you to listen, note your questions, note your comments, um, so that you can be reminded of our discussions here today when we get into our deeper discussions about our requests in April. I'm glad to hear some of the pre-meeting recordings and additional materials that we shared with you were helpful. Uh, we really want to set you up for success in helping to better understand these programs. Uh, one of the other things that you've asked us for is, is more talking points so you can better explain the work of the State Library. We hope that today will help facilitate some of that as well. As Again, as you're listening and, and learning about the programs that we offer, if something resonates with you, write it down and, and use that as a talking point when you're talking about your role as commissioners. Um, as you've seen from the agenda, we have a very long session for you. Each presenter is going to present from between five to 10 minutes. We do want that time to allow for questions and some discussion with you, but it is going to be a, a lot of information for you to take in. Um, I outlined the um, my my hopes for today, and I shared those with you in your meeting materials. But I just want to reiterate them here again. Our goal is for you to feel confident in your understanding of our programs and our programs' desired outcomes and impacts. We want you to recognize and understand how much we value the processes that we go through to use data and evaluation tools to evaluate and plan for our services. We want you to, to better understand some of the resources, including staff and financial resources that are necessary for us to achieve our goals. And then we hope that this process will help us have really meaningful discussions in your next commission meetings as we plan for the next biennium. And, and then 
finally, I know that you are going to hear a lot of enthusiasm and passion from our staff as they talk about our work. Um, our work, as I've said before, it's driven by statute. There is Montana law behind every service that we offer. And some of these programs we have been administering quite literally for decades. Some of them, like our real-time network, are very new. Um, we always are guided by statute, by evaluation, and, and really most critically from the feedback from our users, our stakeholders, um, when we think about the work that we're offering. It's, it's why user-driven services is the key value of our state library. And so you have in some of your materials and, and staff will share with you the feedback from our stakeholders about these services. And I hope that that will, again, provide you some good information as, as we reflect on where we are taking these programs into the future. Um, we're going to kind of go in order and our central services staff are going to go first. Uh, again, just ask that as they share this information, make note of your questions and when they're done, there'll be time for you to ask questions of them. Someone online from the public asked if a public comment could be made like at one time, are we going to do maybe a lot of public comment through each topic? If you're going to do it um, at the top. I, I, you know, I think of the public comment is pertaining to or questions pertaining to a particular topic, we'd like it during that topic. And we're going to work really hard to try to be done by three o'clock. Any questions about the goals for the work session today? I have a timeline question. Will the legislative request be an ongoing through our next several meetings? Do we see a timeline on that? Our budget requests are due to the governor's office on June 6th. Okay. So we need to be quite clear today in April about what we see as our... So I think that's an important timeline to keep. That's why I think one of the main goals today was to start hearing from the commissioners what their goals are for the legislative session. And I think that with just April to do that, we need to, unless we call for Zoom meetings or something special, we need to really be taking part throughout this. Okay. And I put on the screen the legislative um, executive planning calendar. Right. Yeah. So that also goes. Mm -hmm. All right, Melissa's gonna go first. Thank you. As you all know, I supervise the central services team and that means that we oversee and support all of the groups that you're gonna hear from today through human resources, through the procurement process, through finance and accounting and budgeting um, and anything else miscellaneous that pops up that our staff needs support from. Um, I'm really proud of our team and we we do a great job supporting the agency. Um, there is one um, concern that we have had for a long time. I'm Some of you will remember that we talked about this during the last legislative session, if you were here, um, and that is the, the issue of our um, modified FTEs at the State Library. During the last, this time, two years ago, actually, during the last legislative process, we talked about this same handout. It's actually just been updated. So if it looks familiar, that's why. Um, we also had a special meeting with Representative Beatty, who is the chair of our Section E subcommittee um, to discuss this issue as well. This was um, approved by the commission during the last legislative committee to move forward to the governor's office um, and be submitted into his budget. So a little bit of um, background on a modified FTE. Um, a modified FTE is different than a permanent FTE. A permanent FTE is included in our budget and moves forward from biennium to biennium. A modified FTE is 
um, the, it looks the same to you. Many of our staff are modified FTE. They've been here decades, more 10 plus years. Um, but in this, in the accounting system, it's different because they are not part of the year over year FTE count in order to uh, acquire a modified FTE, you have to submit a request to the governor's office. They review it and approve it at that point for whatever duration they uh, seem to they deem fit. Um, the typical use of a modified FTE is for a short-term position. You don't need it year over year. You need it for a, a certain period of time or to cover a certain grant that only extends for a short period of time. Um, but what's happened with the state library, I'll give the example of our budget cuts that happened in 2017. When we received those budget cuts that were very significant, the FTE that were associated with those dollars were removed. Subsequent to that, in the next biennium, those dollars were reinstated to us. However, the FTE were not. So here we have the dollars, but we don't have the the mechanism within the accounting system to hire that person. So that process looks like we now go to the budget office every single year and say, we've got this money, but we don't have this permanent position. Would you please approve this modified FTE so that we can retain this person who, you know, this position that has been on staff for many, many, many years. So that's how we use modifieds a little differently than other agencies do. Um, so, our request here and something that we'd like to talk with you about is um, asking the governor's office to include these FTE in our request for the legislative session. So just to be clear there, it's this is a no dollar request. We already have the dollars in our budget. We're just asking for this, this mechanism so that we don't have to go to the governor's office every year for each of these staff and request approval again. There's 17 last time. Is that what? Last time there were 17. You'll notice that number has gone down. And that is um, because of our transition when we moved the Talking Book Library um, administrative support services to the to the state of Utah. Those position, we had four positions that um, answered the phones and supported the Talking Book patrons. That is now done at Utah. And so we had those four positions. We were able to move four people that were in modified positions into those permanent positions. So now we have a smaller request for permanent positions. Madam Chair, um, I'm sorry that I this is not real clear to me. We have the money, we need the positions. Why aren't, and now, first of all, does the 52 people that we have for our library, is that include those modified FTE? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. So why haven't we just transferred them to permanent? What's blocking us? I know you said you're requesting it every year and you don't, but- That would have to go through the legislative process and be approved by the legislature. And that has not been done in the past. But I don't know how it ever happened that we have permanent people being called modified. I, I don't understand the history of that or how it happened. I know you said in the beginning it was meant, and you said you use it differently than other agencies. How do other agencies use the modified FTE? Is it really modified for them, like part-time mm -hmm. in yours? Yep, a lot but, of people use modifieds for, let's, for example, if they have a one-year grant and they need to hire a staff right. for one year to just do the work of that grant. Um, the, the easiest example that I can give you is the 20 are the 2017 budget right. cuts that we had. So they cut, I can't remember, um, two, two plus million dollars. They also cut five FTE. So then in the next session, when they, so those were modified people, you cut were permanent. Those were permanent staff. So they said, we're going to cut $2 million and we're cutting five FTE. So they you moved them to modified. They took them away. They were zero. Okay. So, so then the last five people mm -hmm. in, in a subsequent biennium, the right. legislature restored that funding, right? But they did not give us back the FTE. Okay. So in order for us to spend the money that they gave back, we have to request modifieds every year. So we're asking for that, for okay. those, for those permanent positions back 
to go with that funding that was restored. A related question, Madam Chair. Um, so how did other agencies deal with that? I'm assuming the budget cuts hit every agency and every agency lost money and FTEs? Um, while some agencies did lose funding, the state library lost approximately 30% of its funding. And that is not um, what was happening through across other agencies. They lost small, maybe one, two or 3% of their funding. And it, it wasn't um, the same for every agency. Our agency was very unique that year. And then the um, follow-up to that, um, did other agencies get their FTEs cut as well? And how did they deal with that problem when, when the funding came back, but not the positions? And I'm puzzled that that was done in the first place. I am too. Well, it depends, I mean, from agency, it depends from agency to agency and biennium to biennium. In any given biennium during the legislature, positions are cut or given. And in larger agencies, I mean, this, this kind of thing happens all the time. They take 10 FTE from here, but then they want to create a new program in a different area. So they add FTE over there. The, the reason that it's um, sort of monumental for the state library is because we're so small of an agency. And so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but other agencies may have gotten positions taken during these same cuts, but they were so minimal that it didn't, it didn't necessarily affect the operations of the organization. And then when we got the funding back, the, we, the state library had a choice to spend it on software or FTEs. And we decided we needed the people back and assigned that money and created modified FTEs because that was the only way to get these people back. Am, am I understanding the the process back then? I think I think that's fair to say yes. Okay, Madam Chair, when you actually made the five E cut, where did we actually go from fifty two people to forty seven, or did we just move them to modified FTEs? Did we actually lose people? Yeah, we laid off about a dozen staff at that okay. time. Okay, so we laid off about a dozen, went from 52 to 40. Mm -hmm. And then when we got the money back, okay. I, I'm not sure if this helps or not, but the legislature appropriates appropriation to spend dollars and FTE kind of in separate buckets. Yeah, it sounds like. Okay. So we got, we, we have funding. We got funding restored as Melissa described. We have funding, we have federal funding, we have state special and the legislature appropriates the dollars that we can spend from those buckets, but they also have to appropriate the FTE. And as Melissa said, they've not appropriated the FTE. And so it's inefficient for us every single year to have to go back to the budget office and ask for the authority from them to have these staff, even though, um, you know, when we look at our staff and some of them are sitting here, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're considered modified. So this is really, a, it's, it's an efficiency request. It, you know, we're not asking for cash, as Melissa said, um, we're asking for the legislature to appropriate those FTE as permanent FTE to help with the administrative workload of administering that process. Follow-up question. Um, was there a purpose behind the legislature not um, appropriating those FTEs or was this an oversight or how did that not go together with it, the funding? It, it, it's very typical for the, the legislature and I, I hate to speak for a former legislator, no, but uh, for legislature <laughs> to, to be somewhat reticent about appropriating FTE because of of uh, the appearance appearance that we're growing government, um, this is actually a, something that's being studied during this interim as well. And Chair Beatty, our interim budget chair, has asked for the commission's opinion on whether or not we will be seeking these these modified FTE to become permanent in this session. Madam Chair, yeah. So it it looks bad when you when you add employees. So it's kind of an ideological um, stance. 
that is being taken. Um, so the benefit to our agency in if this change was made was that it'd be it would simplify things. We don't have to send a letter to the budget office every year or biennium saying, can we have these employees again? But it's routine and it happens. Uh, so, uh, but I don't expect that <clears throat> there's a lot of money to be saved by not sending that letter. Um, I think that there's a, um, an intangible, but real benefit to employees in feeling secure in their positions. Uh -huh. Might be the, the the thing that uh, that we as employers and and those employees might might uh, be looking for with this change, but I don't see there's a big change in uh, that. It's a, it's a heavy lift for us to request that, and it's routine. So there's there's a it's a little bit more than just sending a letter, but um, you know it's it's probably at least several hours of work for our staff as well as the governor's staff per FTE to have to go through the accounting steps to approve that process. Question, Madam Chair? Uh, Jenny, would you say that's several hours per employee? Melissa? Several hours per employee per year. It, it also just adds work when you're... If, for example, when the legislature pulls their reporting, modifieds don't show up there. So it's a manual effort to add these things back into the reporting to make it look like it's supposed to look it, because th those funds come in a different account. It, I'm, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but for the reporting purposes and just logistically, it, it does add a lot of work for the accounting staff. It's another thing you have to think about. Oh, right, 25% of these staff are showing up here. We've got to move them over here and budget it like this. Um, just quickly, I do want to add um, to the to the point I was making just a few seconds ago. It, there, it does add a, a significant layer of transparency to have staff in permanent FTE because then it shows up in the accounting system where it's supposed to be. That means when the legislature pulls their reports, the data is there when, and it's going to match my report. So right now, if you look at my reporting online, it doesn't match what the legislature is reporting. They have to add that back in manually to make the numbers tie. So it saves time. It definitely adds a level of transparency. It makes the process more seamless for budgeting. It does add um, a level of comfort for staff who have been modified for many, many years. Madam Chair, could you quantify the um, person hours possibly saved? Let me let me think about let me talk to our accountant and get back to you on that. Thank you. Madam Chair. So, yes. Um, I did support doing this last year um, when we had our legislative. Um, and I think what what carried it for me, I uh, I'm concerned about the extra work time. I think that's not necessary. Um, it doesn't seem honest to me. It just doesn't seem honest. It doesn't ring true that these people are really full-time people. And and it's easier to play games politically. That, that does bother me because we're dealing with actually people's lives. And my third reason was the main reason, which is I think it's unfair to have these long-term, very good people who are on a modified and not knowing year to year. I think we can lose some really good people that way. I do like to see the whole picture before I support something. And I feel somewhat like we are only hearing one side of the picture. And I think that picture is really, it, it was enough for me last year, and it still is, that I would support changing the FTE. I'm trying and get rid of the modified or whatever, make them ask requests that they be full. Um, other than I, there were only two people made comments. One person said, re, repeat on what you did, Tom, that it, it comes off as if we're growing government because these people go from modified to full time. Well, they already are. It's not changing. Um, somebody mentioned something. I don't know why or who at that hearing about um, 
unionizing that they that they were concerned about government unionizing and this became some of that numbers i i don't know where that goes or what that was that made no sense to me i do remember that discussion would that affect it and then um is it harder to make cutbacks if we had to make cutbacks or let a job go because we no longer need it it's not being used like you said with the talking books when we went to utah we could let go for does it become harder to do that if they're regular FT, permanent FTD and not modified? No, there's no change in our internal process. That would still be a reduction in force, and we would have to follow the state's policies okay. for that process. But it doesn't matter if that person is in a modified or a permanent. Well, for me, this should be part of my agenda with the legislature, but that's just my feeling. So can you tell me, I'm sorry, so is it 13 FT, FTE we're asking for or 12? 12. Any other questions for Melissa? I have one. I just wanted, what was the response when we did put this forward last year? They just flat out wouldn't take it in. I can't remember. It, it, wasn't, didn't. it wasn't one of the items that the governor's office moved forward in his budget. Okay. Well, I agree with Tammy. I would support this. Me too. I would be, I support it also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate your support. Um, and we'll talk about this again in April. I do want to remind the commission that um, we, I don't want you to feel pressured to make decisions about supporting things today. Today is really about learning and asking these really good questions. That's what we want you to be able to do. There will be time again in April for your questions as well. So, But I think in fairness mm -hmm. to you, if there is something presented that we, a majority, do not see as moving forward, we need to share that with you so you don't just lose time and effort. So I think, you know, it would be important. But I this thank you, Melissa. Okay, one more question, please. Um, I think I understand now what a permanent is, what the purpose of a modified is. What is a proprietary FTE? So a proprietary FTE is a, it can either be a modified or it can be a permanent. And the only difference is that it is that person is paid out of a proprietary fund. Thank you. Okay. Question on that. Are proprietary funds only enterprise funds or can they be just something that is dedicated say a federal funded position? So federal funds cannot be intertwined with proprietary funds. They have to, a proprietary fund must always be kept separate from federal funds. The same with state special revenue. They are all kept in separate pots and reported on differently. The same goes for general fund. Please give an example of a proprietary fund. Sure. Well, we have one, a new one. It's called the real-time network. Okay. Um, and so it, it is a, it is where in this particular instance, it is where an agency is providing a service to the public and charging a fee for it um, in, in the effort to make enough money to self-sustain the program, and that's it. Please give an example of a proprietary fund that's not an enterprise fund, if there is such a thing. Um, a, so a, an agency can provide a service to other agencies and charge a fee for it, and so it's not outside of the state outside providing a service to outside state government is providing a service to state government. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, Carmen's question made me think of something. If per se the legislature says they're giving a 3% increase for budget or salary increase for everyone in your staff, does that presently include the modified FTE or doesn't it? I am so glad you asked that question, Tammy. It does not. So okay. when you when the legislature decides to give an inflationary increase, that increase is only given for those that are in permanent positions. Okay. So everybody, the law states though that every employee must get that raise. So we have to find that money from another place and transfer it into that account. So we still have to cover um that that in that cost but for the modifieds it comes internally um 
Now, one thing I do want to mention is that 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 happens for all fund types. So this is a hot topic. A lot of legislators are talking about that specific to the general fund because it builds an increase into the general fund. Does, but but the majority, if you'll look at the fund on the chart on the last page, the majority of our modified staff are paid with other sources of funding. And so we don't, we just don't, we have the cash there to pay it, but we only, the amount of appropriation is an increase. So we are, we, the law dictates that we have to pay an increase. We don't get increased appropriation for it, but the cash is sitting there. So that's another reason to oh. make these modifieds permanent because we, let's say we have a person that's paid with federal funds, our federal grant that let's say they make $10 an hour and it's supposed to go to $10 and 50 cents an hour. Well, our appropriation for, for that person stays at $10 per hour even though we have to pay them $10 and 50 cents per hour. So that means we have to find appropriation someplace else to pay the staff that extra money. Whereas if this were a permanent position, the the way the accounting system works is they they type that in. Okay, the legislature said we have to give 50 cent increases. So it, it adds the 50 cents appropriation in savers. So then we would get $10 and 50 cents in federal appropriation to pay the staff. But it sounds like they gave you the budget increase to cover that. Only if it's a, a permanent. Effort. Right. But you said they gave us the money and it's there, but they wouldn't, we couldn't use it for the modified FTE. So it feels like they did give you the money. You can't use it. But then I, from their viewpoint, if you make these permanent, now you're asking for additional monies, even though they would say they gave it in the budget. Don't forget the difference between cash and appropriation. Right. So um, it, Melissa's describing moving yeah. appropriation, not adding cash. Right. It, I, I would just say that the, the fact that we have to continually have this conversation is, year after year after yeah. year is another reason to consider this change because it is so confusing for everyone. And it really is not transparent. You know, the, the, the process should be that we have these permanent staff, if we know we're going to be um, maintaining a program in perpetuity, then we should have the permanent FTE and just be transparent about all of the accounting processes involved with that process. But it wouldn't show up in our legislative request as all of a sudden 12 salaries plus the 3% brand new in our budget. Zero. It will be a it zero dollar. You said. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It is deliberately obtuse by the legislature. You said it. <laughs> <laughs> Very clearly. Sorry, Tom. Madam Chair, <laughs> what's the charge per journal line in Sabres? That's a great question. We get one big fat bill every year, so I'm not sure of the charge per line, but I can I can get that for you. I did hear back from our accountant, and I used to do this work too, so I can understand where she's coming from. It it takes about when she sets aside a whole week to go through and request all of these FTE. You have to provide a lot of backup documentation. It it's a several weeks long process with the governor's office that goes back and forth and through several layers of um, approvals. And then you're right, there are also the per line charge, per, per line charges and sabers. Um, and so anyway, she says it's about, she sets aside probably close to 40 hours per year, which isn't nothing that adds up. Follow up. So if this person was not spending that 40 hours, how would we see savings? We could be doing other things like pulling reports for you, Tom. Okay. Huh? <laughs> Any other questions for Melissa? I really appreciate your good questions. This is exactly what the day is designed for. So thank you. Could I ask one question, Madam Chair? Um, realistically, how likely is this request going to, to, to be approved? 
I would say perhaps more likely than we've ever seen because the legislature is studying this issue. Um, and, and one of their questions is how pervasive is this issue across state government? So I'm curious to know the outcome of that legislative study. And as I said, uh, Chair Beatty has asked for input from this commission on whether or not you'll be carrying forward this request. So I, I feel more optimistic than I have ever about making this request to the legislature. Um, we haven't had conversations with the governor's office about it. All right. Um, Rebecca is here to talk to you about our research agenda. Yes, good morning. I'm Rebecca Camp. I'm the Montana State Library Data Coordinator. Genevieve's passing around a handout, but I'm also going to give her just a moment because I prepared a slide deck to share with you. Uh, while she's passing those out, though, I'll just mention that what I'm going to be presenting on is one of our research efforts that comes from the State Library called the Public Library Survey. And in addition to that, I will be talking about establishing a research agenda. So my job at the State Library is analyzing information to help the library make smart decisions, track progress, and communicate outcomes. And we'll discuss some of the techniques that MSL uses to analyze its work, which my hope will, is that it will set the stage for other presentations you'll hear today from staff and partners. So we'll pause for just a moment because I have a diagram I would like to show you. So we can move to that second slide, please. So in a business setting, success is often evaluated using financial metrics. In the public sector, evaluation emphasizes impact, impact on society, communities, and people, which requires a combination of different quantitative and qualitative data. This diagram that you see on the screen was developed by Professor Mark Moore from the Harvard Kennedy School of Management. It's called Moore's Strategic Triangle. And what it does is it helps us consider three interconnected concepts, operational capacity, and we can go back. <laughs> That's okay, preview. <laughs> um, operational capacity, legitimacy and support, and public value. And you can see those at each of the corners there of the triangle. According to Moore, aligning these three elements is critical for success. It's like a feedback system. So if we create public value, citizens and decision makers will trust us more and securing resources becomes easier. So when we're running a service or a project through this model, there's some questions that we ask. We ask, do we have the capacity to carry out this project? Does it bring real value to our community? And is there political support? Next slide, please. While the strategic triangle focuses on the big picture of public value creation, we also work with something called a logic model or public value chain. And what this does is it breaks down the components of a project or program into the inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. And we establish indicators and metrics for each of these. Um, so on the screen, what you see is what we track and where we report it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on each of these, but some of them probably should look familiar from your, your agenda for each commission meeting, the work plan, the financial report, and I've included it in your handout as well. This evidence helps us evaluate library services to make sure they're effective, efficient, and truly valuable to the public that we serve. And we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to use these frameworks to talk about one of our research efforts, the Public Library Survey. And so let's take a closer look at that. Um, the Public Library Survey is an annual survey conducted by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. You may have heard them called IMLS. And IMLS is a federal agency. They support museums and libraries to advance innovation, uh, lifelong learning, and cultural and civic engagement. The Public Library Survey, or PLS, collects data from 9,000 libraries across the country, inc and including its territories. So it gives a comprehensive view of the library landscape. In Montana, all 82 public libraries and the seven tribal college libraries participate. MSL and the local libraries invest a significant amount of staff resources in this project, so it's important to evaluate it. 
And at the top of the screen here in the navy blue uh, box, what you see is the value proposition for the public library survey. So in the public sector, um, we have a value proposition which describes the unique benefit that a program or project delivers to the public. And in the case of the PLS, um, the benefit is that it helps decision makers and experts make smart choices about how they run libraries so that people in Montana can easily get the information they need whenever they need it. And so I don't have enough time to go over all of the details in this logic model, but I hope that you have time to look at it through the handout later. Um, what I've done is I've put together some of the, the items that I track, including time, budget, and effort. And one of the key outcomes that I've identified is that through the PLS, leadership learns about library trends and performance resulting in more relative or excuse me, relevant and fiscally responsible services for Montanans. And to demonstrate this outcome, I've collected two different library profiles to share with you today. And so we can go to the next slide. Uh, the first is from Belgrade Community Library. And the library director, Gail Bacon, shared the following feedback with me regarding the infographics and reports generated from the public library survey. She said, I have shared this with my county council or sorry, city council, my immediate supervisor, library advisory board, library foundation, and county commissioners. I also share it with donors or include it with grant applications. It's easy to read and absorb. I find sharing reports like these of great benefit to key leaders and stakeholders. Belgrade's translated their PLS data into powerful messaging that has resulted in public trust and in political support. As Gail mentioned, she shares this data with local donors and leaders, and the work is evident in her data that we see in the PLS. We could take a look at that on the next slide. Over the last 10 years, Belgrade Library has seen 197% growth in other operating revenue. And what that is, is it's the grants and monetary donations. Belgrade Library has taken considerable effort to use reports to streamline their processes regarding library material circulation, account administration, and collection development. All of this using state library software. This saves time for their staff so that they can focus on what really matters, providing service to the community. And on the next slide, I have a profile from the North Lake County Public Library District in Polson. I interrupt. Madam Chair. Yeah. I'm uh, uh, lived in Belgrade three times, and it was in my legislative district at one time. And um, just like to point out that at least twice they were named the best small library in America. Yeah. And if you go to PLS, you can see cost per visitation of libraries. And um, it's really interesting. Um, libraries in Montana that have oil wells in their counties. Um, one of those where I used to live has a cost per visitation of about $21. Kind of a median is about $7 every time somebody walks through the door. The cost uh, divided by persons divided into, into operating expenses in the six, seven, eight dollar range is kind of normal. And bill grades about half that. So they're doing that's perhaps one thing that um, the library director there has been using to show value. Yeah, so that's that's really great. Call out around there and say, hey, look, we do a lot with, with not very much money. And uh, so we're a good source for your private philanthropy. Absolutely. Thank you for that call out. And uh, just in disclosure, that's my home library as well. So, <laughs> yep. Uh, and the second library is also impressive. This is the North Lake County Public Library District, which is up in Polson. And the library director, Abby Dooley, shared with me that um, this comment, without detailed library data, it's difficult to truly gauge how useful a service or program is to our patrons. And if it is the best use of library funds, it's helpful to see trends over time. And we utilize this information to make better informed decisions. The Montana State Library makes it so easy to gather this information and our library trustees find it invaluable. So what this looks like in practice in Polson is the library staff uses their data collection to monitor and report to their library board of trustees, which allows the staff and leadership to pivot and reallocate their limited resources to those services that have the highest relevance and impact on their community. And on the next slide, we have some of their PLS data. 
So in examining their data, we can see that Northlake has succeeded in delivering efficient high interest programs that attract more attendees on average, both in comparison to themselves, looking back at previous years and in comparison to their population peer group. So both Belgrade and Northlake, and we can go to the next slide, um, they demonstrate the value of the public library survey and how it's being used around the state. But thinking back to our strategic triangle, we can now talk about the PLS in terms of feasibility. As part of measuring my inputs for this program, I monitored the time I spent on coordinating the PLS this fall. And between training sessions and answering library questions, I spent about 160 hours of my time. And you can kind of see the, the different efforts that were broken out in that time. Uh, on the output side, we had a 97% response rate, receiving data from all but three of the 89 libraries. So this is an excellent data set. Uh, we could use it to conduct meaningful research on the state of libraries in Montana. However, we've encountered a practical issue on this corner of the triangle. As the sole research analyst at the State Library, I'm the only one working on this project. So to turn this data into meaningful research and to meet the other analysis needs outside of the public libraries, the State Library needs to consider additional staff or support for research. Um, the number of staff that we have directly influences the amount of research that we can provide. Having another analyst on staff would help the State Library better address research questions from the State Library Commission, our legislature, and our partners. And to better operate within our capacity, I have another recommendation um, for setting priorities, which we will talk about in just a moment. And we can turn to the next slide, please. During the recent legislative session and in the interim, there's been a noticeable emphasis on data and measurable objectives. There's a renewed interest in tracking long-term outcomes of learners in Montana as they move from classrooms to the workforce, as has been discussed by the Section E Interim Committee. To date, this effort's focused on OPI and on the Department of Labor, Labor but it's easy to imagine how libraries also fit into that picture. There's a growing need for this type of research across all agencies to include the State Library. The Public Library Survey and our other research efforts help meet the expectations of our stakeholders who seek evidence of our work. In addition to possibly securing more staff, I'd like to propose that we develop a research agenda to provide focus and direction to our research. Establishing an agenda will assist us in planning and will help us stay within our operational capacity while still addressing the highest priority research needs. IMLS's Office of Research and Evaluation released its first learning agenda in 2023, and I think it's an excellent model that we can use to create our own plan. Um, and the digital version of my handout is a, a link that you can click on, but um, I did put the title of that in your handout if you'd like to look it up later. But in their agenda, they outline three research and evaluation priorities, and then the document guides their evidence gathering. Um, which in turn supports their strategic goals and objectives. They're very closely tied together. The agenda provides a basis for their annual performance report. And I think we can take a similar approach uh, with mindfulness of work on the near horizon. For example, the Montana Real-Time Network is a high priority project. The State Library announced that it will begin uh, accepting subscribers with first payments anticipated in July. As we roll out the new processes and procedures, this is something that we need to monitor and report on. The Network Advisory Council recommended that the State Library investigate library staffing and geographic barriers to library services. So those are some of the priorities that we're thinking about. Um, another benefit of establishing a research agenda is it provides an opportunity for us to think outside of the State Library. Who can we partner with um, other agencies and organizations that can help uh, complete some of this research. For example, we don't have an economist on staff, but we may be able to benefit for some, from some research like that. So as you discuss your goals and priorities and what you would like to address leading into the executive planning process and the legislative session, um, I hope you keep in mind what research that you'll need so that we can think about how to include that in our research agenda. Thank you. Any questions for Rebecca? Madam Chair, I have a very basic. Um, 
you made reference to 89 libraries in Montana, 82 public, seven tribal. And when I was listening to the hotspot report uh, that we were sent to study, they made that they had 210 libraries using the hotspots. Um, and that was what they used on that one. I'm I'm getting different numbers on how many libraries. I thought it was 116, 118. Is there is there a a solid number on how many libraries we Yeah, and I can answer that. Um, yeah, thank you. I can't rattle off the number off the top of my head, but what I can tell you is the 82 is what we call an administrative agency. So that's the central library, and then they may have branches. And so in okay. the hotspot, you're seeing branches. But those are our public libraries. We also have some academic libraries that participate in the hotspot program. So we have 82 libraries and then seven tribal. Correct. And then the rest, what's the best number for when we're talking with the public and explaining the budget and the staff? What's the number, Jenny, that that is most appropriate to you? The budget and staff of the state library or other libraries? Well, when people ask me quite often, you have 52 employees and this is your budget, how many libraries do you oversee? And we don't include the school, we don't include the university, but public libraries and the tribal, it's hard. we have I've been saying 118, but now I'm it's, thinking that's it, inaccurate. It, it, it's a little bit, it is confusing. Yeah. Um, and I understand that. And and maybe um, Karen and some of the others can make note of this question as well when you're thinking about your services. It depends on the service. When we talk about the Montana Shared Catalog, mm -hmm. uh, we support public, mm -hmm. school, tribal. I don't know if there's any academic in the shared catalog, um, but there's over 200, over 200 physical locations. So the 210 for hotspots was accurate. Right. When we're talking about the, um, the number of main libraries, when we distribute state aid yeah. to libraries, we distribute it to 82 public libraries and now the seven tribal college libraries are eligible. Um, with other services, other types of libraries participate. <laughs> Our statute says that we provide support and services to tax supported and public libraries. So it's broader than just the public libraries. There are other nuances in how we support them, like vendor contracts and, and other kinds of restrictions. So it, it depends. So I'm safe saying we have 89 libraries. We have 82 public libraries, main public libraries, seven tribal college libraries. Okay. And then there's the branch libraries, like mm -hmm. there's Shoto County has two branch libraries, but so that, they're not counted in okay. 82, that, just the that one. 116 includes the branches, oh, okay. I think it includes some bookmobiles, those service outlets. That's important. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like the modified FTE and the <laughs> permanent FTE. Very it's so. it's important to be accurate about how many people we're serving. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. that there's a big difference between 116 with the branches and the bookmobiles mm -hmm. as opposed to 82. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important number. Yeah. One other number I'll give you. Yeah. Over 400,000 Montanans have library cards. 400,000. Yeah. Brief comment. Mm -hmm. um, it might be worthwhile to think of the number 82 as library systems. Mm -hmm. Um and you keep it straight by talking about a system and that could be one branch or 15 mm. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things I really appreciate about this commission is, is your interest in um, data collection and analysis and reporting. Um, and I just want to reiterate, I think we do a great job, you know, and, and you're always pushing us to do more and think about how we evaluate our services in different ways. And that's fantastic. Um, it is Rebecca. Every time you make a request for us to add something or add a new dashboard or a new element to our existing dashboards, we're adding work to Rebecca. And, um, you know, we, we really need to be cognizant of that and what it means as an agency. And um, as she said, she is really maxed out. And as we want to do more, uh, we really need to think about what that means for our agency. So if I understand this correctly, what the goal of this is today is that when you present your admin or legislative recommendations for growth, 
you would like to add another staff for this and it would be called a research staffer i don't know that we thought about excuse me i don't know if we thought about the the occupation the the classification um i know rebecca has said someone to just help her manage the data itself kind of a data technologist mm -hmm. would be helpful to free up some of her time to do more of the um intensive research analysis so will this be an FTE or a modified FTE? <laughs> FTE, please. Thank you. I'm sorry, what? I said FTE, please. Thank you. <laughs> so now we need 13. <laughs> Any other questions for Rebecca? Excellent report. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. And I don't know if you've had a chance to meet Lee Fossum very often. Lee is our IT manager for the agency. So Lee, thanks for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Lee Fossum. I'm the uh, internal IT manager here at the State Library. Um, my team consists of myself and, and two other individuals. Um, we're a real small shop, so um, I would not consider our hours of operation 24 seven by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think five eights or five nines is even a stretch. People take vacations, get sick, etc. cetera. Um, so I think you can kind of consider us a best effort out, yeah. outfit. Um, we manage, maintain, support roughly a hundred endpoints An endpoint being really anything where the user is interacting. Um, it's just a convenient catch all term. Um, and 22 servers at any given time. We are required to follow all state procurement and in information technology implementation uh, rules. I provided a link on my handout to a couple of those uh, to help if, if you wanna look up the sort of things that we have to follow um, when procuring technology. And one of the newer things that has been finalized recently that I didn't put on there is now we ha also have to follow um, a sole source agreement that the state has signed with Dell Corporation. So we don't uh, get to go choose what we go buy anymore. We have to pick off a pick list um, that they've already put together. Um, for our calendar year 2024, um, the goals for our particular organization is each one of us, all three of us, uh, we want to complete between 35 and 40 hours of technical or career training. Um, we'll use the state's LinkedIn learning system to do that. And typically that um, involves me and my guys sitting down and, and kind of setting the training agenda for each each one for the course of the year. Um, we want to wrap up our rack workstation deployment. Um, we have fiscal year 24 purchasing coming up for replacement of aging endpoints. Um, we would like to migrate older projects onto the new GIS portal that Joe just finished standing up. That's gonna take some time to convert some of those. Um, we wanna begin identifying and mapping a migration plan for our servers that are in, in a version of an operating system called Windows Server 2016 that will release, release <laughs> reach its end of life. Um, as of January 11th, 2027, we wanna be well ahead of that. Um, and then also this year, we want to begin replacing Windows 10 with Windows 11. Uh, Windows 10 is going end of life for enterprises on October 14th of 25. We want to be done no, no, no later than August of uh, 25, but we're starting just by with new systems and rebuilds for, for right now, but we'll gather the rest of them up and figure out a migration plan over the next year and a half or so. And then we also have a Tanium deployment, which is coming down from SITSD. It's a it's an endpoint management and security platform that's going to have a, a little bit of code running on every machine in the agency um, that'll help us manage and maintain our systems. That's all I've got. You're welcome to entertain questions. Mm -hmm. Rack workstation? Is it oh Rack workstations, does that mean work from home, mobile, take it with you? Uh, no, it, it means they're actually in a big rack, um, a, a data center rack in our building. Uh, we chose to go that route because SITSD wanted way too much money to try to virtualize those workloads in the state data center. It's much cheaper to go this way. Okay, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Are there other questions for Lee? Madam Chair, Lee, um, you mentioned our data. Some is internal. Do we do we patronize the state data center? Yes. Uh, the 2016 governor's executive order, which I believe has on convergence has not been rescinded yet. We are required to. Do we have some of our own? Our own storage? Yeah. No. Okay. Not not anything that's not in a laptop or yeah. workstation or system. And uh, generally speaking, how's that working out? It's expensive. Mm. <laughs> okay. But reliable, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you tell me 38 terabytes, Lee? No. Um, my way underestimated. My yeah. Okay. We're well All right. Above that, we're we're probably in the in the about roughly the 450 terabyte oh, range. Okay. Huh? Never mind. Yeah, we we punch yeah. a little bit above our weight class <laughs> yeah. technologically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. agency. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to thank you for trying to help us through that address debacle with uh, oh. mm -hmm. the address we were all trying to get, um, and it didn't work out. And then we found out we were paying for it, yeah. the one with the gov the state government one. How is the new one working out with the Montana Library Commissioners, other than it being very lengthy? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. I, I'm not aware of any yeah. support calls that I've had to field in that. Yeah, I, I, I think as long as it's working for you, you know, it's pretty hands off for the staff since you're using your own personal, you know, the, the Gmail system. So it, it doesn't add any workload for us. At okay. All. Yeah. yeah, that when I found out that it was adding your workload and that we were paying for the gov, mm -hmm. that was a bothersome mm -hmm. and the fact it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like yeah. I said, other than it being very wordy, mm -hmm. uh, it's working. How about for the rest of you? Is everybody on now? Are we all on it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brian, you're not, right? Yeah. Because you're. So I'm a state employee. Right. I'm just continuing to use my Montana.edu yep. address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for that help. Yeah. Thanks. And I just want to give a big shout out to to Lee and his team. Um, they do a fantastic job. You know, Lee's the IT manager. We have some IT support with Mike Lightheiser. And then Joe also provides support as well as all of our GIS server administration. And, you know, over 400 terabytes of data, all of our online services. We, we are a very, very tech heavy agency. Um, and they do a really fantastic job. As Lee said, we can really provide that support kind of Monday through Friday, eight to five. And even that is a bit of a stretch when staff are out sick or, or want to go on vacation, that kind of thing. Um, so we don't have a, a big bench, but we've got a, a really great bench. Thank you. Now with Lee's report, is there anything here that we're asking of the legislature? I think I think primarily it's to just be aware of the resources that we have and, and what okay. Lee has identified as, as their requests. Um, certainly, if we were ever to say that we needed to um, make sure that we were providing 24-7 support, for example, for a service, then we'd be talking about additional support. Um, and as we continue to grow as an agency in other ways, we always need to monitor the impact to our IT support and IT systems. Madam Chair? Uh, for Jenny or Mr. Fossum. So the replacement of Windows 10 with 11 and migrating and migrate older projects into the GIS portal and Tanium development, all these things are, are already provided for in our budget, I am assuming. Uh, yeah, I'm, I won't be asking for any additional funds. This is more, most of these are mostly maintenance actions. Um, especially the operating system upgrades. Um, those you typically on the server end migrate to a different system rather than try to uh, move everything up in place. So that's an employee time. Yep. And that's already provided for in budget. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I do think one more point to make about IT. Uh, I think Patanium is a, a really good example here mm. is that we are seeing increasing uh, as long as I've been with the state, there's been increasing workload being pushed down to the agencies from the state IT services division. And that impacts our ability to do other work 
mm-hmm. right? That, that if we have more tasks that are done. So just be aware of that when you hear about the work that our IT, mm-hmm. IT groups are doing, because they may have less time to do things that they've done in the past if they have to do implementations of new things uh, being pushed on from the state level. That's a good point, Evan. Thanks. Any other questions for Lee? All right, I'm gonna move things around just a little bit because I know a couple of our staff need to leave by noon. So um, Kenny, if you don't mind holding on for a few minutes and we'll let, um, we'll, we'll talk about some of our GIS programs next. And again, commissioners, if you need to, to stretch or, um, you know, please, please make yourselves comfortable through the process. Do you guys want to do your driving or do you want me to drive? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which session are we jumping in? We're jumping to the digital library. That's yep. what I thought. Okay, thank you. The GIS program section. Okay, thank yeah. you. I can pass it. Thank you. This helps me. Can you introduce people? Oh, sure. I'm very, very happy to introduce people. Um, Aaron Fashaway is our state GIS coordinator. Troy Blanford is our water information systems manager. Uh, Michael Fashaway is our land information lead. And then Evan, our digital library administrator. So, and they're going to kind of tag team this just a little bit. And since we're stepping into the digital library, uh, and in the in the interest of time, I'll, I'll make a very brief introduction to say, I think I've shared with all of you, uh, the very simplistic version uh, of distinguishing these services are is that these are the services that we provide directly to patrons, where our library development is supporting, generally speaking, supporting libraries. We have overlap here and there, but I think that's an easy way to think of the work of the digital library. And uh, of course, now we'll talk specifically about what we do in terms of GIS. I couldn't get on the state web page. I had to do my hotspot on my phone. Oh, weird. I know. Worked for me, but I'm not on there anymore. Yeah, I turned it off. Oh, sorry. Okay, I think I'm up first. Um, I'm just going to highlight two of our uh, current priorities and goals amongst numerous other GIS uh, work that we perform on a daily basis that's just ongoing to maintain some of our layers. So the two projects I wanted to, to highlight are addressing and our next generation 911 GI support. Focusing first on the addressing. So structures and addresses is one of our MSDI framework GIS layers. Uh, it goes back to around 2007. Um, it's a statewide address point GIS database um, based largely on local and tribal government address point data sets. Um, the local and tribal governments are the ones that are responsible for addressing within those jurisdictions. Uh, those data sets were originally largely created for uh, the current 911 system. Um, so they're critical to both current 911 um, as well as uh, next generation 911, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but they're also used for a whole host of other functions. Uh, the one I wanna kind of draw particular attention to is uh, elections management. Um, the Secretary of State, going back a few years, uh, started implementing a new elections management system. And as part of that, uh, it incorporated GIS data to uh, streamline and improve um, how 
both the state and the counties manage uh, elections and um, register voters. Yes. Question, um, what is an address? Is it a person, a building? What kind of entity is an address? Sure, so um, think of it as your home address. Um, 123 Maple Avenue, Belgrade, Montana. So uh, typically a civic address. Um, there's nuances to that, um, but it typically, you know, will represent a residence, commercial structure or something like that. Not a bridge. They can be addressed um, as well. Uh, not a voter. Sorry? Not a voter. No. So voters would be associated with an address somehow um, to help them determine where that particular voter is going to, to vote. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so getting to kind of the, the high level goal that we're working towards uh, with the implementation and use of uh, addresses in elections and then uh, both in current 911 and in next generation 911, um, these databases are in particular, the address point database is really uh, increasing in uh, completeness and accuracy. And so we're hoping to expand its use um, across all state government, which will help ensure that all state government is using the same addresses and uh, eliminating confusion and data issues. Um, and we're approaching that from an address data and use standards perspective. So um, we're gonna be pursuing developing some address data and use standards and then coordinating with the, with the various state agencies um, to encourage the use of that address data and services we provide. And just to maybe make this a little more clear, um, I provided kind of an example little table here with uh, three addresses. If you kind of verbally speak them, um, I think we'd all agree that they all sound like the same address. Um, however, if you're looking at the address data itself, there's some nuances there that um, technically from kind of a machine and computer perspective make them different. Uh, that first line, um, it's mixed case. And uh, in the case of Lake Avenue and North, it's fully spelled out. That's kind of the next generation 911 standard. Uh, the line below it, the second one, um, it's abbreviated in all caps, which is kind of your typical US Postal Service format and standard for mailing. Um, and then the third line, uh, instead of first using the number is actually spelled out first. Um, and that's kind of a, a variant that sometimes you'll see that gets introduced in countless different ways, potentially to rep to represent that same address. But from a computer perspective, if you're trying to take a database and match what someone has said their address is, for example, to the standardized address, that wouldn't necessarily match directly, if that kind of makes sense. So that's where the address data standards and um, getting all state agencies to hopefully leverage a single address database so they can look up an address and make sure they're getting the right address in the right format that can be used across all systems is important. Okay, uh, moving on to our GIS support for 911. Um, as may I ask a question about what you just discussed? Sure. Um, do you, I know we talked about last, Summer that you're adding in the voter it's working with the state um, on that. It, is there anything built in there for duplicates? Like if there was a voter registration in Billings where somebody lived, but then they had another voter registration in Bozeman for Gallup County where they're going to college, would that duplication be noted? So we're providing the address data set. Right. And so um, that is a business workflow of the Secretary of State. 
So that would be part of the Secretary of State system that they would work under. So I don't think we're we can give comment on that. We we're not familiar okay. with their system. But they would have to then take your addresses and build in something for the duplication. They could use our addressing data to find duplicate addresses. They could. They could. Okay. Absolutely. Already. Yep. That's helpful. Thank you. How big is this problem? Inconsistency in addressing. Uh, pretty big. Yeah. Pretty large. Um, if if you're familiar with the cadastral system, um, and if you're looking at property anywhere across the state, um, oftentimes you'll see incorrect property addresses um, for a given parcel uh, that the DOR is maintaining. That's one example. Um, and there's reasons behind that. DOR is less concerned typically about the address of the parcel itself versus where they're the mailing address for the, the owner of the property um, in terms of getting out the tax bills and things like that. Um, but cadastral is used on a daily basis by a lot of people. So it's very important um, for a lot of other business uses to understand the correct address for a given parcel. So that's one example of trying to standardize on that address, make sure that all these places are using the same standardized address. So um, when we say 123 First Avenue North in Fairfield, we all know exactly where that is and it matches across databases. So when I enter into my Amazon that I want it delivered to 1142 Scribner Lane and I spell it all out and then it comes back and says, that's not correct. You need to do LN for lane. I mean, that's it's all included. Yeah, so that's an example of the difference between maybe the official or the 911 address versus a mailing address huh. that USPS or FedEx right. or someone else is going to use. Um, largely, the abbreviations are just um, a postal service convention to make sure you can fit an address oh. all on a okay. small envelope, if if that's the case. Oh, interesting. Yeah. How much of the state have we completed with the addressing? Are we pretty ready or up to date or? <laughs> yeah, so that actually feeds in to some of this work that we're doing for 911. Um, the entire state is largely built yeah. out from an address point perspective for existing 911 purposes. There's a few holes here and there, but um, it largely exists, but it it currently doesn't all meet the standards for next generation 911. Um, so that's where we're uh, working through the statute and the appropriation we get. Um, we have a, a dedicated 911 analyst, um, GIS analyst that is helping the counties and tribes and PSAPs to improve their data um, and make sure it's ready for next generation 911. Um, all that same data feeds out to our framework GIS data sets and wow. we're feeding in to the elections through our partnership with Secretary of State. Um, does that? Yes, thank you. And with the growth, it must be a nightmare. It is, yeah. So uh, <laughs> certain places in the state, certain counties are far more challenged in this yes. area than others. Um, but we're, we're making progress on it. So last time we visited or you came and presented, you said that not that not very many of the counties had gotten to it yet or or had completed their. Yeah, we were a little earlier up? on in some of this work. Uh, how's um, it going now? It, we've gotten along a lot further. I, I guess I should have had a, a link or a visual of our dashboard to kind of show you the progress on that. Um, we can. I can provide that to you to look at. Um, I think we're over half the PSAPs are participating at some level in that validation and aggregation process. That's good. Yeah. Good job. And I think that largely covers what I wanted to say. If I can, I, I correct me if I'm wrong here, Michael, but to the question about how big a um, issue is the consistency. I, I think there are like pretty much three 
big areas when it comes to addressing for, from a GIS perspective. One is just the completeness and, and maintenance of the address data set. So do we have them all and are we capturing new addresses um, and or cleaning up old addresses or changes to addresses. The second is just the accuracy of the address location that we identify, if that's consistent with where the actual address in the ground is. And then the third is that consistency piece. What was the third one? I'm sorry. The, the consistency, the table that he showed with the different styles. Yeah. And, and to be clear, we're not gonna change what the USPS does as far as their mailing standard. Um, but what we want to clear up is those places where there's no real reason for them to be inconsistent. <laughs> so. Well, I think you're doing a human's job because in Gallant County, we pretty much get our mail now every third or fourth day. No, seriously. We go three days without mail and then get a whole box full. And that's pretty typical for Gallant County. So <laughs> you're doing good work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a, just a naive question. Um, am I on? No. Talking to the microphone. Oh, naive question. What is next gen 911? Uh, yeah, good, good question. Uh, you weren't there. Um, next generation 911 is uh, sort of the next evolution of the 911 system that's used um, in North America, really. Um, the current 911 system is based on copper telephone lines, uh, tabular tables of addresses, um, names, phone numbers, things like that. That then, when you pick up a landline phone and dial it, it knows that phone number is associated with this address and it routes to this particular 911 call center. Um, with the advent of cell phones and 90% of Upwards of 90% typically of 911 calls are made via cell phone. That all breaks down. You no longer have that direct connection to a particular address. Um, so currently, a cell phone is routed off a tower. It picks some random tower, probably one close, but it could be one much further away than you'd expect. And when that call and then that tower is associated with a particular 911 call center, hopefully the tower you connected to is the tower in the county that you're in. Um, so it'll go to the correct center. But then even if it gets to, there, to the correct center, typically all they can see, or at least all they can see right away, is which tower they're talking to. They don't know where you are with your, your phone at a given point. That data will sometimes eventually get to them, but it's very slow because of the old technology that it's built on. Next generation 911 will use all IP computer networks and um, use GIS data. So polygons and address points and real time location from the phone, similar if you open up Google Maps on your phone and you see the little blue dot hovering where you are, that location will actually get sent along with the call, be used to route the call to the appropriate 911 call center, and they'll the person who answers your 911 call will actually see that location and know exactly where you are. That still work if you have your location uh, more or less yes. So like I don't know if you have if you still have an old flip phone, um, that that won't work. Uh, I think with any modern or newer smartphone. The system has a way of basically getting that data anyway. It it can. That's the way it's built. It's all built on industry standards. So, yeah. Is there an end date? <laughs> Your big question. Yeah. An end date for implementation or for this to be? Yeah. Uh, no. So it's that's been the huge challenge regarding this because nine one one historically is a local government function with various levels of state oversight or participation, depending on what state you're in. Um, so you can imagine there's, you know, 3000 plus counties across the US it makes it incredibly difficult to just pick a date and say everyone's gotta be there um, at that date. 
so different states are in different places, different counties are in different places on this. Um, the state through recent regis legislation that passed, uh, I guess earlier this year or last year now, um, set roughly a, a five-year timeline for the Department of Justice who got sort of the uh, the charge and the appropriation to implement Montana's next generation 911 system. That was their draft sort of timeline. Hopefully sooner than that, but for numerous reasons. Other questions for Michael? All right, I'm gonna to talk to you about our geo-enabled elections uh, project. And the reason why we're gonna go into this one, this is just one of the examples of the initiatives that use, uh, rely upon the Montana spatial data infrastructure. And the reason why we're going into this one, because it ties closely with the work of addressing like Michael had just said. So these are the key players and roles uh, as a part of this project. So I think it was back in 2019, um, I went down to a conference and was able to sit on a steering committee to start exploring what it would look like to create state standards for geo-enabling elections. So I was able to have influence on those standards that were being set nationally. And luckily Montana was in a really great spot because we have such a mature GIS. We've had a cadastral since about 2005. And so some of these base data layers that were 100% necessary in order to geo-enable an election, such as boundaries, cadastral imagery, addresses, we were in a great starting position. And so at the time um, we had interest from the Secretary of State's office and they said, we wanna partner with you on this, this makes sense. Um, the individual who's come to present to the commission before, Stuart Fuller, he was a former CIO for Department of Health and Human Services. He understands IT. And then he also is a volunteer firefighter. So he understands the need of public safety and addressing and getting um, not only the right uh, uh, emergency response to an address, but a ballot and uh, your packages from Amazon. And so um, we started partnering with the Montana Secretary of State working on a pilot project nationally with the National States Geographic Information Council to test the best practices that they were um, promoting and just getting a feel for what it would look like if we started to geo-enable our elections in Montana. Following the lead of the Secretary of State because that was the way they were moving with their uh, voting systems. And so, um, we can't do any of this work without local government. They are uh, part of the backbone of the geospatial data infrastructure. And the key players at the local government la layer, uh, level are the election administrators. And those either sit with the election administrator office or the clerk and recorder. Um, there's, depending upon the county, sometimes there's unique roles, sometimes it's one in the same. And then of course the Montana State Library, and that would have been the two major um, layers that we were exploring and, and utilizing as a part of this process is addressing and boundaries. So we've already talked about addresses, but I just wanted to kind of give you a fake scenario of what it would look like um, to start with the addressing, or excuse me, the administrative boundary data. So here, these represent districts. So these are government districts that are outlined in statute. Um, that need to be maintained by local government. In most cases, most administrative boundaries are maintained by local government, sent to us, and then we uh, uh, formulate that into these statewide databases and then make it sure it's out and available to everyone to utilize. So this is like a starting point. So um, we have examples of four school districts, one water district and one fire district. Well, when you start looking into what it could look like when you're breaking out those, um, so this is just a very fake example of, uh, of what we start with and then what we end up with when it comes to voting precinct splits. So that's the geography, that is the name, and you're gonna have to forgive us, this is very rudimentary shapes <laughs> in, in PowerPoint. But basically, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna flash through this again. So I'm gonna start here and then we just take it. And so you can see what's being created afterwards. It's all these different shapes. And so this is our new geography. Of course, 
you know, we don't take it, separate it, but this is what it looks like and how many new polygons are created. And then behind that is a whole slew of new attribute information that is needed to maintain these elections. So we are constantly working with the Secretary of State's office and our partners and friends at the local government level. And so we create these tools and dashboards in order for them to understand where we're at in the process of updating information. And so this is one of the tools that we utilize. And so, because I know some of you live in Gallatin County, I th thought I'd just you know zoom into this area, but this shows the process of getting all the voter precinct splits into the system and updated. And what there is, is there is a back and forth. Local government will send us their data. We will analyze it. We'll run it against our tools. We'll say, okay, we flagged a problem. We will send it back to them. So there is a there is this back and forth. And this basically shows that we've got um, 56 counties that we've sent to the Secretary of State's office. I've zoomed in just on Gallatin County here. You can see it's very complex. And, um, and that we have, uh, let's see, sent 84% of total of the uh, precinct splits to the Secretary of State's office. And then you can see that on the left-hand side with Gallatin County, we report back to every county what their status is so they understand where they're at in the process of making sure that data is updated. And then um, some of you are aware, uh, redistricting and apportionment happened last year. And so that really goes in just, uh, I guess a good way to think about it is um, you got to start over. Um, I, I don't want to say it's necessarily taking like a, um, uh, a uh, oh gosh, um, a set table and kind of pulling up the, um, <laughs> pulling up the tablecloth. Thank you. Couldn't think of the word tablecloth, <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's very similar. You have to, you have to make sure that the new, um, uh, um, election districts fit into what's what's been formed. And so that's that's a, that's a constant part of what is going on um, when maintaining certain types of geography. The other thing is uh, boundaries are constantly expanding. And so our favorites like the city of Missoula. And so the city of Missoula is constantly expanding. So when that expands, the uh, voting districts have to change. And so we have um, worked with the election administrators, local GIS departments, the secretary of state's office, to come up with a um, a timeline that fits with everyone's um, everyone's uh, timelines, you know, the Secretary of State has very specific rules of when they have to get uh, ballots out, and um, and then we have to uh, take and make sure that those geographies are in the system at the time um, uh, when a, a district changes, and so. Um, I'm definitely over my time. Maybe not as bad as Michael, though. But um, <laughs> but I will say um, that uh, it, it's it's a lot of effort. I will get into the uh, I will get into the uh, GIS coordination side of it a little more. But this is just one of the examples that we're doing, and so I know you probably have questions. I'll stop. <laughs> Hi, um, I got a call the other day with somebody who was very upset because the Gallant County Republican Central Committee wants the voter ID for Gallant County or whatever the list. And it was $1,500. Well, do we get that? No. Uh, so that's all managed. Again, I was all excited. Yeah, no, that's a government workflow that's managed by the Secretary of State's office. Um, I don't know if they have a separate one at the local government level. I, I'm not that aware of that, but um, yeah, no, we don't. Well, she said the library is charging us 50. I said, I don't think so. No, no, let's let's make sure everybody I knows didn't that, think that so. is not us. <laughs> I'm like, nah, I don't think paper costs that much to print. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Good job. This all is so changing so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Really? There's a 10 and 11 now? I just got a new computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh. should, should we skip ahead to GIS coordination oh, given we, time? We, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Aaron and Michael need to leave at noon. So if, if you want to skip ahead to coordination, that's great. Uh, yeah. Our son has a hockey tournament. So we, yeah, we got to get to, got to get to Missoula. All right. Um, so we did build this presentation so I could build on everyone else's, but you will get the gist. <laughs> Maybe this is good because then I'll just keep going. 
Um, so I, I think that GIS is, it, you know, we get stuck in the computer and the weeds and it can be a really complex technology for someone who's not familiar with technology to understand, right? And so a map, you know, I don't know. I, I, can, I don't know how far back we can go with mapping because my geography brain is off right now. But, uh, you know, years and years and years, for thousands of years, we've mapped the world. And so GIS is is the new modern way to, to do that mapping. And so um, it's, a, it's a representation of reality. And the more that technology expands over time, the more accurate that that technology can be and the information can be. And so I just wanted to start out to remind you all that we are we are representing the world in, in the ways where we thought, um, and I say we, back in 2005, when this all got a kickoff for, um, for the Montana Land Information Act, now the Geospatial Information Act, a group of people got together understanding that, that it was important to have one GIS data set for these key business layers needed to, to do business in Montana. And um, uh, some of it's being covered up on the right. This is just this pretty snapshot that I found online, but this shows just a few examples. And then I added the 15 layers on the, on the right side. So a lot goes into this and I'm just gonna do my best to summarize what it means to, to, to coordinate, to do GIS coordination. And I'm gonna give you a couple different examples of, of what we do and try not to talk too, too tech to you and just kind of understand the program and what we have to accomplish. And so first of all, um, this was supposed to build off of Troy's beautiful slides on LIDAR. And so just try to remember this when you're seeing his. Um, and so basically um, you can't see that uh, because there's a thing up in the corner, but it says coordinating. Okay, I did tweak them a little. Um, it says coordinating statewide elevation. And so that's, uh, the, that's the data. And this is just one example of what we do to coordinate to make sure that we're using um, the best, most efficient way possible to, to gain, gather uh, the data and, and then make it publicly available and maintain it over time. So with LIDAR, it, is a, it has been a huge effort and um, we've worked with federal partners, we've worked with nonprofit partners, and we've worked with state agencies, tribal partners, um, private companies, and then of course, local government. And so this is just an example that when we go out and, um, and we're looking to collect data, we're always going to be working and coordinating with our partners. So we're all working together <clears throat> to try to accomplish one thing. And it takes, it's a, it's a very big lift because it's a statewide product. And, and this product is, you know, it takes a little more of a lift because it's, you know, getting planes up in the air to fly, uh, to fly information. But uh, we have to work and consider all of our partners that when we start a project. So that means what will be the impact to local government? How will they use that information? How can we bring tribes into it? Can they participate? Can they share costs? How will we host the data? How will we make it available to them? So this is, these are some of the things that we have to consider um, when doing these types of projects. And so the, uh, the LIDAR in itself is a, is a great example of coming together using a federal program um, to, to get access to the information. And so we've partnered with these, uh, these folks and, and this is just one example of a data layer. And I probably could be a little more inclusive um, with partners, but for the sake of this slide, we kind of had to, you know, just put some of the main ones that we had up there. So we're, we're, we're coming together, we're working as a community to create plans, pre best practices, and then making sure that the data is being collected in the priority needs. Really regretting not having a water bottle. <laughs> okay, um, next up, the, uh, the other thing we do is collaborate. We actually, we work together. Um, so the other example was supposed to show us, you know, kind of working separately to get to the point where we need to be. This one, I wanted to show an example of us working together. So um, <clears throat> thank you. I really appreciate that. The imagery working group um, uh, has 
has started meeting again, and that falls under the Montana Spatial Data Infrastructure Framework framework layer. And we met this past Tuesday. Tom was uh, able to join us for the meeting. And so working together, we have representatives from our key stakeholder groups that, where we are working together to create products that we need in order to make sure that we're doing our best job of making uh, of getting the imagery collected. And so that means that we are uh, coming together as a group and we're reviewing uh, standards uh, for imagery data. We're talking about what does it look like to create an inventory of the existing data. Um, we're making sure that we're, you know, we're contacting the right experts that can give us the best amount of information. But as that group, these products are are made. Um, and I'm not talking the data products. I'm talking plans, um, inventories, uh, discussing cost efficiencies and shared resources, and then developing that final plan that will then give us um, the path forward on how we wanna maintain and collect new imagery. And so um, that's just another example of collaboration. And so we're, we're coming together in groups of people to make sure that we're getting the best information. I, I'm sorry, I have a very basic question. I'm sure. trying to stay up here and I did make my chart and I did listen and go to the web page and study every one of these and try to put them under. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, we've left addressing and now we're mapping buildings. We're mapping, we're past the address. Now we're mapping the actual buildings. Is this what we're mapping the actual, what's at the site? Um, yeah, so I think that's what Michael was communicating, mapping mapping an address point. Uh, right, Yeah. That now we're past the address. And now we're talking about what's there. Imagery? Yes. So. so uh, that's why I'm having like okay a hard time with it. okay so this is we're past the address now we're 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 mapping that site and we have to talk to the local government there the mm -hmm. all the government mm -hmm. agencies the ski tourism because mm -hmm. they might be using it yeah. uh, yes I, I think I think um one key way to think about this is um the the 15 layers the Montana spatial data infrastructure are all tools that help us understand either a point on the ground or an area. And it, it helps us understand that space, that place, that uh, geospatial space in a different way. So, so what is the address at, at that place? Imagery, like Aaron's talking about now, can help us understand things like, um, what does that building look like? Uh, what is the the actual elevation, the topography? Um, either you know for us for the ski industry, right. you know what what does that look like for ski hill development or um, other kinds of of resources? Troy's going to talk about how um, lighter is is used and collected in in different ways, as well as how we use water information to understand. So these fifteen layers right. are all they're all different: addressing, imagery, hydrography, um, the the wetlands, and and others. But they all help us understand place in a slightly different way to help us understand business decisions or or policy decisions. Does that help? Yes. And what about private property? Are we doing the imaging of like my our ten acres and our house and barn and or is this all just the government whatever agencies or whatever? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it, yeah. Imagery is co is collected currently statewide. Right. Yeah. That's okay. correct. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And we'll and we'll go in. Well, you'll go into that without me later. Um, and so what what I what I'm trying to focus on here. And so we have these 15 spatial data infrastructure layers. What I want to what I want to focus on with you is is what what it takes to to make that happen. And it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And you're, I'm not talking technology yet. You're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're the people person right now. <laughs> and always. Um, okay. In addition to that, um, we have best practices and standards. So this is um, uh, basically what we come together as a group to decide, okay, um, how are we going to collect this information? And who's going to use it? And mm -hmm. can it be used for multiple um applications. And um, it creates uh, efficiencies, it 
reduces duplicative efforts, saves time, saves money. And then we want to ensure that these data sets um, are being widely utilized. So one data set for all. And uh, so we go through these processes of coordination, collaboration, creating best practices and standards for all 15 framework data layers. Here is an example. Um, we wanted to give you a standard um, and try to make it understandable. I think Michael gave you a good one of what it looks like tabularly when uh, address data is written three or four or five. He didn't even add any um, spelling errors. Like, you know, that's another one. And so spelling errors, like, like maybe it's Frist Street and someone just misspelled it. And so I think that then what this is, is demonstrating a geographic standard of collecting data. So if you can see the grain points, those that's the that's the current standard. So this is something we've all gotten together as a community to understand what is the best location to have an address point, and it is on the house itself. And so, but the old way was kind of done all over the place where it could have been on the house or at the entry point to the driveway. And you can see that there is a green line running down the middle of the uh, of the imagery there. And what that is supposed to demonstrate is that that could be any kind of boundary. And in certain cases, if the um, if the green line uh, is going to be like where you're going to vote, and the old way puts you out at the driveway, well, you are in the wrong voting precinct. But the new way puts you on the house, well, then you're in the correct voting precinct. And I will say that we're very lucky in Montana when it comes to our geography. Um, even though it's vast and expensive, we expansive, we don't have as many people. And we've been able to implement some really sound best practices that um, you know, help just government be so efficient and effective in their workflows. And so even in the red box, this is just another example of it, it matters where you place that point. Because let's say, oh, maybe they didn't do the best job of putting it on top of the house. You can see that, does it fall in the line? Does it fall out of the line? So these are the things that we are doing and promoting um, not only for the creation of the data, but then the utilization of this very highly standardized data set. Yeah, you know, you know, those exist in other places and it's like where you lay your head and we we don't have any examples here, but there are some of Utah. It's where you like where your child goes to school is where they lay their head. They go that finite. It's nuts. Yeah, I'm glad we don't have to do that. The other thing that we fought against is, you know, creating multiple data sets. In some states, you will have a, a, a 911 data layer, an official authoritative 911 data, lay, data layer of all addresses for a state, and then a second one for voting, and they don't align all the time. And so it's just, like it, you know, having one, one standardized data set for everyone to utilize is so very important for many reasons. So, And then lastly, um, we promote and communicate all of this information. So these are some of the ways that we do uh, execute uh, those, those types of events. So we, we provide training, we provide expertise, we are constantly in communication with our, our stakeholder communities. Our grant program um, helps promote the best practices and then uh, allows for folks to get their data up to a standard. Um, and so that's another way of promoting what we're doing. And then we also, all of us uh, represent Montana locally, regionally, and nationally to make sure that we're looking out for Montana's best interests. Um, and we're also um, able to advocate for what we need as a state. You know, we're, we, we present differently than a state from Massachusetts, but I can guarantee you I will fight just as hard for Montanans, just like someone from Massachusetts would. Um, we're just we're just so unique in that we have such a vast um, landscape with a, a with a small amount of population and a lot of um, a lot of uh, public lands, and so it makes us very unique and have special challenges. So, and just I wanted to bring us back to this slide because coordination makes this all possible. Without coordination, I I, I just don't see how you would be able to to create what we've created over the years.
Aaron and Michael need to run. Do, any questions for Aaron and Troy? I'm afraid um, they might abandon you. You need to go to see On the spirit. hockey game. Yeah. He will score while you're not there or she. <laughs> I guarantee. Um, who has access to this information? Uh, all the information must be made publicly available. Okay, that's and, what I thought. Yep, yeah, so we don't collect any kind of private information. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a lot. Anything else? Questions? Right. Let's move on to Troy. Thank you, Aaron and Michael, so very much. And the puck goes to. <laughs> Good luck with hockey. Mm -hmm. And drive safe. I hope the roads are okay. We can start with either LIDAR or imagery. Uh, all right, let's, let's start with LIDAR then. So again, Troy Blanford, I'm the water information lead. And today I'll be, I'll be talking about LIDAR. And uh, that's just one of the projects going on within water, but it is, it is the, the, um, the heaviest lift. And that's been going on since uh, roughly 2018, 2019. And we expect it to kind of continue to be a heavy lift for, for our water information program for at least the next two, two years. So right off of the bat, you probably got two questions. One is what the heck is LIDAR? The other one might be, why is the water person talking to it, talking about it? So that's my goal with my presentation here is to make you feel a bit more comfortable with LIDAR and that technology. So LIDAR is an acronym, stands for light detection and ranging. That probably doesn't really clear anything up for you. For you. Um, but I want you to think about the analogies. So the analogies here are radar and sonar. You probably have a, a vague understanding of those technologies. So radar, that is also, that is radio detection and ranging. So there's those same words again, light detection and ranging and radio detection and ranging. So that's radio signals going out, help detect the distance to a target. Uh, sonar is sound waves going out to detect the distance to a target. LIDAR is a, a similar technology, but it uses light. It uses very concentrated uh, beams of laser light to take uh, accurate measurements to to uh, get at distances, elevation, and height. So two concepts there on in, in that figure that I, uh, I really want to convey here. One, the far one on the right, the sun getting through the trees and reaching the ground. So just like that, LIDAR is using light so it can penetrate through trees. Some of that light reaches the ground. So compare that to like an air photo. You can't see under the trees. With LIDAR, you, could, you can get an understanding of, of the actual ground under the trees. Of course, that's a big deal in Montana where we have so much forest. Uh, and lastly, it's flown from an airplane. So it can be collected over vast expanses. And when I say vast expanses, we're talking the entire state. So next slide. Um, this, this slide is, is, is intended to help you just kind of wrap your head around how big this data is and, and what it's providing. So this is an elevation model created from the LIDAR data. Um, LIDAR is very big data. There's a lot of information that you can extract from it. Uh, from this model, you're seeing Interstate 15. This is down south of Dillon. Uh, you're seeing the Beaverhead River there on the left. You're seeing individual boulders along the hills there. You can't quite see it uh, from here, but there are four-wheel roads kind of running through the hills there that, that really plainly stand out in the elevation data. Uh, so the accuracy, let's talk about, so, so LIDAR is high resolution and high accuracy. So to kind of help you wrap yourself, your head around that, resolution refers to how clearly an object might be defined. So it, if, 
let's think about this as if you're out, imagine yourself somewhere in Montana, you take a step, that step is about one meter. And for every one of those steps, uh, you could take anywhere from two to 10 measurements of getting accurate elevation. That is what LIDAR is doing. So for every one meter, every step across the entire state, we can get two to two, anywhere from two to 10 really accurate measurements um, of the height or the elevation. And those elevations are accurate to about five inches. So five inches of it's about the height of a, your favorite beverage can. So very highly uh, accurate on that height. So next slide. This is the update on the status of this effort. Uh, this was updated just in January here. All the green is the LIDAR that we currently have. It's been flown, it's available. We have it at the state library. Um, it's viewable, it's downloadable. Uh, what's in blue is what's coming. And by coming, I mean over the next two years, we should have everything there in blue also um, at the state library and readily available. So to just give you an idea of that, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Are there some road stains and road stains? Right, so there's that to keep an eye on that it does need to be reflown at some point. Uh, kind of that nationally, the effort is to think about kind of a eight year recycle time frame, eight to 10 years, somewhere in there. But you're exactly right. There are areas that change more often than others, especially floodplains and rivers, which are changing every couple of years, sometimes every other year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to give you a sense of the, the kind of the work that goes on here, um, Aaron talked about the coordination where we're identifying partners, federal partners, state partners, um, tribal partners who are interested in acquiring LIDAR and we're helping coordinate and plan where LIDAR can, should be, should be flown next. Um, another piece of the work is understanding Montana's needs. So how is the data being used within Montana? Uh, that kind of directs how we make that data available or what kind of formats we make it available in, available in. And then there's the processing of all this data. I did mention that it's really big data. There's a lot of processing that goes in to get it into um, readily usable formats. That's a general overview of the type of work that's happening here. So next slide, this really gets at the impact of LIDAR. Uh, what is the value of LIDAR? Um, so I, I mentioned we've got this online viewer where you can go and look at LIDAR data, you can download LIDAR. And part of that is there's an opportunity to submit a survey. It's, it's volunteer, uh, not required. Uh, but we now have uh, approximately 1,700 of those surveys. So we're getting a really good understanding of how this data are being used. Um, see the, the quotes there? And some of these are like kind of personal use, like a homeowner, those first two, looking at my property to understand its prior uses, interested in how patterns on the ground affect water flow and wind. Another one in there. Um, let's see if I can see. Oh. There's terrain modeling for preliminary building site design. So say you're gonna be building a house, you need to have an understanding of the slope of your land and where the might, might be the best place to, to build that home. So site planning. There's also that have others that have great public benefit and relevance. Uh, for example, update the emergency action plan for the crazy mountain dam breach. If that dam were to breach, where is that water going? Um, develop inundation maps for a high hazard dam, uh, evaluate the flood potential for a landslide into Flathead Lake. Those are some examples of how this data is being used. Um, my graphic there, I know it's small to see there, um, but the, the kind of line graph there is how many surveys are coming in per month. So we're, we're getting about 35, 40 surveys every month, uh, kind of describing how the data is being used. The two pie charts there, the one in the middle is describing how Kind of the category of how that that data is used so the like the yellow points on the map are transportation infrastructure uses of lidar the blue is kind of water related um, uses of the lidar and then the far right one is getting that sector so federal government use or state government use or private use public use um, kind of one thing to point out there is that purple is the general public use and we've been really surprised and uh, with with how much it's actually just been used by um, citizens. So next slide. Um, LIDAR is really interesting stuff. It finds its way into the news. 
Um, this is a recent article in the Billings Gazette. Um, LIDAR reveals geologic hazards near Yellowstone National Park. Um, this is getting back to the, I talked about how LIDAR can get, can, can kind of see under the trees. You can get at that ground. Um, so there, the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geologies is grabbing this LIDAR data from us just about as fast as we get it because they want to use it for mapping geologic hazards, understanding where there have been landslides and understanding where there are faults. Um, so the image there on the right, that's not Yellowstone, that's the Bitterroot Fault. And the on the right is the LIDAR data, and on the left is a, a kind of a traditional uh, aerial photograph. That fault is not visible in the aerial photo, um, and it clearly stands out in the LIDAR data. So last, next slide, and I believe this is my last. Yes, so, the, so why is the water person talking about LIDAR? I think this clearly illustrates that. LIDAR informs stream mapping, topography, and water shape each other. So water is constantly trying to get to the lowest elevation it can. It's flowing downhill. So these two images, what's amazing about these images is there's nothing else that's gone into it. It's simply elevation data from the LIDAR. So the lowest elevations, the very lowest elevations are shown on the left in, in blue. And then the lowest elevations in that right image are, are shown in the, the lighter colors. So purely from elevation data, we can do a really good job of mapping um, streams and rivers and lakes and ponds of the state. Uh, the image on the left is Headwater State Park. So that's where the, the three rivers come together to form the uh, Missouri River. And the one on the right is uh, Valley Garden of the Madison. So it's at the top there is where it's entering Innis Lake. So happy to take questions. Where are the fish? <laughs> okay, I'm. That would be ours. <laughs> it, it, it's a funny question, uh, and I can't help you with fish, but there is a, a there are people looking into bathymetry um, and trying to measure lake bottoms, river bottoms using that, lidar. That is expected to be the next wave with lidar. Right now, it can't penetrate water that deep. But there is ideas that it could potentially capture bathymetric data. So you'd have a good understanding of under the water, how what the surface is under the water. So there, that might help you find some fish. <laughs> I, I have a couple of specific questions, but just simply to make the overview, because I'm working really hard on this. Um, so within our geoinfo system, um, we have the addressing and then we have we skipped to the gis or whatever to the we have the 3d mapping which is this what's the cadastral cadastral is the uh, land ownership parcels so like your property boundary okay so the cadastral is the property value lines etc and um the lidar okay so when they're talking and I know you're going to get into the real-time network, I really found it helpful to listen to the Senate hearing of the Bill 60. Um, Evan was uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. And he just, and between that and the questions that all the various legislators asked was so eye-opening. It was one of the most valuable 45 minutes I've heard. Um, but I think they were getting at that the LIDAR will really help the farmers. Is that the one they're talking about? The LIDAR will really help the farmers with their, or was that the real-time network with the, the? That was the real-time network. It was, mm -hmm. I know. Yep. But were they talking about the LIDAR too would help the farmers or the cadastral will help the farmers? I would, I, I think this, um, your question goes back a little bit to, to Aaron's presentation about the coordination. Yes. Uh, many, uh, if not all of the data layers that we uh, develop and maintain uh, have potential for benefit across uh, a wide variety of sectors. And so we want to be sure that we're including all of those stakeholders when we're doing our planning, because there are different ways that you can um, share the data, uh, format the data, uh, and otherwise provide it, as well as even the collection, uh, which can either enable or limit the types of uses that can be made of that data. And so we don't, you know, these are expensive things to collect. Um, for, for one, if there are certain communities that value it highly, they may 
uh, if we can make it available to them, they may contribute to those costs. And then okay. second, we because it's expensive to collect, we want to be sure as many uh, potential users in the state are able to use it. So um, certainly uh, agriculture, uh, anything related to water is going to be interest, of interest to the agriculture community. Elevation and its relationship uh, to water is going to be very uh, of high interest there. RTN, uh, real-time network, certainly there's also an aspect uh, of that that's uh, of importance to the agricultural community. And the other acronym that I was getting pretty good at these, but the Montana SRN, that was. That is the real-time network. That's the real-time yeah. network with the GPS. So what would help me is a basic and then a flow chart, which ones are under which ones and which ones. It's just a flow chart so I could, because there's so many acronyms and they all yes. begin to sort of, and then how how much of the state is complete on the LIDAR? So as far, I mean, it, it's all planned and in the works, 100%. What's actually complete right now is roughly 55%. And by complete, I mean what's in hand. So roughly 55%, um, it's the green on the map there. So we got about 45% to bring in yet, but it is all lined out to be collected. And then Madam Chair, may I bring up the question you asked me to bring up during this point? Um, in our contract export, there was um, a, a charge for 95,000 um, from Ayers Associates, LIDAR classification of portions of Park County and surrounding area. And I thought, wow, if it's 95,000 to get, is that the airplane to go up and do this? Or if that's just Park County, this is gonna get really expensive. So I wasn't sure if I was reading that right. It's, so that particular contract is, it's actually Sanders County. We ended up changing that really late. Um, Sanders County ended up being a better candidate for the type of work we were doing. Um, what that work is doing is classifying the LIDAR points so I talked about trying to describe for the resolution that every for every one meter across the state, you're getting two to 10 measurements. So think about having 10 points for every meter across the state, you've got millions and millions of these data points. Each of those points can represent something. So they could represent the ground, they could, the, the, the LIDAR might've hit a tree or it might've hit a building. So there's a lot of classification that has to go in there to assign those points to their appropriate feature. So that's what that contract's all about. So that's once we have the LIDAR data to do further uh, analysis and classification with it is what that contract is about. And I'll just add, it, it is extreme. Setting aside that contract, when you're talking about planes in the air and the collection of the data, it is extremely expensive. It's uh, when, when we started on this venture, the estimate for statewide collection was $80 million. Um, we think that it's going to come in somewhere in the 25 to 30 million range uh, when all is said and done for a single statewide collection. Uh, but we've had been fortunate to have uh, great partnerships. The, the USGS is, is pushing the overall program and providing substantial uh, half, if not more, match in, in some areas. Uh, the NRCS has been a, a, the our biggest partner uh, when it comes to levering, leveraging those uh, grant funds, providing the, uh, the remaining percentage that we need. And then the state floodplain program uh, funded largely through FEMA uh, here in Montana has been the other huge partner. Th those three groups have uh, paid for the bulk of this. And that's where I say, when it's that much investment that's been done, we wanna be sure, this is a great example, um, doing some additional classification you know, 95,000 on a multi-million dollar data set to ensure that uh, a, a larger group of people are able to access and use the information that we've collected is, um, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money to us, but it's still um, a, a good investment, we believe. Now, is the Montana Library with, with Evan and the gentleman's help, are we just collecting? Are we actually going out running the airplanes and collecting the data? Are we just ho housing it? Are we finding people to pay for it? What's our role in all this? Yeah. So it is a federal program. Like Evan mentioned, it's the USGS's program. So they're the ones that hold the contracts with the aviation firms that are going out and collect flying and, and actually collecting 
the data. Like you said, our role is to find partners to help fund that data collection uh, and a lot of this processing work that comes once we have the data to make it useful and available. Um, and then we store that data. That's part of that 450 terabytes of data is the resulting uh, LIDAR and, and these um, different kinds of processed data that comes from the, the data collection. Um, and, and Troy and Megan are, and with the help of other GIS staff are really the ones that are out looking for those partners and then helping us think about how we manage it, collect it, provide access to it, store it over time, which gets to the discussion about the image repository. So, um, so th those are our roles. And how does that fit into our legislative budget process? Mm -hmm. So or I don't know if we're going to get into our, our image repository discussion here. Yeah, we, we can step there. I, I would say there's not a, an immediate ask here with okay. respect to LIDAR, mm. uh, specific to LIDAR. Um, but do be aware uh, of two things here. One is, uh, as Tom brought up, there will be a, a need for a, a future collection um, of LIDAR to keep the data up to date. We, and we won't we don't know uh, what the uh, in, you know what the partnerships and interests will be there. Uh, that will be some time down the road. Uh, more immediately is the will be the need to uh, derive uh, hydrography data, our, our flow lines, our rivers, to get an updated water data set for the state, and, and that will have a cost down the road. We're focused right now on completing the statewide collection, and from there we can go into. Uh, the imagery plan. Well, I just want to keep with this topic because I get it's getting it's all fitting in a little nicer now. <laughs> well, we should meet here. Right, so Genevieve, if you want to advance a few to um, start of the imagery one. Yeah, so the image repository. Like I said, Aaron was going to be my color commentator, so this might not be quite be as uh, colorful as it could have been, but we'll see. Um, so I, I want to start with, with what we mean by imagery in GIS. You'll hear about images and aerial photos and things like that in some of our other programs. For example, Jen Burnell's. Um, Montana History Portal. So I want to be really clear, like when we're talking about imagery in GIS, we're talking about ortho imagery. And mm -hmm. what ortho imagery, I've got details there, probably too many details for you to really need to know. But um, basically it is an aerial photo that you can do accurate measurements with. So maybe an even simpler way to think about that is it's a, a, a photo that is an accurate map. You could do measurements on that map. So if you're familiar with like Google Maps and navigation there, what makes that possible is to say measure the distance between Helena and Billings, it's because it's an ortho photo. So it's an accurate representation of the Earth's surface. So that is the type of imagery we're talking about here. We're talking about ortho imagery. So next slide. So why is imagery so essential in GIS? Um, I use the analogy of the sandwich up there. Sorry about that. We do have sandwiches over here for lunch. Uh, but anyway, you, you kind of see the classic example there of GIS on the right there of these lit, this stack of layers that can all be used in unison. And the most important one there, or at least one of the most important ones there is imagery. Um, interpretations off of the imagery is how we create a lot of those other GIS layers. So it's the bottom of the sandwich. All right. Next slide. <clears throat> so when we talk about imagery at the state library. We do have some. Um, we've got several statewide collections. In fact, every two years, um, the USDA flies this product called the National Agricultural Imagery Program or, or NAEP. Um, so we get that imagery every two years. Um, what we're finding is it doesn't meet all partners' needs, that, that, that some partners need higher resolution. Uh, the need it flown at a different time, those sorts of things. We also have what I might call ad hoc imagery collections. These are smaller imagery collections, maybe of a certain event or a certain location. Um, so we've got some of those too. Um, so next slide, what we know 
is that there's a lot of imagery elsewhere, a lot of imagery not at MSL. And we've got examples from the state uh, Department of Revenue collects a lot of imagery for road surveys and road design. The Department of Natural Resources collects imagery for, or has imagery, historic imagery for water rights assessment. Um, Department of Revenue for tax purposes. Um, the counties, Yellowstone, Lewis and Clark, both collect imagery on some of the cities as well, Bozeman, Missoula, Billings. So we've got all these various organizations collecting imagery and um, ideally that imagery would be readily available and discoverable and easy to get. So next slide. Mm -hmm. This kind of sets up what is the current state of our imagery that is on the left, what would be the desired alternative and that's on the right. So. First on the left, the top one, imagery collection is minimally coordinated. I mentioned that there's a lot of different state agencies and, and counties and cities that are collecting imagery. Um, it's perhaps it could be coordinated much better. Um, so the desired alternative there would be the imagery collections are, collect, are coordinated by the Montana State Library or an MSL-led group and that we're taking advantage of shared resources. The second one there in the middle, uh, it's challenging to know where to direct imagery requests. So say a citizen's looking for imagery, it's hard to know where to send them. Um, the alternative to that would be to have a central repository for imagery at the state library. So this one place where citizens could go to get imagery where other state agencies could go. And uh, underlined there is this one state government initiative that is the Montana governor's kind of initiative there that there's a lot of different agencies, but we're one state government. And people shouldn't have to know which agency to go to. So we can think about imagery in much that, that same way. And the bottom one there, um, new imagery collections are turned down. So uh, folks look to us to host them and serve imagery. At this time, we are not set up to do that. Um, limited staff resources, and there are also uh, data storage considerations. So the alternative on the right there, new imagery collections are published by the State Library. They're made publicly available. They're broadly used, thus increasing the value of that imagery. So next slide, and I believe this is my last, and it just kind of hammers home that last point. This is an email, just received it last week. Hi, Troy, I just learned that Park County obtained 2023 imagery for the channel migration zone study. Have they contacted you about serving it out? Is that easy to do? And my reply, unfortunately, has to be no, at this time, MSL may not be able to commit to serving additional imagery collections. So there's this imagery being collected. It, the value really increases with the more people that use it. Um, so ideally, um, the state library could potentially create this imagery repository, house a lot of that, and serve a lot of that imagery out. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. I Overall, just philosophically, this is a lot of power in, I mean, we look at it as information and it is information and it's valid information. Um, it's also a great deal of power that information always is. Um, and if private entities, I was thinking about a, in Evan's hearing, one of the gentlemen said, we have a mine locally and I think you could partner with this mine, they would be very interested in funding to get more of these studies done of whatever their situation is. Um, I, If a private group, if um, or even a, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a public entity like an environmental group said, we want to do studies of this amount of these ranches to see how close they're, cattle are coming to the water source because the new guidelines are that the, the cattle can't be this close or whatever. And that's a private group or an environmental group or something. It seems like we need standards here. I, I, I can see problems developing where people would say, um, we want to know, you know, is there anything, and, and actually, Bryce had mentioned something in his thing last February 8th that um, a logging company might want to know that 
there's a certain clamshell that could be have a breeding during the time they want to do the logging and we need to let them know that might be a bad time to be cutting logging. Um, it just seems like we need some guidelines on who we do this for. Um, right now, it yeah. seems like the the state departments, the counties and the cities are are the ones that are driving. I, I think um, if I if I understand your comment right, I just uh, want to reiterate that what we're talking about is publicly collected imagery right. uh, that exists. That's been collected by government entities for public public use and public purposes. And, and our role here is uh, only in gathering and, mm -hmm. and providing that out of a central repository. Uh, we're not uh, at this point in the process uh, engaging in any uh, imagery collection of our own. Okay. So if somebody comes to you with the LIDAR product or whatever and says, we will fund it if you go over this product or this mine or whatever and check the water status and what they're doing, you you wouldn't be, that wouldn't be one of these contracts with a plane to go over a certain area. Um, yeah, I, I do want to be clear that, you know, LIDAR is a different program. Right. Uh, so if people approach us about that, we're not actually doing any contracting with them. We're uh, we're working with them to get them uh, uh, in in contact with the USGS, who's running that larger program. Um, and then, uh, if they want to fund some additional collection okay. in partnership with the USGS, that could happen. In, in this case, we're uh, again simply uh, trying to gather these collections. Okay. Uh, the, the way a lot of these workflows work right now is. Um, as as long as I've been at the library, so uh, mm -hmm. you know, more than 14 years now, uh, we get regular calls about imagery. Uh, we make people aware of what we currently offer, uh, primarily the NAEP data, but a, a handful of other more localized data sets. Uh, but we also let them know if um, if they're working typically in highway or river corridors that uh, the Department of Transportation has a significant amount of imagery that we don't currently have, and, and we direct them to the Department of Transportation if they are looking for additional imagery, um, as well as DNRC. We know that they have a significant amount of historic imagery associated with water rights. Uh, we may, uh, I don't an answer as many of the request calls as I used to, so there may be others that we direct people to these days, but uh, the idea here is that, um, you know, uh, much of this imagery uh, is there and available at request. Um, many of these agencies don't have the capacity to make it directly mm -hmm. publicly available. But what that means is that, uh, in my opinion, this is a somewhat wasteful process and wasteful use of uh, state employee time for us to receive a request, spend time on that, that then goes to another agency yeah. has to spend time on then uh, making that data available when we could consolidate those data sets uh, you know in, in what seems to me is a natural place uh, a library uh, for people looking for that information uh, and provide more direct and uh, easy access well I appreciate that clarification you're really helping me today um so back to this Iers contract for ninety five thousand. Troy, what did we pay them to do for standard count? If that was a one-time contract, correct? So one con, yes, that's correct, and it it is really close to ending. It is almost done. So that because we paid a contractor to classify the lidar points, so hundreds of thousands of points all the way across Sanders County, and the data that we got from the USGS, the data that we started with, basically just classified those points that, that hit the ground. So in addition to the ground, some of those could hit trees, some of them mm -hmm. could hit buildings, uh, you could get information about the vegetation. So that's the information that we weren't able to extract at this point with the data that we had. So we went to a contractor to help classify that so we could understand the, the lowest elevation, the medium at vegetation and the highest vegetation. We also had them create uh, building footprints. So from the LIDAR, create uh, a footprint or a polygon for every building that was within Sanders County. 
So I also want to be clear on that contract. Like that was um, kind of a pilot for us or exploratory for us to try to understand what can we do and how much does it cost? I think at that kind of rate to do that in, for the entire state is probably unrealistic. Okay. That so what, what that tells us now is if we want to be, if we want to do that, we need to develop those skills in-house. Okay. Madam Chair, um, maybe to clear up a misunderstanding, this was not, if my understanding is right, work done at the request or for the benefit of this county, this was so you could test out something to do with the LIDAR data. That's so, exactly so, right, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're not looking at that as a project for the whole state that we would have to fund. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. okay. So as we're thinking about legislative asks, one of the things that um, we're thinking about is this idea of funding for an imagery repository. And we had a, a workshop in December where we brought together stakeholders to talk about what the needs are and, and what the opportunities could be. And uh, Aaron and Troy led a, an imagery work group, those key stakeholders that um, are, are, are imagery stakeholders to think about what this kind of library of imagery could look like and how much imagery is currently exists, the the needs for collecting new imagery, the kinds of use cases for the kinds of uh, people and organizations that access it. Um, and there's a process through the legislature called House Bill 10, where these kinds of large IT infrastructure uh, project asks are made. We're learning more about what that kind of ask looks like. We've never had a House Bill 10 ask before. Um, but in that process, we would need to quantify, you know, how much data we're, we think we're talking about, how much imagery data, um, and the, the work that would go into storing it and providing access to it. So that's something that um, we'll have more information for you uh, for your April meeting. Um, I think Choi made a really important point. Um, this, these are government investments, taxpayer investments in imagery that's being collected either by the federal or the state or the local government. Um, our hope is that that imagery can be leveraged to the furthest extent possible so that that investment is really, really worthwhile and beneficial. And we're hearing very clearly from our stakeholders and the public that they value that imagery and we can do the work of managing that imagery much, much more effectively. Um, my my only concern is I'm I'm you know um, comparing this to a book in the library. Um, the all the library does is shelf it and label it and make it available, but the library doesn't print the book or write the book. So I just want to make sure that we keep that in mind. The only part we want to do is be that be the library, not the not the printer, not the writer, right? That is correct. Um, I, I will say that, you know, we do serve multiple communities. Um, there are certainly geographic information professionals who can easily uh, grab the data that we make available and bring it into applications that they use for work. And, and um, But there are also public users, uh, private individuals um, out there. Uh, and we have tools, general tools like our digital atlas, uh, increasingly a tool called ArcGIS Online that we make available um, that make it easier for users to build their own products using those data sets. And so uh, we try to make sure that uh, this is as accessible as possible. I, I guess that would that would be like doing a large print book or, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's, that's a good comparison. Great, great comparison. Really yep, good. yep. Yeah, a large print book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for Troy or Evan? All right. This is a lot of information. <laughs> thank you all. Thank staff. Great job. Really good. And commission, thank you for your questions.
Yeah, just so everyone's clear, there were two uh, sections, the information uh, products, uh, as well as my discussion of GIS architecture um, under the GIS. And so those are two that we'll catch up on after lunch.
Evan and Kenny. Evan, why don't you go first and talk about the enterprise GIS since we're we're still in the a GIS mindset? Yeah, I think these these two presentations work pretty well together. Um, I do have a handout that I'll bring her. So Peggy, I will get you this handout after the meeting. Yes, I'm sorry. This is a very technical topic, so I'm going to be as non-technical as possible. I don't have a slideshow. I just have the handout. I, I will pass something around later, but I don't want you to get uh, caught up in it right now. Do I need to wait? Should I wait for Tammy? Okay. Um, so the, the basic, you know, we've talked about a lot of GIS work. I think someone touched on it earlier. Um, the uh, computing power needed to do this is uh, much more than the average person's work. Uh, I can certainly get you more information. Uh, there is information out there about system requirements and things like that. And we can talk about, you know, uh, amount of processors and memory. But <clears throat> suffice it to say that, uh, well, I, I think a good example is where uh, a typical state employees workstation might be uh, around a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Often to do our work, what we're talking about are machines that are uh, twenty five hundred to three thousand minimum, um, and they can go up from there to be able to do the type of processing. And that's just to meet the uh, minimum or even recommended system requirements for typical GIS processing. Um, <clears throat> unlike most uh, GIS uh, specialists, uh, GIS staff around the state. Not only are we dealing with this very large data or, or yeah, GIS, complex GIS data sets, but we're doing it at a statewide scale. And so that adds an even more, uh, an even greater computing capacity need for what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> when we think about our GIS, uh, enterprise GIS architecture here at the state, uh, we're generally speaking of desktop GIS tools that people use to do analysis, create data sets, uh, format data, uh, as well as server systems that are used to make that data available to uh, people around the state on the web. Um, historically, or the, I should say the current uh, architecture that's in place um, was really spurred by uh, what we called an enterprise health check at the time back in 2014. And that was purely focused on the server side uh, and the, the configuration of our uh, database and ArcGIS server or GIS server software uh, environment. Um, at that time, much of the individual GIS staff's processing was done uh, at, their, at their workspace directly on a computer. Um, even at that time, it was somewhat problematic uh, running these kinds of processes over the network. Uh, there's just so much network latency that it, it really delays a lot of the work that could be done. So there was a lot of copying data, and there still is a lot of copying data onto local workstations to be able to do processing. Of course, there are limits, even if we get really large hard drives. Um, we don't have hard drives, for example, that can hold 200 terabytes of statewide LIDAR. <laughs> we never will. You know, I, I well maybe a hundred years, I don't know. Some Someday maybe we will, but it's not in my life or in my career uh, that I expect to see such things. So with that in mind, um, since 2014, there've been a number of changes uh, that have really driven us to relook at that architecture. Um, and I'll say just because I'm, I, I keep struggling with the word architecture, I'll use probably three words interchangeably here, architecture, environment, or infrastructure. So I just want you to know I'm not talking about different things if I uh, interject one of those words. 
Um, uh, the biggest, probably by far, change over the years since uh, the last design uh, is that there's been kind of a um, full-blown system change with the GIS software we use. Uh, we use something called ArcGIS Desktop in 2014, and now it's a tool called ArcGIS Pro that's much more resource intensive in the day-to-day -day work. Uh, additionally, the server environment, which was largely focused on simply serving data out uh, 10 or so years ago, uh, is now much more complex and has a variety of components that you may or may not enable, mm -hmm. uh, including a portal tool um, and other tools for, again, enterprise data processing uh, that, that could be done. <clears throat> uh, another change that's happened in that time is that uh, ArcGIS Online, another tool made available by Esri, the vendor that we use, is uh, has matured. It was in its infancy the last time we worked through um, uh, an architecture change. Uh, with the pandemic, we faced the need to uh, support staff who are working remotely. And since the pandemic, we still have several staff that are uh, not based in the office. And so that creates new and different challenges. And related to that, the governor has pushed agencies to be more mobile ready. And um, as I mentioned, that idea of copying a bunch of large data sets, uh, it was already challenging in the building copying them from the network to a local machine, you can imagine that doing that at home over a broadband connection is even more of a challenge and it's just really not a, a functional workflow. Um, cloud computing has matured. Um, at that time, uh, in 2012, I believe, the state did its first study of potential uh, use of cloud, of the cloud for state government IT work and now it's uh, more or less mainstream, even if there are limitations in certain types of cloud use. Um, we have things like OneDrive available to us uh, and we use it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> virtual desktops uh, kind of tied to that cloud uh, usage. Virtual desktops have matured and become more mainstream. And then of course our data has grown exponentially. We we did have an idea of uh, LIDAR at that time, but we didn't really have a grasp even on how large that that single data set would be. I believe there was a time uh, around that time period, 2013-14, uh, when we were looking at our total library storage space, and it was something around, um, was it even just getting to a terabyte? Well, that wouldn't have included imagery, but then I think there was another measurement. It's like 30 to 50 terabytes. Um, LIDAR alone is in the two to 300 terabyte range. So it's really eclipsed what we had in the past. So um, with, with those changes in mind, there are a number of needs that we have uh, for improving and updating our existing architecture. Uh, we need to uh, optimize the use of updated GIS desktop and server software, those changes that I mentioned before. Um, we need uh, flexible workstation models that allow remote work, um, as well as uh, the ability to scale up resources, processors, wh whatever you might need to do a, a task. Uh, but these can be limited short-term tasks, so we don't need to pay for all of those resources all the time, something that the cloud can provide. Um, we need our workstations to be close to the data. I mentioned the, the network lag. Um, one potential solution certainly would be uh, the state data center. Um, the shortcoming there that we've seen is, uh, I think was alluded to earlier, uh, the types of virtual machines that we're able to uh, use from there don't have the power we need to do the processing necessary for GIS work. Um, we need to be able to efficiently store very large data sets. Um, we need a common platform size for our needs and flexible to meet ongoing and future needs. Uh, and ultimately, a, a, a more efficient model that's aligned with state IT, uh, the state IT vision. And so we're kind of piggybacking here as we're looking at the future. Uh, we're looking at some, an implementation that was done by uh, Department of Environmental Quality a couple of years ago and a similar plan uh, that MDT is pursuing right now. And, and what that is, is basically a cloud-based, uh, we have a long-term future vision 
for a cloud-based um, GIS environment. It, it houses both our server infrastructure, uh, it stores all of our uh, GIS data, and then we have virtual machines housed in that same location directly attached to the storage that's used by server that we can do uh, efficient, heavy processing uh, and uh, ramp up resources as needed. Uh, this work has been uh, underway for many years. Uh, in 2021, uh, we started the process of a system architecture design. We worked with uh, Esri, uh, our, uh, the GIS vendor that we use for our desktop software, to get their recommendations on what this kind of a platform or, or this kind of uh, an architecture might look like. In 2022, we developed and posted a request for information uh, to get an understanding of uh, who out there, what, what companies were available that could um, uh, provide this kind of service uh, and what kind of costs we should expect. Um, in uh, 2023, uh, we've been seeking funding and we've been exploring different procurement models. Uh, we were uh, planning on, and we still, uh, we've got a, a request for proposal uh, more or less developed at this point. Um, the concern there is the time that it takes to get a request for proposal pushed through. Uh, the, the immediate dollars that we have available for this uh, are only available within this fiscal year. Uh, and so we want to be sure to get the upfront going uh, as soon as possible. But even uh, outside of that, the RFP is the most, uh, I'd say, most expensive from an administrative standpoint. There's a lot of work involved in doing that kind of a process. So we've uh, been working with our uh, procurement uh, uh, specialist, Sean Anderson, to identify um, whether or not there are statewide contracts that we can use. Uh, we believe that's what MDT is using. Um, and so maybe we can expedite the process working there with them. Um, so kind of next steps are that procurement, getting, uh, getting the initial uh, environment in place and that, but the other big issue is that there is a long-term cost to this that we would need to get funded. And so um, that's really the big, uh, it's critically important that if we can get this going over the next year, uh, that we find some legislative support for ongoing funding uh, to make sure it's not just a short-term, short-lived project. So um, we have broken it up somewhat uh, at this point. We don't think that we can afford upfront to get the virtual desktop environment uh, built out. That is a, a fairly expensive component. And in the short term, uh, Lee mentioned the rack workstations. And so that's an interim solution. That's basically during the, during the pandemic when people had to work from home, the primary workaround for our GIS staff was to use remote connection tools to connect to their uh, machines in the building um, and then do processing from those machines, those high-powered machines. Um, the problem with that is it's it, it, we were able to continue to do our work. That was the great thing. The downside is that's not sustainable in a long-term sense. Um, it, it's uh, very consuming for uh, the IT staff to try to maintain machines in that environment. Um, and then there are all kinds of uh, just little things that can come up that can knock a machine offline. Uh, somebody's unable to work, uh, and sometimes if, if there's a network issue or, or uh, power outage or things like that, there's any number of things that can be disruptive there. So getting to um, a fully cloud-based model um, is desirable, but we know that'll be a, that may be a second step in the process. So um, the, the one other thing I mentioned that I, I will pass around to you, um, I can certainly provide this to you uh, should you wish to dig in more. But this is the 2022, uh, I mentioned we started the system architecture and design in 2021, and it was finalized in February of 22. Um, we're actually getting some updated information for this um, as we look to implement something. Um, I'll pass this around, but it's incredibly technical. And uh, to give you a sense, I've been working in GIS for 29 years. Um, I've worked heavily on the server side. I, I understand a, a lot of the technology here, 
but I even had to go back to the people that provided this and ask them lots of questions so that I really understood it. So I, I don't mean any um, slight to you by saying that this may be way over your head. It's just, it's a lot of detail, but I want you to see the level of planning that's been done. I think it's important you understand that, you know, this is a, this is a big deal uh, and we're getting a lot of uh, good information to plan with. So pass that around. Oh, thank you. Questions for Evan? Sorry, I know that's a lot to come back from lunch too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, can you give us a better idea of what a virtual desktop does or is, looks like? Absolutely. Um, uh, the The basic idea, the basic concept is um, uh, <laughs> early, early uh, 20, 2010s at the State Library, we we had a lot of physical servers in our building um, and that each server was its own machine, physical machine. Uh, shortly after that, we moved to a virtual machine environment uh, where we could buy a large amount of hardware and run multiple virtual machines. So um, even though you're on one, one piece of equipment, uh, you can partition that into multiple machines. So when you're connecting in remotely, you don't know the difference there. Uh, alongside that uh, virtualization of servers, uh, there's been a lot of work done to virtualize desktops. And uh, ultimately what that would mean for a, a user if they're working in the virtual desktop world is uh, they could potentially use uh, a thin client, a very lightweight uh, desktop machine to connect to a virtual uh, workstation somewhere. The power is, is all on that server somewhere and that's where you're doing your work. So I don't know if that helped. <laughs> Other questions for Evan? The legislative ask for GIS is not the same as the legislative ask for the um, network, real network. Um, correct. There are a few different asks that have come up okay. in this conversation. Right. This is separate. To... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're not to real time networks yet. Um, right. This That's is what I thought. specific to uh, our GIS processing and server uh, okay. tools. Yeah. And hotspot fits nowhere. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Um, how far out are we planning? This or can, is there any way to tell when that's going to be obsolete and we're going to have to make another big effort or there's really no predicting that? Uh, that's a good question. I I, um, I like to think that this is a much more stable long-term solution than some of our historic tools, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, technology, uh, it, it, it is hard to predict what's going to come down the road, but uh, we definitely saw um, some ha having gone through the IT virtualization in the library, we've seen some great benefits to going to that model. Um, once we're in the cloud, uh, that makes it easier for us to take advantage of uh, other uh, cloud uh, cloud vendors, for example, because uh, we've got a virtualized model. There is some work or tediousness involved with kind of trying to transfer across different uh, vendors' platforms. I, I hope we don't have to do that, but um, it's less of an ordeal than going from kind of our existing on-premise uh, environment to uh, to a cloud-based environment. Do you see any drawbacks to having it all be cloud-based? Um. I mean, there's certainly, uh, there's always a little bit of an anxiety. Uh, it's not here, you know, um, what if we can't reach it? Um, most cloud vendors uh, offer a variety of uh, uh, disaster recovery models where they can, uh, you know, store basically images of your machines and then spin them up in other locations if you were to lose access. Certainly, uh, if the network goes down between here and there, uh, you're going to have a problem. 
But we also, uh, on the other side of that is uh, we're taking, because the only traffic that would be going across the network is our connection to those virtual machines, uh, we would be taking an enormous uh, load off of the state network. And I think that's beneficial um, uh, yeah, across the state. So. One of the other things that will be required to do as we explore these options is to work with SITSD and their security office to make sure that any kind of cloud-based solutions meets the state's security protocols for, for how they secure and maintain the data as well. So really grateful to have their expertise to lean on in that regard. I know this sounds like the sky is falling question and I'm sorry about that, but if we didn't expand funding for all these whatevers, the flow chart, mm -hmm. um, or if they didn't give us funding, mm -hmm. we still have viable products that are helpful to the public. And is there, that's number one, right? Or do we? And I mean, do they all become ineffectual if we don't? keep growing them. And secondly, is anybody else doing this that could pick up or would pick up or that we're starting to get into a duplicating? Um, I'm, well, I, I think I think your second question there, um, we have uh, made it known in our conversations with the state CIO um, that you know the plan that we have in place right now is one for the library. Uh, we do know it builds on, uh, we're, we're looking very closely at what the Department of Environmental Quality has done. Uh, and we've also opened the door if the state has an interest. It, it, this is an enterprise solution for our agency. Um, we think there's a place for an enterprise solution statewide, and we're open to uh, expanding this project to make it uh, serve any or all agencies that would be interested in using it. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it, that goes back to the coordination piece that Aaron was talking about earlier. Um, so it's, I love it all. I've, I'm like Bruce. I find LIDAR just exciting. I, I, I've got so many people who love the cadastral. It's all, um, but it's all such a new concept that library is now on the forefront of this whole process that never stops growing. It never stops growing, expanding. And um, at some point, the legislature is going to say, no, there's not enough money to keep growing and funding this. And so that's what I'm saying. We still have a viable product that people can use or yeah, I, I suppose that's a possibility uh, that, that they would say no. But I think the other piece is, um... Uh, uh, whether they wish to or not, uh, they see uh, increases constantly in the cost of information technology requests. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is um, we're in the business of information. And, and in 2024, um, you, information can't be done without the technology needed to support it. And so that's what these requests are, are based on. Mm -hmm. I would I would also add that um, in, in Erin's coordination work where she's working to help other agencies make use of this information and support their own um, development of GIS data and data analysis, the legislature is becoming increasingly one of the agencies that is using this data themselves more and more. So the legislature understands why why and how they should be investing in this kind of data for their own policy making. Um, and during the last legislative session, um, the, the kinds of positive feedback that we heard directly from legislators about the importance of this work um, was, was just really, really remarkable. I think one other uh, point that I didn't mention earlier that kind of ties to this, um, there are certainly, this would certainly represent increased costs as far as um, the cost to acquire and maintain this environment. Um, but on the other side of it, when we reach that full vision of being fully cloud-based and, and virtual desktops, we um, were basically offloading the uh, server management tasks, the, the base uh, system administration for the environment there, uh, which uh, is more efficient for us. It's 
one less task that our IT group has to manage. Um, so, you know, if you think about the the alternative, uh, building it ourselves, uh, then we're likely to need much more staff to be able to maintain this. Um, as uh, as Lee mentioned, uh, currently it's a struggle to do eight to five Monday through Friday. And increasingly, as our services that we're making available are expected to be out there 24-7, uh, being able to, uh, I think uh, Carmen Maya mentioned earlier, just the, the software aspect. It's not just the software here that we're talking about. We're talking about the software, but also the system administration. And those costs, um, paying staff to do all of that work uh, can get uh, very expensive. So making the best use of the staff we have, if we can offload some of these uh, tasks that be, can be contracted for, that's a very desirable future option. Um, another question, just to compare this to something that's understandable to me, um, at some point, QuickBooks says we will no longer support your 2014 desktop version of QuickBooks. You have to go to the subscription cloud-based model or you're done using your data that you have in QuickBooks. How close are we to that state of affairs with what we currently have? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, we are not hearing from, um, uh, from our software company that they're not going to support desktop computing. Uh, uh, they may increasingly, they have been increasing the number of tools that they make available on their on their online platform, but I'm not convinced that the desktop platform will ever go away. Um, it may become uh, a less used product, um, but even in our virtual environment, we're still going to be using those same tools. Uh, I'm trying to think of, well, uh, the only other variation on that I can think of is that um, the state has explored different ways to move more of what's in its state data center to the cloud. So there's a chance here that um, this is where the state is going anyway with everything. Um, and I think that's very real possibility that within three to five years, most of the server environment will be contracted cloud services. Just a guess. I don't work there, so I don't. I'm not privy to their internal conversations, but that that would be my guess based on where technology is going. If there are no other questions, then I'll hand it off to Kenny, who's going to talk about information products. Yep. Kenny, I don't know if your mic is on. Is the red light on? There we go. Yeah. Perfect. It's green and then brighter green. So I apologize. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kenny Kettner. I'm the information products lead at the State Library. And I will try to go very fast. There are, there are no legislative asks in this. This is just an update on who we are and what we do. Um, we're a team of three. Myself, Bob Holliday, who you met earlier, getting his 25-year pin. And Nick Beckstrom, who started last year. And we, we develop software for Montana State Library and implement software systems as well. Uh, we try to get the most value uh, that we can through a mix of um, third-party solutions, contractors, and developing in-house. I think I've asked Jenny for another developer every year, but the money's not there. So we get uh, creative when, when there is money available to work with uh, companies to make the products that we need. So... Um, the first one I want to draw your attention to today is there is a new Montana cadastral application coming uh, early this year. Uh, within about a month, we're doing user acceptance testing right now on it internally and about to release to a wider sort of invitation only uh, public testing. Uh, and this is a years long process that's finally nearing completion. Uh, we're working with a contractor uh, called Langan. They're based out of New Jersey, and they were selected through a limited solicitation process. And we also are collaborating with uh, SITSD. Uh, they rewrote the API that talks to the 
uh, Department of Revenue data. And of course, our friends over at the Department of Revenue maintain that uh, important property data that the public is there to get. Um, some features of the new application, there's a screenshot on the slide uh, of it in action. Uh, it's going to be mobile friendly. Uh, it's using Esri's Experience Builder technology, heavily customized. Um, but that lets us, uh, puts us on a good path to maintain it in the future using established tools like that. Um, it's going to have uh, the option to select from uh, our entire pretty much gallery of base maps, you know, so you can look at imagery from different years on your property. Uh, you can swipe back and forth between uh, two years of imagery to see how it changed over time. Um, we have uh, added the ability to zoom to reservations, which was a piece of functionality that was not in there before. Uh, and there's many other enhancements. Oh, one other major one is um, printing uh, PDFs of the property information. It's a much nicer format than just what you can do currently. So kind of the Cadillac of printed property reports, if you will. Uh, and somewhat easier experience browsing through multiple properties that you have selected. So say you're a realtor and you're looking at houses on a block, very easy to go through them one at a time. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions on this, but if you're okay, I'm going to kind of plow through the rest of this and take your questions at the end. Um, the next slide uh, is about ServiceNow. ServiceNow is a platform that uh, is being used throughout state government. Um, it's part of the governor's vision for, you know, one state government, no wrong door. Um, so when, when a customer needs state agency services, um, they can get it um, through this uh, service now, uh, which is a combination of help desk software, knowledge base, community management, things like that. Uh, the state library has been uh, using it in some areas so far. Uh, our IT department has used it the longest. Talking Book Library is using it for their uh, intake forms. And our geographic information department is using it uh, for their help desk now. And uh, this year we're, we're moving five program areas into service now. Uh, Aspen, which is the library directory, shared catalog, history portal, public library statistics, and statewide projects. And that work is ongoing currently. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to add some others uh, later this calendar year, um, the statewide consultants, the heritage program, and maybe some enhancements to our existing operations and service now. But um, by being in the same platform with the rest of the state agencies, we'll be able to um, do better analytics and reporting across the agency. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the boring, but in, in some ways still exciting uh, work. If that made any sense. It's very exciting, Kenny. It is exciting. It is. Big boring. That, that's, <laughs> that's the best compliment I've received in a while. Thank you, Bryce. <laughs> uh, no, Troy, Troy wins for sure. Can't, can't keep, compete with LIDAR. That's, that's good stuff. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. And this is pretty much a slide for everything else. Uh, we maintain the website and try to help our content editors um, do their work successfully. And we have a monthly meeting where we help them with any problems they're having and answer their questions. We're working on uh, migrating the Heritage Program website and setting up a new website for the real-time network, uh, MTSRN, that's underway right now. Um, we maintain web applications. I mentioned Aspen. We also have the GIS data list, data bundler, and digital atlas applications, and those are widely used by the public. And so we maintain those and we're looking to um, migrate those to more modern solutions, but the, they haven't been the priority lately. Uh, we also spend a lot of time supporting and putting out uh, fires, so to speak. Uh, I wanna mention GitLab is a very neat product, um, software repository tool that's uh, again adopted statewide. 
So in state government, we're all using this tool to store our software and uh, develop it in a responsible way that's backed up and tracked and everything. And uh, we also manage the monthly updates to our web mapping services. So uh, I know that was a lot and trying to go very fast, but are there any questions? Thank you. While you're thinking of your questions, uh, can you remind me, I, I should have uh, given some credit to Bob Holliday uh, as I was reviewing the GIS architecture because he has done an enormous amount of work uh, to, to make this a reality. So That's right. Just wanna acknowledge that. And he, he's also the one who kind of wrangles those monthly ESRI service updates as well. I have a question. Yes. Are we still waiting for the state to come out with their guidelines for the websites? Yes. Where are... So, yeah, the, this is about the state template. And yes, uh, there is a new one. We've, we're regularly told that it's right around the corner coming out. But um. In the meantime, we've we've used the existing template and uh, worked with our partners at SITSD to address any concerns that have come up. I have a question. Yes. Um, is Aspen something we designed in-house? That's right. Yeah, it, it was uh, developed at MSL. Um, before my time, I inherited it, but we've been maintaining it. Um, there's a... We've been in discussions to improve and replace parts of it. Um, there's a lot of lot of ongoing work there. Uh, I, the most recently worked on part was the continuing education tracking part. So, but there's a lot of pieces to it, as you know, the meeting materials, the events, uh, library directory, and so forth. Any other questions for Kenny? As you can see with, with Kenny and our IT team and, you know, thinking about our GIS architecture, that's, that's all sort of behind the scenes, but it's really the, the modern architecture of a 21st century library. And we really, we could not provide the services that we provide without all of their careful planning and execution. So very, very grateful and proud of their work. Oh, shucks. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. Kenny. All right. And now some of our other digital library programs. We've got Jen and Kazi and Jim and Bryce. Oh, God, I'm losing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, we're under additional digital library programs. So we have Kazi, Bryce, Jim, Marilyn, and Jen. So maybe we can we can swing around the corner. <laughs> and we're gonna have Kazi go first. We are doing a real time. This is yep, we're yeah, we're, we're up I next. Just, yeah, we jumped around over GIS for Michael and Aaron, right. so that's mm -hmm. why it got a little confusing. Yeah. Yep. Here's the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, commissioners, feel free to stand, stretch. Maybe after this, we'll stand up and do jumping jacks <laughs> to keep the blood flowing. We have more. There's there is a drinking fountain. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Kazi. Kazi is our geodesist. It's very exciting to say that we have a geodesist on staff. <laughs> geodesist. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, Genevieve, you're going to, uh, yeah. Yep. So um no go go on the first place please. Yeah. Um RTN 
that's coming from real time real time positioning network it's a positioning network and like many other states we also call it a reference network because it has a set of reference stations that are networked together via internet to a central processing center i just want to mention the element in it so that <laughs> as we go you understand better okay next slide please so what is the output of this system it gives us a centimeter level real time it is a real time positional positioning accuracy uh, currently this system is running on trimble pivot platform and being hosted at one of their servers. Uh, there are many uses. Um, the first two are the top uses is engineering and surveying, construction and ma machine guidance. Next slide, please. Um, so you see on the map, we have 72 reference stations currently. These reference stations represent true positions in our national datum. So that's why they are called reference. So we anything we do with reference to them. So sensors or antennas in those stations, they receive signals from navigational satellites navigational satellites such as GPS, GLONASS, uh, European Galileo, and Chinese Beidou. Uh, those signals are received by, received and collected by a central processing center. And central processing center, it computes a real-time positions of all of those reference stations again, and then compare them with the true positions. And it computes a set of error metrics. And based on those, those error metrics, corrections are computed. And those corrections, we send them, I mean, central processing server send to the rover where that is working within the bounds of the network. Um, that's the mechanism basically. And then um, sometimes depending on geographic extent, the computations or solutions are um, computed on a subset of stations. Those subset of stations are called subnet. Next slide, please. So we have uh, five of this kind of subnets. We call it Northeast Montana, North Central, Northwest, Southwest, and South Central Montana. We uh, produce solutions, um, sub subnet solution, and also we provide solutions re with reference to any single station. So there are two propagation techniques. The corrections are propagated to the rover. So two propagation techniques, basically for subnet solution, the central uh, processing center, it computes or establish a virtual station usually within three feet of the rover, establishes coordinates, establishes positions, and then with reference to that virtual reference station, corrections are propagated to the rover. So that's called VRS solution. And with respect to each single station, we those corrections are sent directly to the rover. So two propagation techniques. We provide solutions in a standard data format, which is called RTCM. RTCM stands for Radio Technical Commission of Maritime Services. These are basically the Coast Guard used to, used to use it to send the information about BOIA to the ships. So the same kind of messages, but this is no these are no updated format and also we provide um the vendor proprietary method uh, which is called 
compressed measurement records. So because there are devices that are older, still in market, and we have, of course, the, um, the latest kind of devices. So we keep the solutions in the older format, RTCM older 3.1, also CMR plus older format, so that the older devices can use the solution. At the same time, of course, we have solutions for um, all the latest devices that can capture the multi-constellations, such as that's coming from uh, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Vegas all combined. Next slide, please. RDN access. So how the how a user uh, get to receive this service? User creates an account with us. In exchange, um, they receive a caster address and the login credentials. Caster is a kind of a switchboard that is set. Um, you have to log in through the caster. So caster is in the server. You, it's, uh, it's called ntrip caster. Ntrip is basically, it sends the message via internet protocol. And then there are standard format internet compatible, this is called HTTP hypertext protocol based, uh, object based. So it's a very simple thing and it's the modern thing. Uh, so now, so once a user login to this caster or switchboard, they can see all the switches. So because we have different solutions available for them. So name of each solution or is called a mount point. So they can choose which mount point they wanna use for their correction, um, depending on the area where they're working, definitely. So suppose a user doesn't know where, it, which station she, she, he should be using, which, which correction mount point he would be using. We have also solutions available for them under a prefix, they have to just remember the prefix is called MTSS. So they have to select that MTSS prefix and the central processing center, they will, uh, it will select the nearest station correction for them. Next slide, please. So uh, talking about the contributors who own the stations and who is sharing with us for this um, building building out of our uh, reference network. So tribal nations were the first who purchased um, uh, receivers and they partnered with MDT, Montana Department of Transportation. MDT installed all of them. Um, tribal nations, currently they are maintaining three. MDT is almost 27, they purchased and installed and including um, the receivers from tribal nations, MDT is maintaining right now 40. Upon request, UNAPCO, UNAPCO is University uh, Research Cons Consortium in Colorado. Um, they, have, um, they have a program under program plate boundary observatory. They have um, in our region, uh, they have a number of stations available. So upon request, they opened up, uh, they gave us their caster address and we added uh, 20 stations that those are, that are suitable for us um, in Montana. And then um, academia, um, in academia, we got station from uh, University of Montana, Montana State, Flathead Valley Community College and Highland College. So those four colleges are sharing the stations and we are receiving data stream from those stations. And then um, city and county, um, Miss city of Missoula, um, they have two stations. They are sharing with it with us. Um, Richland County, um, they got one, and they are sharing with us. And Sanderson Stewart, a, a surveying and engineering firm in based in Billings, they are also sharing their own station. And we got a, a one more station is from um, I think uh, Kotlin. Idaho. Okay. Next slide, please. 
So um, looking at the variability of the stations, we have um, three kinds uh, coming from Trimble, Septentrio, and Laika. Uh, bulk of the stations are coming from Trimble, though, um, because MDT, um, they are usually they usually purchase from Trimble. So um, we are getting a lot of Trimble stations, but we, uh, once we have money, we'll, we'll be, um, we have intention to bring it more variability in, in terms of main doors and stations. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So um, currently, this for this year, we have a plan, we got a plan from MDT, they they will be building 17 or maybe a little bit more uh, depending on the availability of their manpower and then uh, we have potential to get uh, three uh, from um, MGI grant uh, or um, geospatial information act grant um, and then the Fort Smith the tribe um, is going to build one in Fort Smith and we're going to add one from UNEPCO on our southeast side, and you're going to add one um, from uh, BLM that is in, sitting in um, Wyoming, Sheridan. That's our plan, about 22 stations for this year. Um, we have an estimation of about 212 stations. Um, um, we re, re, to our 212 stations required to cover uh, the entire state. Um, so it's about 40 to 50 kilometer spacing, roughly. But it may increase because we need to set up some <clears throat> um, some uh, substitute stations at some strate strategic locations uh, in case of failure. Um, and then, of course, it depends on the availability of suitable sites, um, terrain, and the intention, of course, is to capture all sorts of topographic variation in our system because the system, although provides all geometric uh, uh, um, outputs, but um, um, the surveyors or users use um, a gravity-based model that gives them elevation. So we need to capture the all the gravity based gravitational variation in our system. Next slide, please. So we have been running this program um, as a pilot for last two years, and you can see um, we have um, almost created pilot accounts. Two hundred forty two out of two hundred forty two in state accounts are two hundred seven and out of state accounts 35 we have pilot logins 520 in an account can have multiple logins um, and we have identified 10 commercial sectors that actually have been using this uh, top four are engineering and surveying uh, agriculture uh, in particular precision, precision agriculture uh, land surveying and drone or aerial, um, and the biggest, we found the four most user groups, uh, professional land surveyors, professional engineers, uh, drone pilots, and people associated with uh, precision agriculture. So, um, those are four topping groups, uh, professionals they're using. Uh, the biggest user group are professional land surveyors. Um, they, um, the percent, about 40% of them, 40% uh, of users are professional land surveyors. Next slide, please. So some other sectors, I just wanna now highlight uh, that what we have uh, water, environment, and geotechnical. We have utilities, we have equipment reseller, and we have excavation. The excavation of, of course include dressing and quarrying. We have also, interestingly, we have also have um, in utilities, uh, the oil and gas sector, one account and pipeline, another uh, one single account. Um, city and county 
we have accounts on public works um people from public works basically engineers they 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 are using it um police department city police and county sheriff we have accounts with them um so we i think that city and county uh, offers a good potential for uh, uh, building a user base so um since we have all the findings right now um we have found who are the users who what kind of sectors uh, will be using this so we have huge potential um to market um the RTN and, and then if we take kind of different kind of promotions that would be um useful for us to sustain and grow our build out thank you hmm. Thanks, Kazi. That was a great overview. Mm -hmm. So just a, a little bit about where we are in the process. Um, we, we have the enterprise fund, as Melissa said, to start collecting, collecting subscription fees. Uh, as Kenny mentioned, we're building out the new user interface website and launching a payment portal where users will be able to enter um, their, their payment information when we start the subscription model later this spring. Uh, our, our current target is to transition as many of those pilot users into paid subscribers as we can. Um, we're projecting that we need about 500 subscriptions in order to make the network self-sustaining. And that's the long-term goal. The goal is to have it fully funded through that subscriber-based model. We have projected, I think, was it 20, 2029, Evan? Is that right? To That's correct. Have, five, have it, five years. To have enough subscribers to make it fully funded at that point. We think that's a conservative estimate, but that's the, the information that we've been projecting and have communicated to the legislature. The legislature has provided us authority from our Montana, what, what was the Land Information Act, what is the Geospatial Information Account uh, to help fund this uh, in the interim until it's fully funded by subscribers. And um, we anticipate that we'll need some additional continuing one-time appropriation from that account to help bridge the difference as we begin to add new subscribers to the model. I have a question for Kazi. When we were on the slide vendors and receivers, you mentioned there was more availability. I didn't, uh, what, what did you mean by that? The variability, the variability, the variation, the difference. Variation. Uh, so the surveying is, a, is, is, is this process, um, uh, is, 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 is called, there's a saying that, sur that this surveying or this kind of process is a game of, um, Variability, variability, like you know, the the hot how is the the more randomness you get, the more kind of accurate result you get. So, so by that do you mean you want to spread so all our eggs are not in the trimble basket? No. Yes. Okay. That's my thing. Okay. Not in one one basket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good question. Another question. Um, I see in a, some other states that have a lot longer history with a real-time positioning network, they do not achieve 100% um, coverage of their geography. I'm not sure that's a realistic goal for our program. No, we have to have a goal, right? If, uh, I, we, I'm not gonna compare with others, but we have to have a goal. And our goal is to uh, get a full coverage because as I, as I mentioned that this is not really a pure geometric output. We just wanna provide to them. I want to build this system based on a scientific um, inputs in it, so that um, it 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 might act as a model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to capture the the topographic variation. You mean when I say topographic variation, you understand that actually it's coming from the gravitational variation. Mm -hmm. You don't know. <laughs> so, so the, the density of materials is basically a reflection of gravity. Mm -hmm. So density and topographic height, that's actually matters. So we want to capture those, but that depends on the funds. Mm -hmm. First, our goal is to have 
little bit of coverage everywhere, depending on available sites. And once we have money, then we can utilize uh, to achieve our goal. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, in the legislative hearing, it came up quite a couple of times that southeastern Montana was mm -hmm. um, neglected. And it obviously was. And they said, you know, we have to work on that. Um, they said that they needed some tribal um, sponsors there. And I see that you have plans to move that way. Is that kind of a priority? I would hope to get something there. Um, or do you have to have a sponsor? If you wouldn't mind, there's a slide. Uh, I know, I saw I that. They're yeah. planned. So, um, well, I don't want to that was no, exciting. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, next one, I guess. Oh, no, no, no. This that one. Was the right. Yeah. right there. They're planned. Oh, uh, planned, planned. Yeah, the other one. Other yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Okay. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see the, the build out there. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't remember all the details from that legislative hearing. Uh, but I think the issue was that the initial network uh, was built largely uh, with cooperation with tribal entities. Um, you're getting into an area over there where there there aren't any reservations, right? Um, and so the, they, you know, they were primarily interested in their areas when they set up the initial network, um, and then it has filled in around where those original points were. Um, but as you can see, uh, between the state library and the Department of Transportation, we have a plan uh, for the coming year to begin to fill out the southeastern mm -hmm. of the state and. Uh, this probably is, I'm sorry, there are no dumb questions unless it seems like I'm asking them. Um, when you say we hope to have the members by 2029, why would people sign up now? I mean, they don't get to use the system until they sign up, right? And so what are they waiting on? I mean... It seems like if there's a real need for it, they should sign up now. We, is it us? Are we not having things ready? What, what's the, yeah. what are we waiting for till? There, not us, reasons, but I mean, yeah, yeah. There, there are any number of reasons why someone might choose or or might not choose to sign up. Um, there are uh, surveyors, for example, um, that have existing workflows that work for them, and, and don't have an interest in changing those workflows and. Um, some of those people may never sign on, um, but there, as this new generation uh, uses these kinds of tools and is trained in these type, types of tools, this will become the norm and the standard for uh, in the surveying community. That's that's one example. Uh, we mentioned the many different communities out there. Um, uh, there are certainly people that just don't don't know about it yet mm -hmm. and, and don't know about the availability or how they could use it for their work. Uh, we've been pleasantly surprised by some of the diverse potential users that have reached out and, and applied it in their uh, work tasks. But from our point of view, we're ready for them now. Correct. I do think there there was a slide there that had, um, uh -huh. it, it was when Kazi was describing the regions and there was a yellow background. Basically anywhere that's in yellow is available, fully functioning real-time network. Um, some of the other places outside of the yellow, you can still take advantage of some of the resources of the network, um, but the fully functioning is is the area in yellow there. So how are we reaching them, Kazi? Getting people? That's the puzzle. I uh, actually that's why we need some kind of promotional activities. Um, we are we have done so far. Um, there is an association is called Mars. Um, um, Montana Association of Professional Registered Land Surveyors. We uh, last year we went um, to their uh, conference. We presented um, this. Um, we also um, presented in Mega mm -hmm. in the GIS conference. Mm -hmm. GIS also has a lot of potential. Um, we are planning to do similar kind of activities in um, in agricultural association of agriculture. Um, um, yeah. mm -hmm. In some of these cases, these are communities we're not very familiar with. Um, uh, agriculture is one in particular. Uh, we had uh, we talked with some some industry 
folks um, implements dealers, for example, we thought maybe reaching out to um, the extension stations might be a way to get word out, but their advice was actually not to go that route. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, those aren't as heavily used uh, by the types of users that would actually be interested in this. It doesn't mean we couldn't still uh, leverage that, but if we have limited resources for outreach, we want to try to find uh, the, the places that we can have the greatest impact with the uh, least effort so that uh, we can uh, reach as many as quickly as possible. I can tell you also in the agriculture, um, I know that John Deere has their own mm -hmm. um, and you know, anybody that owns a John Deere, they sign up for it automatically. Um, and it's, and it's, it's very good. They use Russian satellites, which are so, I mean, have been very accurate. That, that, well, our satellites <laughs> going to be more accurate than Russian satellites. Without our satellites, uh, I mean, without GPS, uh, GLONASS not, not going to work anything. Yeah, I mean. Uh, oh, do they run off of your? No, no, no. Not I'm like, saying that the uh, U.S. settled. Uh, yeah, no. Right. Uh, that's fine. Uh, we actually uh, had. Does Trimble run off of the U.S. satellites or do they run off the Russian satellites? Um, our, our system is being designed to take advantage of uh, four different. They refer to as constellations. Um, OK. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the United States system. Uh, the Russian system, the Chinese system, and the Japanese system. Oh, no. Uh, Russia's Euro European system. European. And, uh, and uh, we also take advantage of uh, Japanese has also a system. Okay. So basically, we have been using US system. US system has the highest number of satellites right now. I mean, in the real orbits. So we got right now proportional 35. Um, Gronas their satellites are in uh, lower orbit. Is uh, so if you think about times at, uh, altitude, so there is eleven thousand kilometer Russians. Those are called medium altitude uh, satellites. Uh, all U.S. satellites we have chosen um, six orbital path uh, space twice. Uh, so each orbital path four six twenty four. And we have additional we added. So uh, we have uh, currently we have 35 operational. Um, ours is running uh, from 19,000 kilometer to 29,000 kilometer, the altitude. Uh, um, European, they have been running, their satellites are not too many. Uh, their system is called Galileo. That is um, that is the altitude almost seven, eighteen to twenty two thousand kilometer. Chinese they have kind of two different kind of orbits. One they have five satellites. Those are like thirty thousand kilometer, and they most of their other satellites are medium, like twelve to fifteen thousand kilometer altitude. So their 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 system is kind of different. Mm -hmm just kind of um, saving some money. And but I may have misspoke. Okay. I don't know if John Deere, I, I'm talking to my son-in-law about all this. I can't, I, I don't recall if he said that where Trimble runs off and where the John Deere runs off. Well, I, I think the really important thing, similar to uh, Kazi's comments earlier about using different vendors uh, to have variability mm -hmm. and to have some Right, and I mean, and introduce it, yeah. By, by leveraging all of these uh, constellations, um, I believe that the, you're able to see if one of them is producing error, um, you can compare them against the other. Sure. And so I'm wondering you, if you went to, that or if you so. have, so you said you have gone to like equipment dealers or? We've, we've spoken, or Kazi has spoken to um, some dealers. Yeah, we, if you see our, Genevieve, uh, could you please bring that um, the last, I think the last slide. And it showed implement dealers. Yeah, yeah. No, the other other one. Uh, yeah. So if you see the equipment reseller, uh, those are uh, actually the um yeah the resellers uh, equipment Such resellers. Before. I see. Uh -huh. So um, we have we, we I mean we we spoke some of them, and we um uh, we, I think um I I can't exactly remember, but um it, it's. 
we spoke a couple of them and they say that they have a system. That system is not scientific, but what they do because of the geographic information systems, um, they, you know, the when we turn the car, we have the GPS, right? Mm. So what, what's the GPS coming from? These are bas basically it's actually the GIS kind of thing. Right. It's a digital, all the lat and long is digitized. And it's like a box of all this lat and long, lat, 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 latitude and longitude. And there is a program called routing program. This, uh, I think Kenny can, could tell better, but so there's this algorithm. So when, when you say, oh, okay, go there. So instantly that algorithm works. Okay, from that lat, lat long and that lat long, it, it creates the process. So it, it needs a little bit of GPS help little bit to, to navigate, mm -hmm. but it already has everything in it. So it doesn't need. So some of those John Deere companies, mm -hmm. they have the similar kind of system. So, you know, that's why, um, that's why people don't bother. Okay, it's working. So mm -hmm. we need to break up that part of mentality, the state of mind. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, one of the best examples i and i not i'm hoping he was correct was one of the legislators from chester and he said they were one of the first people who signed on to this and they did it as the community and the school district and he said it has been absolutely invaluable and they did all kinds of experiments with their students and one that touched me was he said they sent the kids out and they found all the fire hydrants in Chester and they marked them all and then they had to figure out the hoses could go 800 feet and they found eight of the hydrants that couldn't reach the houses in their district and these kids were and they then they mapped did their own on the cemetery and they mapped a uh, whole mapping of the cemetery. Then he said they did um, all kinds of these projects on the water lines. And he said, four of those kids have now graduated from high school and gone into this field because of what, so I, I think there might be, now I know this is a small town, but that just made my heart sore that I know these big, all these big clients are real important, but maybe we're missing a huge thing with just the school districts. If we put together programs of what kids could do in the school district, if they became network subscribers, I, I, I mean, that's right there. And there's a lot of them. And and that was a station built through a, a, a what was at the time MLIA. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what he said, but boy, he said it's, and, and that was actually just a standalone station. That was before we had the full network in place. And um, so in in the current model, um, you could still do a standalone uh, mount point to get a solution. Uh, in some situations, that might give you a very good solution. Uh, but that's kind of the most basic level of solution you could get through the real-time network. Um, we actually, for most needs, we can provide much better uh, solutions to people. So, Madam Chair, I have a question. Do we have the internal manpower to send a, a sales force of two, um, you know, spend a whole year going to conferences? I'm sure these different groups of potential users have a professional association. Do we have that manpower to make such a sales effort? No. Because no. no. mm -hmm. yeah. he's the manpower. And Kazi, and he's got to yeah. manage the network. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll be, yeah. I'll be going to the Marl's conference, the surveyor conference that Kazi mentioned. I'll be going to Mako here at the end of the month. Um, we'll be going to Magip. You know, like I said, our our current target is to try to to move the current pilot users to subscribers. That's our focus. Um, it's getting into those new industry areas where we we currently lack those resources. Madam Chair, I have a question. I have a curious question for Evan. Um, if I'm just curious, if the uh, commission had approved the hiring of a public information officer, how much would that contribute to being able to do more outreach and uh, communication regarding this project? 
it, it, it's certainly a tough hypothetical. Um, we have a lot of needs here in the agency when it comes to uh, that kind of work. Um, I do know that uh, there were some questions already uh, as we've uh, begun rolling out or, or uh, begun to target uh, paid subscriptions uh, that, that I would have liked to have had more professional guidance on, for example, um, the price setting. Uh, we had uh, identified a rate of $1,500 per subscription. Um, and what we've chosen to do is uh, an early early entry special of $1,200 for the first year. Um, that seems like a good item, idea to me um, to, to get people to sign up early and, and quickly um, and not to have a rush at the last minute. But I don't have any kind of marketing background, so I don't know uh, for certain uh, if that I don't know what someone in that industry would think of uh, that kind of a deal. Um, it, I would have liked to have hit uh, a lot of these. Um, I, I would have liked to hit more trade shows this winter uh, ahead of this. Um, as it is, we're going to target next winter for doing that big push. Um, so those are some of the things that uh, I think we could have done. But again, it would depend upon... I'd like to just add a little bit to that. Um, Jenny and I did have um, many discussions, in fact, with the governor's office when we were designing this PIO position. Um, and and we did intend for this position to be heavily involved in real-time network promotion, especially at the beginning, because we have this timeline to get so many subscribers by a certain year. Um, so while the PIO position would support all of the efforts in the agency, we did discuss with the governor's office and had intended for this position to be focused almost all of their time initially on real-time network because of the importance um, to the legislature and the and the pending deadline. Um, I want to add one more thing that uh, we um, we have an opportunity to um, get the experience from Utah um, Utah Reference Network. They they actually uh, uh, have been very successful um, in marketing. And the, the most marketing strategy, the topmost one was to give the very um, pr price rate was very low. That was one of their options. I mean, the first option probably to get attracted from surveying, land surveying community. Um, so they started with $300 then, um, 400 than 600 now, apparently. What was that agency or that firm or that association? That's called Utah Reference Network, AG, um, UGRC, Utah Ge Geographic Reference Network, I think. The Utah? Utah Geographic Reference Network. If I could suggest, I know MSU and U of M have marketing departments that take on projects, clients for their students in their advanced degree, I mean, their senior years, and, and they apply to do marketing for the entire semester or the entire year for a valuable project. And um, boy, this would be a wonderful ma marriage is to get some marketing group of students that would take on um, help with this and they get graded on how well they do and how well they market and how well they get in memberships and all this and I, college kids love this stuff so yeah, madam chair i have a question for probably um well anybody so we have 242 pilot accounts <clears throat> Are some of them pretty light users? And would that be a reason why they might not uh, be early adopters? Why, why wouldn't all 242 come on? I'm sure there's reasons. I, I guess I'll also just mention with those numbers, um, I think it was 242 accounts mm -hmm. and 520 logins. Logins, yes. And, and in theory, uh, well, the, the way the, the subscription model would work would be by login. Yes. Um, I would say a fairly safe, this might even be high conservative estimate would be to say that we might expect half of those. Mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, the network was running uh, on 
Washington's network for several years prior to coming to us. And there were users that uh, signed on at that time that we've never seen them use it since it's moved over. So we don't know uh, why or how all of those people came on. We've got we've had some fairly enthusiastic people come on, but we don't see a ton of usage at this point. Um, some of that is it's a free, you know, it, it's freely available. Um, so, you know, they're not invested in it. So it's easy to not use it. Um, but, uh, you know, that's where I feel very strong that, um, you know, we put that those numbers out there, 50 in the first year, 50 in the second year. I hope very much that we can bring on a lot more than that early on. But uh, Well, if we had half of 520, that's 260. Yeah. And um, I would have a lower goal for self-sustaining as far as annual revenues than has been uh, stated um, because we can't get to perfection anytime and we can't get to ideal in anything. Um, uh, I would be for giving this uh, the good old college try really hard for 16 months and get to the point of perhaps 500,000 in annual revenues, maybe 330 users at $1,500. That would give us 500,000 instead of uh, shooting for the five to 600 area in, in logins. And then, and then to grow thereafter um, in a natural way without, without um, heroic efforts like we might do in the, in the early going. But if we, if, if, if half of those 520 are legit, and it's going to take more than one contact with them to get them to sign, as is any sales effort, uh, answer questions, resolve concerns, uh, provide more information, um, more contacts. But if we got to 260, that would be phenomenal in the first year. I, I agree that that's Hallelujah. four times what we have projected. And, and I'd say that, you know, the, uh, to the um, suggestion of a lower um, target goal as far as usage, that, that usage number to, to be self-sustaining is based on cost, right? We, we've calculated the cost and um, roughly, I, I know if looking at the fiscal note, the number goes higher, but uh, that was calculated uh, early last year at a time of very high inflation. Um, it, those were based on roughly 500,000 a year operating costs with inflation. Um, so, uh, I do think, uh, we're very close on getting uh, a better sense of the, we think the licensing costs from Trimble will come down for the overall network. And we're doing some, making some tweaks there as far as responsibilities to help bring that cost down. That's probably the single largest thing that we can do to bring that overall number down. Uh, and as, as we bring that number down, uh, we feel like we can bring the total number of users to break even down. So there will be a letter going out March 1st. Well, we've already sent a letter to existing users oh, good. Um, to, uh, to encourage early sign on. We've sent two now. Yeah, we've incentivized it. Uh, uh, okay, there's two, two letters that go out to incentivize early sign-on uh, with a lower fee. And did those go to all 242? Yep. It's nice that we can identify them and we have their addresses or the email addresses. It's fantastic. Yeah, they have to provide an email to, mm -hmm. to get registered on the network so okay. we can contact them directly. Here we go. Yeah, it's very exciting. One last question. Is this the the prime product for the users in Montana. What we're offering is the best positioning tool that you can get. Um, yes. Um, among the research uh, done in last 15 years, um, after static is another method called static positioning. So static positioning is the best. Uh, after static positioning, static positioning takes two days. So nobody does that. I mean, not a industry output, um, economically not viable. 
So this is the best solution have come up in the market. There are competitor competitors. There's gonna come from um, the low cost receivers coming from China. Even the software that Trimble is selling us, China might start selling that um, one tenth of a price. Then that's gonna be an issue. Mm -hmm. But um, overall, this is the best product to answer your question. This is the best product uh, in market right now. Maybe it would be a good idea if the surveying programs around the state would include mention of it in their curriculum. I think we need a, I know it's a lot to ask of Evan and, and I know Kazi, you guys have worked really hard, but we really do need a marketing plan. Um, I know, look at, and Melissa's looking at me like, but I think, you know, from all the people in staff, it just have to give us an idea of, these are the um, the logging, the petroleum, the this group, the that group, the Montana stock growers, uh, that, you know, who's going to go out, who's going to talk to them, who's going to try, because there are so many incredible incredible inventions and companies started in America. That is not the problem. The problem is getting people to buy them. And that is not new to us, not unique to us. It's just the number one problem. And so I, I think you're doing great here. I mean, this is phenomenal so far. And I love Tom's idea if we can get <laughs> to do something. I, we we absolutely, we absolutely agree that we need a marketing plan. Um, I, I made note of your suggestion to reach out to the universities um, we would very much prefer to have a, a much more stable, reliable solution than trying to work through students. Um, we don't have anyone with a communications background or a marketing background on staff, nor with that within their job description to do that kind of work. Is 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 there any interest in to, I, um, readdressing the PIO? You know, if we've we've brought a couple of different options for marketing solutions, I today is about having an honest conversation about the goals and the resources that we have, and we don't have anyone with the knowledge, ability, or the the uh, job description to develop marketing plans. That's outside the scope of our agency, and and that's just the the reality of the situation. So like I said, I've, I've made note of the suggestion that we reach out to the university. You know, we, we get state print and mail to print rack cards and other kinds of things for us that, that we design, that I design, um, but we lack the benefit of any kind of person with a communications or outreach expertise to help guide that work. Can I ask Evan, who did the, the video that's on the beginning of one of the, there's a video of a farmer saying, this is how I use this and this is how helpful it's been. It's on our, one of our pages that I read, that I went through. Are you talking about the GIS yes. impact video? That was really well done. That was a, a marketing firm out of Great Falls. Yeah, we could send that to all the ranchers and farmers and to the stockmans. That was really, I thought that was great. We actually thought about it. Um, we contacted uh, one of the uh, video personalities in precision agriculture. Um, yeah, we, we've uh, reached out to social media influencers. Um, and to the extent that we're able to, to find time, uh, we'll see if perhaps this summer we can uh, arrange some kind of agreement there. Uh, but it, this is an area that I'm not, I have, I have no background in. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know if you create a contract with a person like that, if they just do it, if you give them something in exchange, I, no idea. My two cents worth on that topic is that outreach and marketing is um, 
too broad, too wishy-washy. I think what we need is maybe a salesperson since we have a very good idea of the leads to go after. Um, I don't think a, a public awareness campaign is what we need, but maybe a salesperson that would take on the sale, the selling, the actual selling. For for what it's worth, I I do want to um, clarify. I heard Tom say that the public information position was too broad, and um, I do want to reiterate that 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 was a recommendation from the governor's office and that that job description was written in coordination with them and the department of administration. Um, and so it was well thought out with many groups having input uh, on the public information piece. And do you not have funding already for that position? Is there funding already? We, it is included in the budget. Mm -hmm. Included in the budget. Yeah. And we certainly have more than one need for outreach for our services. RTN is a, is a primary need, but, um, you know, Marilyn is going to be talking shortly about our talking book outreach and the goals that we've had for that effort. Part of the reason we have savings in our budget is because we, we um, contracted with the state of Utah for some of those operations with the understanding that some of those savings would be redirected to these outreach staff. And, and we haven't delivered on, on that. Thank you, Kazi. That was really fantastic. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, Bryce had to step away to go pick up his son and we'll be back. So Jim, do you want to go next? I'm gonna, my name is Jim Kammerer. I'm going to just begin by listing some Big name publishers, surely you'll recognize from your library at home or the public library, you know, Bantam Books, Penguin, HarperCollins, uh, Thomas Reuter, you know, those are huge, huge publishing outfits. Um, however, the largest uh, publisher in the world is actually the government printing office. We're talking federal government information. And it just kind of occurs to me this afternoon listening to all the work that's being done and um, other presentations after me, uh, just the amount of uh, state government information that's intended for public distribution that my colleagues are talking about. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. It just, I know we have a lot of fine publishing houses in, in Montana, but I, I'm gonna make a statement that uh, state government is the largest publisher in Montana. I think I can say, safely say that. Um, and uh, I mean, you're just hearing from what's being produced here in this agency, you know, multiply that by 30, the 30 plus other agencies in Montana. Again, just state government information. And uh, so I, I'm the government information librarian. Uh, we're kind of a, an odd bird in librarians world. We're not public librarians. We're not school librarians. We're not academic librarians, medical librarians. We're just focused on government information. So just as Bantam Books, LexisNexis, and HarperCollins have a place in our libraries, uh, I would argue that government information has a place in our libraries. Um, and so uh, my work, it, it's totally coming from the statutes of Montana, from the Montana Code Annotated. And I'll just name the two big statutes for, for my position. And the first one is that the state library shall administer a state, state depository uh, library program to identify, acquire, catalog, preserve, and provide access to uh, state publications. And the second statute for my position is that the state library will coordinate with depository libraries and state agencies to provide permanent public access to state government information. Um, and so there, there are 17 state depository libraries spread across Montana. And um, I have a very simple, uh, I have 
uh, two screen shots, screen captures of the two interfaces. We have two collections for state government information in Montana. And one is for mt.gov web archive. You can see partially up there and Genevieve is kindly distributing the brochures, uh, the flyer for my program. So there's two collections. There's this web archive. And then on the lower half of that sheet in front of you is uh, our online collection of uh, historic state publications that have been digitized. I wanna speak about that first. You can see in the, uh, that there's a little over 29,000 historic state publications that have been digitized. They're all online. Um, and uh, two ways to search, you can search on the metadata, you can search on the text contents. This collection, however, is not gonna grow very much over time. Uh, we've, agencies are just not publishing in, in print format. And uh, uh, we do occasionally come across pockets of uh, print publications that we never got that we should have gotten from these different state agencies. And so we'll digitize them and, and add them to this. Uh, so I would turn your, your attention to, um, if you could scroll upwards just a tad, sorry for the very small screenshot there, but uh, this is the mt.gov web archive. And this collection here is uh, what is going to be continue to grow just exponentially over time. And what it is, it, it represents um, the state library does monthly captures of all state agency websites um, and and adds them to this to this web archive. And we have um, it's been estimated, I've seen these estimates in different places that the the average lifespan of a of a web page before it gets edited or removed is about 90 days. Right? Um, and so it's a very short period of time that we have to capture that information. <laughs> um, and uh, what do I what else do I want to say about that? So in this for this collection, um, I put down there it's right now it stands of uh, this month a, a little over 351 million documents in this collection. It's just full of PDFs, text files, Excel spreadsheets, uh, audio files, video files, it's, it's big. Um, and so I work as best I can being one person with uh, these 30 state agencies. And you know, there's a lot of turnover in personnel. So <laughs> staying up with the contacts is, is challenging, but mainly I, I work with their web managers, their public information officers, uh, that are responsible for publishing to their website because uh, we use uh, this technology that um, depends on how the websites are constructed. And so a lot of times we can't get what is publicly available, what they're publishing because of uh, some instructions on their website, which block us from getting that content, archiving it monthly. Um, uh, what else to say about that? Um, kind of a new development with this mt.gov web archive. On the left side there, again, apologies for the small print. Um, so we now have the ability to do a single search across all levels of Montana government. Uh, my primary, our primary responsibility is capturing state government information, but because there's an incredible amount of cooperation and interaction these days on the various levels of government, county level, uh, cities and towns, school districts, public library districts, special districts, tribal governments, all those levels of Montana government are taxpayer funded or entities working together uh, because of reporting requirements, because of funding requirements, there's a lot of sharing of, of information. Um, so just kind of a recent development this past year is the ability for us to also do a single search across those other levels of Montana uh, government. Um, 
what else can I say about this? Um, I think that's it for now. Yeah, plenty. Thanks, Jim. Yep. You can you can absolutely tell Jim's passion for government information. It's really fantastic. Madam Chair, I'd just like to make one comment. As a former documents librarian, um, you're preaching to the choir, uh, Jim. <laughs> and I just want to make the observation that um, government documents, both federal and state, are not copyrighted. They are one of the, the uh, publications that is not subject, are not subject to copyright law. And the reason for that is because they belong to you and me as citizens of the United States and citizens of the state of Montana. And so that I think is, it's an important element of democracy in this country. And I, it's something that as a, uh, as a naturalized US citizen, it's something that I've always found so uh, such an such a impressive thing about the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, you should know that this, that all this material belongs to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank Commissioner. You. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, thanks. It's a it's a really a monumental task for one person. And I think um, you know, we're we as a, a state library are foremost leaders in the country in our ability to provide access to this kind of government information. When I tell other states that um we really have a largely complete digital digitized archive of our legacy print, they are always, always amazed to know that. And to see this growing web archive is just really phenomenal. Could I just add to that? But I, again, I'm just one person. And so I, I, I make a public plea to these state agencies and public librarians to, to help me if they see something that they feel should be in this web archive that we're not capturing on a monthly basis or quarterly basis please let me know so we can address that because there's just i can't yeah. i can't review to make sure that it's all getting captured but it's it's an amazing technology that that is getting way more than we ever got in the past uh, mm -hmm. from the state agencies so yeah Great. All right, Marilyn. Can you hear me? All right. <clears throat> Let's talk talking books. Sorry, I had to make a little joke here. <laughs> Sorry, I still laugh at it, okay? <laughs> and you're actually gonna see Marilyn twice because um, yes. like, like many of our staff, she wears multiple hats. Yes. So right now I'm talking about talking books. So the Montana State Library Talking Book Service is a free library service for Montana residents who are unable to use standard print materials due to visual, physical, or reading disabilities. We are a regional library of the National Library Service, which is a part of the Library of Congress, and our service works in two main different ways. Um, one is that audiobooks are put on book cartridge, and those books and playback equipment are sent through the mail to a patron's home that they can enjoy while they're in their home. Um, or if a patron has a smartphone or some device that supports an app, they are able to download the BARD app, which is Braille and Audio Reading Download app, and that's a product of the National Library Service. And they can use that app to download books instantaneously to their device. Um, Montana Talking Books has a partnership with Utah State Library and their program for the blind and disabled. And Utah provides the circulation of our materials. So those books in playback equipment I was mentioning. And also they provide the reader's advisory for our patrons. So our patrons are able to call them and talk to them about their accounts, get book recommendations, that kind of thing. And they also provide some recording services for us. So they record some Montana titles there in the recording studios in Utah. Um, and actually they just started recording our magazines again. So we're really excited about it because um, those titles are Montana Outdoors and Montana, the magazine of Western history. And those are incredibly popular titles. So we have very happy patrons right now, um, thanks to the services from Utah. And then in our partnership, the Montana Talking Books continues to do outreach within the whole state of Montana. 
And then I serve as a point of contact for our Montana patrons. And we also record Montana books and book titles in our studio. And priorities, awesome, you already have it up there. <laughs> Uh, my first priority is recording at Montana Department of Transportation. Um, when the library moved into our new library space on 11th Avenue, there was not enough space for our recording studio. So Montana Department of Transportation graciously allowed us to place it into their basements. Um, that studio is almost set up. There's a few things to finalize, but we're really excited to um, see that get going and get used. That studio will not only be used to record talking book, um, Montana talking book titles, but also other state agencies have expressed quite a lot of interest um, in using it for their projects. So I would also like to explore other methods of recording. Um, as I said, the re recording studio is going to be pretty busy, so it behooves us to find multiple ways to get recording done for our patrons. Um, we have the ability now to take audio that was, say, recorded at Blackfeet Community College and splice that together with audio that was recorded at Utah State Library, um, put it into one file, and it's seamless. It sounds like it's been recorded in the exact same place. Um, I think this is really exciting. I think there's a huge opportunity here um, that will lower our cost and our efforts. Um, we won't have to transport authors to um, our physical studio here in Helena in order to get recording done. My second priority is increased outreach presence. Right now I have a pretty full calendar with many, many conferences on the schedule. And these are medical conferences, blinded low vision conferences and events, that kind of thing. Um, I'm excited to attend a lot of these. Some are brand new this year or brand new to me because of COVID. They um, had stopped um, having these conferences. So um, there's quite a large range of events that I'm going to be able to go to this year. And I'm excited to have some good face-to-face -face conversations with a lot of people. Um, I also think we can um, increase our outreach presence in more rural communities. I think there's a huge need for that. Um, I'm thinking about all the Montanans that will never go to a conference, that will never have a caregiver or a medical professional that goes to one of these conferences. And I would like to find ways, um, efficient ways, to um, increase our outreach presence in these rural communities too. Third is building and leveraging partnerships. Excuse me. <clears throat> I have a great working relationship with many organizations like Montana School for the Deaf and Blind, National Federation of the Blind, Blind and Low Vision Services, um, organizations like that. Um, but I believe there's always more effort that can be put into maintaining these relationships um, and also finding new ways to collaborate together and find new opportunities to use and collaborate our resources and make them stretch as far as they can. And finally, telling our story. Um, I would like to find ways to communicate the value of our services and our program beyond just outreach events and out, um, uh, outreach opportunities and things like that. As I said before, there's a lot of Montanans that will not come in contact with us through our outreach efforts. And I would like to find ways to communicate with them. Um, there's many different mediums I can use. There's many different ways that this can be done. I look forward to diving in and finding the best possible ways um, in a strategic way to communicate with these Montanans. There's an, uh, another reason I think that this is such a valuable um, priority for me is there are things that we do that wouldn't necessarily come up at an outreach event or in, in an outreach conversation, but I think they are valuable stories. I think they're stories worth telling. Um, an example of this is I, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to Utah State Library with two Montana authors this past summer. Um, we went there to record their book. Um, our recording studio was closed at the moment, so we, um, Utah graciously let us use their equipment and studio. The book was Thunderous by 
um, ML Smoker and Natalie Peters, and it's a graphic novel. Um, if you have not read it, I highly encourage you to. It is a fantastic story. Um, we recorded most of the book there in Utah, but when we got back home to Montana, the authors worked with Blackfeet Community College to use their recording studio there to finish the recording with Native Voices um, for the book. Um, as I said, I think this was a fantastic project. It was so cool to see it done. So many working pieces. Um, we coordinated with so many different entities and we were still able to record a Montana book even though our recording studio was closed. So again, fantastic project, but unfortunately I did not have the time or resources to publicize it, to really tell anyone about it while it was happening. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat was very dry. Yes, <clears throat> so these priorities that I have delineated here are the way to sustain and hopefully grow this program um, as I think we all would like to do. But I am only one person. And as it's been mentioned, I have to split my time between um, talking books and outreach and managing our digital resources. So in order to really fulfill these priorities, I need more resources. Um, thank you, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Marilyn. So what type of resources, Marilyn? It's very easy for me to say everything. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, who doesn't want everything? Um, honestly, more time um, would be great which translates obviously into someone else helping me. And there's many ways that that can be done. It doesn't have to be staffing of Talking Book Library, as it's been mentioned, PIO, marketing, all these things would be helpful. Um, as far as our budget goes, I'm comfortable with our budget as it is right now. Um, with We did get a lot of cost savings when we um, partnered with Utah State Library and were able to use some of those funds um, to continue doing outreach and things like that in Montana. Madam Chair, um, was Talking Book Library ever administered through the public libraries? The, the Talking Book Library is a program of the Library of Congress. Okay. And so the Library of Congress administers these regional library systems, and most of the regional library systems are within a state library. Mm -hmm. Just, Marilyn, correct me if I'm wrong, just recently public libraries were made, um, the, um, the term is escaping me, they, they can certify patrons to mm -hmm. be talking book patrons. Sure. Yes. So yeah. that that is a new opportunity for us to provide outreach through the public libraries to people in their communities. Because mm -hmm. this, this... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's um, that initiative from the um, first lady, the Imagination Library. Well, if your kid is between zero and five, mm -hmm. you can sign them up. And it's administered through the public libraries. And mm -hmm. um, Imagineif has signed up mm -hmm. hundreds of kids through this. And it's our children's librarian who verifies the mm -hmm. the family, the age of the kid, whatever. Um, so maybe something similar. And I don't know what the requirements are to, to qualify, mm -hmm. you know, to be a patron of that talking book library. But if we have that network across the whole state of, of public libraries, maybe mm -hmm. they could become um, a sign up uh, network for the talking book library. Would... And, and I know there's one organization i don't think it's rotary maybe it's kiwanis that specializes in vision impaired services lions the lions, lions. Yeah. okay mm -hmm. so i don't know that might be a network of volunteers that would be very mm -hmm. committed to signing up or certifying people to make mm -hmm. use of that program too yeah unless you're already doing it i don't know mm -hmm. ladies glasses mm -hmm. okay Other questions for Marilyn? Sorry, if I may, it's off topic, but uh, Chair Scribner, uh, can Kazi be excused? He also has a child. Oh, <laughs> sure, please. Thank you. Thanks, Kazi. Have a great weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Okay. You too, Jim, if you have a child. Okay. <laughs> 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 all right um let's see we have bryce bryce is back with us and then jen so go ahead bryce uh, genevieve do you, you want to do the handouts or yeah. okay sounds good actually i want to start by thanking genevieve for just being awesome in general mm -hmm. uh, she is amazing okay And I also have a, in addition to the handouts that uh, Genevieve has, I've got this environmental summary report. Um, as you know, we manage statewide databases on plant and animal species and the idea and habitats. Um, and the idea is we have all that information centralized in one location. An environmental summary report like the one that's getting passed around there can get generated in under five minutes for anywhere in the state. Um, so you could respond to natural disasters. You could respond to a subdivision planning process, a timber sale, anything that requires environmental review, permitting, or a planning process. Um, so I was gonna take you through the information we manage in my presentation today as kind of a reminder, some of it you've seen in the presentation that I gave last year. Um, and then, uh, talk about some recent updates for delivery and use of our information, and then a couple of the challenges that we're facing that we need your support with. So if you could move to the next slide, Genevieve, while you're doing three other things. Um, yeah, no worries. Essentially, the questions that we're trying to ask for both species and habitat are summarized in that bottom left triangle there. What is it? Where is it? And how is it doing? In this case, we've got an example of water Howellia that is in the Sealy Swan Valley as a G3S3, which means it's actually not that rare um, globally. It's not imperiled globally or locally. However, this species was listed as an endangered species on the Endangered Species Act because of the surveys that the Heritage Program did and helping the Forest Service create a monitoring plan and a management plan for the species. It was delisted a couple of years ago, and now it's in a delisted monitoring status. And it's a great example of what the program is here for in terms of centralizing information in one location and making it readily available for all the agencies and using public resources wisely, saving time and money. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna say maintaining local authority. Uh, this theme will come up later on in my in my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Just as a reminder of the inf spatial information that we manage on species. So uh, 5.2 million observations of plants and animals, uh, 16,200 of those species. So we've added since our presentation last year, uh, I think we were at maybe 15,600. So around 600 species we've added this last year to our databases. Uh, 40, 471,000 surveys, those species of concern occurrences are species that are starting to become imperiled and we wanna put them on all the natural resource management agencies radar screens to make sure they don't have to be listed. And then these predicted habitat suitability models in the bottom right, we're modeling the distribution and the habitat suitability of species. Next slide, please. This is a predicted biodiversity layer. The image on the left is for all vertebrate species. And these are individual models that are stacked up. And if we zoom into Gallatin Valley in that bottom left image there, this is being used by um, the city of Bozeman in their uh, land use planning process. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Senate Bill 382 passed the legislature in this last session and it's the Montana Land Use Planning Act. And so we are getting hit very heavily by uh, cities across Montana who have to meet this requirement of enacting a land use plan. And this predicted biodiversity layer is being very heavily used in that process. You can see areas that are predicted to be highest in biodiversity in that image are the yellowish colors, the hotter colors, and lower in biodiversity, the bluer colors. And so that's a great, again, landscape level planning uh, process that it can guide. 
the image on the right is of uh, cumulative stacked up risk of invasive, in this case, state listed noxious weeds. And then the zoom in image there on the bottom right is for Daniels County, where we've rescaled the output just for Daniels County so they can prioritize survey and control efforts of noxious weeds in their county. These type of layers are being used now in the low, low forest plan revision. They're going to be used in the state wildlife action plan. Uh, weed control organizations are using them to prioritize funding um, across the state. And we're hoping that they'll get used in VLM resource management plans and tribal management plans. Next slide, please. A lot of information on this slide, but in the upper left, you'll see this G1 S1 to G5 S5. We assign a conservation status rank to species at both a global scale and a subnational or state scale. If they're highly imperiled at either of those levels, they're a one, so a G1 or an S1. If they're really secure and doing well, they're a G5 S5. The upper right image shows all US animals, and there's a lot of red there, which is a lot of imperilment across the US for global ranks. The image right below that shows state ranks for Montana animals, and you see a lot of blue, which is a good thing. That means we've got secure animal populations. They're doing well for the most part, just small amount, uh, percentage that are, that are in the red and yellow. I wanna highlight for sure though, see that line on invertebrates and the gray bar there? That just means we're clueless. We haven't ranked them. And um, that'll be a theme we'll get back to here. Next slide, please. We also manage information on habitats, and we do that through the statewide land cover layer on the left and the wetland riparian mapping layer on the right. And in the case of the wetland riparian mapping layer, we have about 87% of the state mapped, but we're, we're still 13% away from, from getting that done. And we partner with the Spatial Analysis Lab and the O'Connor Center for the Rocky Mountain West to do that. Next slide. I wanted to give you some use statistics. In the handouts that that uh, you were given, there. Oh, okay, there's going to be two letters of support. One of from that I asked for. I asked the Montana Wheat Control Association to basically say what, how would you represent us to the Library Commission. I also asked the same of that to the Montana League of Cities and Towns. So there, those are those two support letters there. And then I also compiled just unsolicited praise. I have a, a praise folder, if you will, in my email box that when people say good things about us, I just throw it in there and I just put them on two pages for you for the last couple of years. Um, and I think I just want to refer to those to get a sense of the value that natural resource managers across the state uh, place with our the information that we're providing them. In terms of statistics of use, the upper left of this image, you'll see, this is just for our field guide, um, 572,000 users this past year, or a 7.5% increase, 737,000 um, sessions, 1.7 million page views, uh, 13,000 downloads, and 22,000 hours of use. That's an average of 86 hours of use on the average workday. So this site gets very heavily used. Um, I won't talk too much about the lower images there, but if you've got questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Next slide. Another way that we provide our information is to our Map Bureau website. This is where all that spatial information that I showed you earlier is served up. And these are users, um, that uh, colorful pie chart in the upper left shows, uh, just for, to put some numbers on there, there's about 1400 private accounts that have been established and about 1,500 agency level access accounts. The next two over from that break down that state users and the federal users so you can get some sense. And I know there's a lot of acronyms there, so just let me know if you have questions on what those are. And you can see the spatial distribution of those accounts across the state. And we also have a lot of federal users that are using this from DC and a lot of federal workers are doing a lot of work in Montana, but they're doing it from Colorado and other places. So, and then the individual numbers are there on the table to the, to the right. Next slide. Because we have so many users this last year, this is something new for our information delivery. We developed training videos and how to use 
documents for each of these Map Viewer tasks. So this is our Map Viewer web application and entry screen, and these are individual tasks within that Map Viewer web application to serve up those is kind of self-descriptive uh, titles of information there. And the environmental summary task, which is what's getting passed around, um, is the one that I've got circled as an example. So if they, if they click on that question mark for each of those tasks, they can download these training videos and how to use uh, documents to walk them through so that they can self-train at any time of the year. Next slide. I had uh, last year talked about uh, working with the Montana wood products industry and helping them uh, iron out some workflows with their sustainable forestry initiative certifications. Again, if they're SFI certified, they can sell their timber on the market for higher prices. And uh, essentially some of the requirements are that they're doing no harm to G1 or G2 species. We were providing them a thick report like that <laughs> and not really fully realizing how much work it was taking them to get through that report. So this brochure, um, and the brochure is, is with one of the handouts, um, walks them through that process. And there's an online uh, application that we went through last time that also helps them weed through that process. And I, I think that's the kind of thing that we're going to be doing more and more of to help help out agencies with their processes and uh, reduce the amount of time it takes them to use our products. And that'll make sure that one, they're using them and two, they're using them uh, likely to be using them more correctly. Next slide, please. This is a new dashboard that we've created um, this last year for weed managers, but also the public, so that weed managers, when they're interacting with the public, they can point them to this dashboard. And it does everything from showing densities of weeds. In this case, it's showing all vascular plant weeds across the state and the densities of those in red. Um, but it can also be used to see numbers and summarize data in counties, forests, tribal areas, uh, and BLM land management areas. And the weed folks uh, have been making a lot of use of this and seem to be very happy with it. Next slide. Something that we've started doing uh, about two years ago, but we really ramped it up this last year, we realized a lot of agency managers that we could create queries in the background about our data. So when new data goes into our database, a nightly query will get run. It might be a weekly query or a monthly query we can set the time that it gets run. But um, we can say, what do you as an agency resource manager want to know? If you're a weed manager, you want to know what are new weed species in my county, for instance, that are, um, maybe they're just new to the county or maybe they're a certain distance, maybe they're five kilometers or more from an existing observation. They just get an email in their inbox and then they can go to our map your web application and see where it is and then go squash it if they need to, if they're a weed manager. We also have similar reports like that for rare species like wolverine and lynx, where agency uh, managers want to follow up on those observations very quickly. So this is the kind of thing where we're not require we're not we're basically giving those agency staff a, a real heads up of hey here's this new information that you've told us you're you're interested in. Next slide. So now into challenges. Um, and this slide, uh, I'm going to actually have to my eyes are starting to change here. So <laughs> um, on the upper bar here, we've got a series of questions here that we asked our partners. Every year we hold a partners meeting. A um, couple hundred people have been attending those in recent years virtually. And we asked them um, about the importance that they place on invertebrate data. And I'll tell you a little bit more background on this. And also in question two, the importance that they place on uh, vegetation ecology data and that land cover layer. And basically you can see that in the question one there that um, about 88% of them responded, we really think an invertebrate zoologist is important. Invertebrate data is important. And we even had more people say it's just as important or even more important than vertebrate data. We'd long basically prioritized working on invertebrate data but they're telling us like, this is important. And the reason it's important, the background story on this is maintaining local authority and making sure that Montana can defend against ESA listings and, and consider those species proactively instead of getting drug into lawsuits and whatnot. 
The second question here uh, in the middle of this um, is again about a vegetation uh, data layer and the importance that they place on that. And 97% of them said, this is a very important data layer to us. Um, and this, this type of data is important to us. And again, they said, 67% um, said it's as important or, or more important than species information. So again, uh, a clear message to us that we've got to maintain this information. And then the bottom question there is, should we um, hold a collaborative um, funding partnership meeting to go after funding for these positions? And essentially 94% said, yes, do it. Um, again, just background here. Next slide. So a little bit more on the invertebrate story. I don't have a slide here for plants, but this is kind of a slide that's summarizing um, information that we manage on animal species. For plants, we are probably within 300 species of having all of the plants in Montana in our database, representation for all of them. That doesn't mean spatial representation, but it means we have a record for all of them that exist. We're probably about 300 away. In the case of animals, we're doing the black colors here show you we're doing great. We're doing good for vertebrates. We're doing good for mollusks like terrestrial snails and slugs and, and um, aquatic snails. We're doing um, okay for worms. Um, but in that upper right, the arthropods, um, the bugs, if you will, many of you probably refer to them that way. We're, we're getting an F. Um, we've got 6,858 of those in our database. Uh, estimates range up to 15,000 probably exist in Montana. And so I, I want to relay a story that happened, uh, and this has been happening more commonly, but uh, contacted by some lawyers uh, for a state agency that basically said, we, we're um, trying to write a letter about a petition on this butterfly species that has been petitioned for listing in, for the Endangered Species Act. We got it and we realized it's a look-alike species for several other species and we just don't have the expertise on staff. We couldn't, we couldn't help them. And it felt horrible <laughs> uh, to be in that situation that we're just like, we are the group in the state that people are supposed to come to for this information and we can't help. And we can see that this is a train wreck um, coming down the tracks here. So um, anyway, uh, next slide. Um, on the vegetation ecologist side of things, again, these are the data layers that we're talking about that a vegetation ecologist would help um, lead. And I really wanna emphasize uh, these bottom points here that changes are coming fast and we're not keeping up. Um, you may be able to see in that map a bunch of pink in the western portion of the state, and that's those are fires. And we're going to see more and more fires uh, as we have in recent years, and we need to keep that habitat mapping up to snuff for all these planning processes. And we need to do it in real time, and we're we're just not doing it right now. Um, and um, we need to be in a position where we can facilitate adaption to the adaptation to those ch um, changes. We wanna be able to um, put it in the, the framework of a resist, adapt, direct. And that is, if you're in a certain habitat type, do you resist, do you really go out and squash fires or do you have it already mapped as that's gonna burn and we're gonna let it burn and we're not gonna waste our resources on, on dealing with it? Um, or do you wanna direct it? Um, because we will have many forests right now that are burning in Western Montana are not going to be forest again. The, the, the right climate conditions do not exist for that to return to a forest. They're going to be a grassland. Once the forest burns, it's going to be a grassland. And so we need to have all that mapped out. Um, and in the case of wetlands, again, we still have 13% of the state. And the final one, weed information products um, are completely right now dependent on annual grant funding applications. The story with that is when the heritage program was established in 1985, uh, it was focused on native species and making sure that we were conserving native species. The heritage program never managed invasive species data until 2017. Part of the reason we agreed to do it then was frankly to keep ourselves afloat after the budget cuts in 2017. And there was a huge push at that point for um, because of invasive mussels 
that we have a central common resource for invasive species information. So we did it under a two-year grant for DNRC. Since then, we've continued to do it, and it's a complete success. Every natural resource manager out there says, and you'll see it in the environmental summary report, you've got native species data and you have invasive and pest species data in that same report, and they can look at it all at once in the common report. And everyone has told us that's what we want to see, but we've never dealt with the funding side of it. We just continue to do it. And so what I do is I go after an annual Noxious Weed Trust Fund grant, and I go after an annual DNRC AIS uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Grant to keep that moving forward at some level. But that's not dealing with it in any you know, kind of consistent way. Next slide, please. So again, overall, we're looking at the need for these two positions, uh, invertebrate zoologist, vegetation ecologist. And I, I kind of wanted to just, um, there's sort of three, I was thinking about this as I was sitting there going, ah, I would have done this slide differently. There's three kind of driving factors here. We've got increased demand for our information products that are just, the demand is going through the roof partly because of human population growth in Montana, partly because of um, rapid changes to our, uh, our habitats and our climate. Um, and at the same time, we have what Melissa started today with, or the, this work session with, we've got that erosion of buying power. Uh, we did have an aquatic uh, invertebrate zoologist at one point, but with that erosion of buying power over time, without those sort of built-in cost of living increases, we lost that buying power and that position essentially went away. Um, and uh, and again, the third, third point is just no dedicated funding for invasive species data management. Um, and we're just in a unique situation here where I'm sure that all of the invasive species people, whether they're in aquatic or terrestrial would support uh, efforts along those lines. So, these are the challenges and what what I've advised Jenny we should go after in the next legislative session. It doesn't mean that we would be seeking full funding for those. We get a, a lot of funding from our federal partners, um, and I would expect that they would contribute. And again, that to me is a success from the standpoint of they've got skin in the game, if you will, or um, you know they're they're saying it's important to them as well. So, uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Bryce. Madam Chair, I have a personal story to add. So I found on our on library site um, a beetle that has a habitat worldwide about as big as this space in the table right beside the city of Bozeman. So I took my grandkids out to try and find that beetle. We didn't find it. It was the wrong time of year or something. We had fun. Zyphian, be Ripple, Ripple beetle. <laughs> yep. Keep looking. <laughs> yeah. Cool. That's great. STEM learning. Madam Chair, I have a question. Um, how how does your work um, coordinate or intercept with what the DNR, DNR, DNRC does and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks? Those are management agencies, uh, so they're making on the ground management decisions with habitat and with species, and we're providing the information. So when they're doing, when DNRC is doing a stream permit or a wetland permit or uh, same with FWP, they're using our, our data uh, for that. Um, some of that data they gather themselves. We're not gathering all this data. There's no way we would be able to do that. We're, we're acting as a central repository for all those agencies. Um, there's a whole bunch of nuances there that I would get into from the standpoint of how we share data with the public on our websites where we share it very generally, but the agencies can see very precise data um, if they use our Map Viewer website. And that seems to be a very successful kind of uh, tight, tight walk balance there, if you will. Uh, private citizens can still request the very precise data, but in general, they are happy with that generalized way of of seeing things. And that way everybody sees it in, in some format, but the agency resource managers who are really making the decisions can be more informed in, in the decisions that they're making. And uh, along the lines of the 
um, GIS data when you said that we don't have data about this one um, branch on the tree, um, are we responsible for producing the data? Or, or where, where do we get the data for most of these species? All over the map. Uh, all of the state agencies, all the federal agencies, um, universities, uh, researchers in the private sector, we're increasingly making use of uh, citizen science data. If you've heard of iNaturalist, uh, it's a very popular application. And this last year, we're just really quickly two success stories. The first record in the state of Palmer amaranth, which is a, a weed species that if it got into grain crops could really heavily affect commodity prices. Um, and it was detected on iNaturalist. And literally a few days later, we ran a report and got it to Department of Agriculture and they squashed it. Um, also a weed crossed the divide for the first time, um, and was reported in iNaturalist. And again, within a few days, we got it over to the Department of Agriculture and they did control efforts within a couple of weeks. So that's exactly how that's supposed to work. So again, citizen science data, I just want to highlight the importance of that. So you're basically looking for an invertebrate data zoologist kind? Invertebrate zoologist. Okay. Yep. And then a vegetation ecologist. Yeah. And then funding. So those funding for those positions. For yeah. Those positions. Yep. And, Katie, have you heard goat grass? What's that? Goat grass? No. You haven't. Goat goat grass? Goat. Oh, goat grass. Sorry. Goat grass. I, 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 goat. Heard, I heard go grass. Yeah. Goat. 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 Yes, I have. Yeah. 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 That's invasive it? also. Invasive. Oh, it's, it's an invasive. invasive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You get, yeah. you try. Along the by Highwood and Belt, you try not to drive off the road because they have it, and you do not want to get the seed in your oh, no, in your yeah. tires. And then, yeah. Or I'm sure, from where you're at, you're aware of the snail invasion in Belt. No, in the Creek in Belt Creek. Eastern Heath snails. Oh. Um, this is another species that would really heavily have a multi-million dollar impact on grain prices if they got into uh, grain crops. Uh, they the are huge, uh, huge, huge numbers in the, in the town of belt and, uh, you know, right, right there on the edge of grain crops. Right. Um, yeah. so far they're just staying down in the lowlands, but Eastern, yeah. Tell me that again. Eastern, Eastern Heath snail. Heath. Heath. H-E-A-T-H. -E 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 yeah. Eek. Okay. Well, then you can, you can think about, think about the, the dollars saved yeah. with these two stories of weeds being identified so right. quickly and, and able to be addressed so quickly. That's exactly the the use case for justifying the investment in, in a position or two. Interesting. Mm -hmm. right. And again, they are positions that we had in the past and just that buying power has eroded over time. Uh, we, don't, we don't have them now. So. I just want to go back. To, Bryce mentioned the success story of uh, delisting water Howellia. And I, I think a piece that you didn't mention, um, and I think two of you could probably speak to it better than I can, but uh, when that was listed, I mean, it, you know, oh, this this plant in the water, what difference did that make? Uh, we were getting uh, bombarded with requests uh, for several summers uh, because the, the helicopters couldn't dip into ponds uh, that had water Hoelia while it was listed. And so, I mean, this was a big deal for firefighting in the state up in the, um, in the Swan Valley. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, these things make a big difference being able to, you know, and now we find out that it's not even uh, in danger, you know, at risk here in the state, local community, much less global. So uh, I think, you know, the work that's being done here is really important for a lot of different aspects mm -hmm. of life. Here. Couldn't you get the water because they couldn't pull it out with that in it? They had to go they couldn't, different. They couldn't water bucket water. like helicopter bucket out of those sites. Stick with this weed, or because they no, no, it was listed as an endangered species. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the the other uh, actually was listed as threatened. Um, the other side of it is uh, sites that are in uh, infested with invasive species. You don't want helicopter pilots bucketing invasive species and then spreading those across the landscape. So. Yeah. Nor do you want fires spreading and mm -hmm. killing them all. So it's, let's, they're balanced. 
<laughs> I'm yeah, but I, this, is a, really this is a case where you have your cake and eat it too, right? Like, right. you've got the information, you can send the helicopter yeah. pilots to the right, to the right ponds where there's no issues. Yeah. 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 Part of that, part of achieving that balance is having good information. Yeah. 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 Oh, exactly. I, um, Madam Chair, I'm concerned. I, I have this, this division in my head that's not really fair, but of all the, um, digital and all that and then the library sciences that the the needs that support the local libraries and help them i feel like we're giving them short trip here mm -hmm. and it it bothers me because that's a real important part to me of what we are doing and i i have a real heart for the library and serving people um is there a way without hurting the the schedules of people out there that we can maybe do this in the next beginning of the next meeting or something. I, I just want people with these services to get short trip. Should we get through what we're planning to get through today? And then if you have follow-up questions, we can, I mean, they'll be at MLA so they can absolutely come back and provide more information in April as well. I, it's up to you. You said you mm -hmm. wanted to end by three and I know Carmen has a long drive over a pass, mm -hmm. but. Um, I'm fine I, as long as they don't feel like we're not respecting their timeline. So, so you're, you're saying to me to get to mm -hmm. all of these. Yep. Yeah. We have we have Jen Burnell, and then we move into the the library staff, the the library development staff. Madam Chair, my apologies. I have one more question. Those two positions um, that you're talking about, um, are they data generation or are they database management? I'm confused about that. As zoologist, I would envision them actually going out there and dipping the bucket and finding the snail and you know being a zoologist, not actually managing the data and not actually being a librarian. Am I looking at that wrong? We need them to be in the office. These would be office based positions. Um, uh, think about the numbers that I mentioned there. We have information on 6,800 roughly in uh, arthropods right now. We may have 15,000. If they went out into the field, they wouldn't have any time to centralize the information on 9,000-ish species. So yeah, they would definitely need to be kind of in, in the office. It, there might be a point down the road where they do more field work, focal field work, but we, we really need it for that common good to be in the office. And they need the expertise on the topic to be valuable. Uh, in absolutely. Data. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Other questions for Bryce? That's a lot. That's a lot. And mm -hmm. what, like I said, I went back and reviewed your February report. It's just really good information. We, I feel like we get torn sometimes between funding things like this with the natural resources that we have a responsibility mm -hmm. legislatively and in our charter here to support and then new things that we're bringing on that we mm -hmm. maybe can't support ourselves or work with. And, and it's a really tough balance there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel an obligation to these programs like this one that we're already mandated mm -hmm. to do and to do it right, which I think it is being done well. Okay. So thanks, Tammy. And plus the, the best calendars are come from Bryce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that the history portal? Yeah. Okay. You guys ready? I'm Jennifer Burnell. I think you all have all met me before and I've gotten the opportunity to speak to most of you before. Um, I run the history portal and I work with one colleague, Dave Col Colo Maria. Um, if we go to the next slide, I want to talk today about what we are, um, where we work and how we accomplish the work we do. So basically we work out of five buckets of work, um, the two of us. And I think you are aware that the History Portal is a robust e-resource for information about Montana and Montana communities for Montanans. 
Um, we, rec we collect and build the content working with libraries, museums, and archives. And then we have a responsibility to make Montanans aware of the resource um, through outreach. We also um, have a responsibility uh, to create ways to make it easy and enjoyable for people to engage with that content um, and to use the content. And then we collect data um, that tells us how we are doing and to inform our future decisions. And then we share this information with our stakeholders. And we support those using our content by answering questions, keeping our website maintained, and making it user-friendly. So if we can go to the next slide, what that means um, for the last year in our workload is in this um, graphic here. Um, under the content bucket, we added 28 new collections to the history portal this last year, and we added content batches to 29 existing collections. Um, we added a total of 6,700 6, new items, and we created four exhibits and six adventure lab tours, which is an app-based touring um, application. In our outreach, we reached, um, I can't say, I should say millions, I guess, of people through uh, Facebook, what is now called X, not Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we posted to each of those what, every day this last year. And then we created a newsletter every week and sent it to our um, subscribers. We attended seven conferences. We visited 16 sites and we developed numerous partnerships. I, I, don't, I can't quantify that because it's a lot. <laughs> I don't have a good number to give you. Um, through our education and engagement, we uh, conducted a short story contest and we had 140 entries last year. We conducted a meme contest and had 212 entries. And this year we piloted our first Lego contest. We had 41 entries and we had about 135 people attend the event here at the Lewis and Clark Public Library in town. Um, and then throughout the last year, Dave and I have made about 22 presentations. Um, last year, we also had a huge effort to migrate to Google Analytics floor Four to keep track of our data. So if you're looking at the data collection reporting um, bucket, that was a huge lift that Dave did. And through that, he also developed and learned how to develop Looker Studio, which is a Google product that supports Google Analytics 4 and allows us to create more in-depth dashboards. Um, that informs our decisions and helps us plan for the future. Um, we did commission reports and NAC reports. We helped um, inform the LSTA report that Rebecca does, and then we use all of this data to develop new goals. Um, and then, then in the last column there, we provide technical support through user tickets. Um, I have to be perfectly honest, we used, we've used we been using Zoho, but every time I get an email, I'll just hit reply. And so I'm guilty of not like putting it in the ticket system so it gets counted. So I know that's underreported. Additionally, Dave was not in our Zoho account because there is a seat cost. Um, when Amelia left the agency in December, it opened a seat basically that we had already paid for. So he got um, signed into that program. And since December, we are making a concerted effort to put all of our tickets in the ticking system, including our responses to research questions, which is what a lot of our tickets are, are pertaining to. Um, and we are moving to, uh, as you heard from Kenny, service to service now. Um, we do maintain our website, and then we also have to submit tickets to Recollect, who is the provider of our platform, when we have problems with that. So that's kind of the breakdown of our work for a year um, for the two of us. So if you go to the next slide, what does that mean? Um, we know that our page views have increased by 34% from 2022 to 2023. So in blue, the blue columns there are from our page view numbers for 2022, the orange are for 23. Um, and we know that there are several factors that have contributed to the increased page views. Um, we know one is through uh, our outreach through social media and our weekly newsletters. We also know that having the Heritage Center um, or the Historical Society's Library and Archive closed has sent people to us as a trusted resource. They rely, are relying on us very heavily. And the Historical Society sends people our way regularly who are looking for materials. Um, we also know that uh, our contests have driven traffic to the site. And I'd like to point out an activity timeline there on the bottom of that uh, um, chart that kind of shows when throughout the year we have hosted different activities. The short story uh, contest is right now, January to February. 
Um, the mean contest we hold in May, and I'd like you to see the gigantic jump in page views this last May, that's directly attributed to the mean contest because we chose to use our Recollect platform for people to vote this year. And we, and we do not have anything else in our stats like Facebook click-throughs or things like that that would contribute to that. That is all related to the mean contest. Teacher workshop we held in 2022, and I did stick that in there just so that you have an idea we're doing that every other year. And then the Lego contest was this last December. Um, I did also list below our plans for the coming year. We are in the short story contest right now. Oh, stay on that slide, sorry. Um, we're in the short story contest right now. Um, we have 94 story submissions in a week yet till that closes, and we'll see a gigantic uh, flurry of activity next week as teachers finish that project in their classrooms and submit those entries. We're gonna do the teacher workshop in April. And um, on that bar chart, if you were to add January of this year, we've surpassed May's numbers. And I think it's directly attributed to the fact that we announced the, the short story writing contest and the teacher workshop coming up. Um, we're gonna offer the meme contest again in May and we'll do a new improved and bigger Lego contest this next year, which I can tell you more about in a little bit, but Jenny kind of alluded to that this morning. So um, if we can go now to the next slide, uh, I wanted to share some quotes with you. And I know this is a little small. I hope you can read them on your document. I know it's really small. Um, I am just really pleased that the Lego contest, we got several thank yous from parents who came to that event. Um, this first one is from Ann McCanley saying that her eight-year-old son is a huge Lego fan and was able to participate. He found his research for his photo um, on the Historical Society, and then he was off and running and he even researched his topic even deeper, which she felt was just an amazing opportunity for her son who loves history. Teacher workshop, we have a teacher who attended in 2022 who would like to come back, and she's also written here that because of her participation, she is including her students in some of the contests. And then I had a researcher reach out to me just this last two weeks that said, I use this all the time. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you continue to be here. And he talks about how he's an enrolled member of the Blackfeet tribe and he specifically uses different types of content as a really related to that. So why we can talk about all the data in the world, but sometimes I think it's really important to understand that the individual user gets so impacted by the work that we do. So um, if we can go on to the next slide, um, I'd like to talk about our goals for the coming year, which you're going to see look a lot like what we did in 2023, because it's what we can sustain with two people. Um, so we will continue to uh, uh, work on getting new collections, new content and exhibits. We are hoping to add some story mapping using Esri tools. Um, Dave is now learning and getting trained on how to do that. Um, we'll continue to do our outreach. Um, there's nothing new in that column. Uh, the teacher workshop is new in the education and engagement for this upcoming year. Um, we have to balance that with what the number of people that we invite to that. We limit it to 20 because the workload that it creates on the after the workshop. It's one thing to plan and present and to create the workshop itself. But on the back end, we've asked teachers to write exhibits and submit those to us for um, publication on our website, which takes a lot of time and effort on our part. It, we transform it from either a PowerPoint or a Word document to a, a full-fledged exhibit on our site. Um, we will continue to do the mean can contest and expand the Lego contest and continue to do presentations. We will now don't have the heavy lift on because we've transferred everything to Luke, uh, Google Analytics 4 and have Luker, Luker Studio set up. We do have to maintain those products. Um, and continue to use that data to inform our decisions and make reports to our stakeholders. Um, but in the technical support, we are, as Kenny mentioned this morning or this after lunch today, um, that we're moving to migrating to ServiceNow. And uh, with that comes an update to our knowledge base so that it's up to date and accurate. So there's some work to be done in that category. Um, we, I wanted to, talk to just really briefly some of the things that we have done um, aren't just impacting people in the state, but that um, the writing contest as an idea is something that I've been reached out to by Minnesota to see how they could replicate that short story contest. Um, it was the Minnesota Reflections, which is 
the similar platform to Montana History Portal um, because they thought it was a great idea. Um, so they want to do that. So we're having an impact in in uh, with our peers who are doing similar types of work and things that they could think about doing. Um, and then with our Lego challenge, as Jenny mentioned this morning, we really want to increase that to get public libraries more involved. And we would create kind of a kit based off of our experience last year that would be downloadable and shareable so that they could run local uh, competitions. And then we would bring that up to a state level competition um, here. So I think that ends what I want to talk about. Thank you. Wonderful. Questions for Jen? What did you mean? You said that something closed you got from the Historical Society. I didn't quite follow you there. Because they are renovating or building right. a new building, their library and archive is closed. You can't go there and do research right now. Okay. So um, we are seeing a huge influx of people using our site because when people contact them to come and make an appointment to go see their archive, they tell them, no, you can't, we're closed. And they, you don't have access to any of their materials. So they're, they are sending them to the history portal. as a So when they course. open, will we be duplicating or will they be duplicating us? No, so they contribute a lot of the content that's on the history portal. Um, so they have already digitized a lot of those records to make them more widely accessible. You don't actually have to handle the photos, which degrades them or the documents. So they've scanned them and made them publicly accessible through our website. Um, so we're not duplicating that effort. Um, we actually are making it more accessible because the only other way you can see content that's at their archive is to make an appointment and schedule time to go in and request to have it pulled off out of storage to look at. So they uh, need you. They mm -hmm. need us. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Jen? Anybody need a quick stretch before we bring on our library development services? <laughs> okay. Do you think we can do this in five minutes? Can we be back in five minutes? It's stored in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Here, Lee, do you want some mm -hmm. of this? No, I actually have water in the car. Okay. But, but I think I'm going to go for something. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go use the restroom. <laughs>
That's all I need. Mm. Okay, and I'm just waiting for Amy's email. Yeah, because boy, do I mm -hmm. need to wake up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or you, or you the, the Zumba channel. Mm. Yeah. I'm just doing it. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah oh. this oh yeah TikTok mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that oh. one yeah yeah she needs yeah. to do that <laughs> mm -hmm. little little brain brain wake up yeah really hard amy's gonna she's emailed me her presentation oh here it is so that you can mm -hmm. start mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. All right, we are gonna close out with resource sharing and consulting and learning. So my name is Kara Orban and I am the consortia coordinator here at the Montana State Library. And how this next portion is going to go is I'm going to briefly introduce resource sharing, what that means in statute and how we're defining it and the programs that we're managing and some of our challenges in those programs. Uh, Amy Marchwick is going to talk about the shared catalog in greater depth, and then she'll pass it back to me, and I will talk about OCLC Group Services, the Montana Courier Alliance, and Montana Library to Go, and how all of those build upon the shared catalog and provide resource sharing opportunities for all of our libraries across the state. And so I wanted to start by reading to you from the Montana Code Annotated. This is Title 22, Chapter 1, Part 3, um, 328. It's the Statewide Interlibrary Resource Sharing Program. So resource sharing is uh, defined in statute, and it says that the commission shall establish a statewide interlibrary resource sharing program. The purpose of the program is to administer funds appropriated by the legislature to support and facilitate resource sharing among libraries in Montana, including but not limited to public libraries, public library districts, libraries operated by public schools or school districts, libraries operated by public colleges or universities, tribal libraries, libraries operated by public agencies for institutionalized persons and libraries operated by nonprofit, private medical, educational, or resource institutions. We are supposed to do all of that. That is our statutory mandate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do a pretty good job. We do not have uh, funds appropriated by the legislature specifically for this program. And so we have put together our programs from a combination of federal funds, LSTA funds, state funds, coal tax, general fund, and proprietary funds, such as the uh, funds provided to us by Montana Shared Catalog and OCLC Group Services and Montana Library to Go members, and then the Courier Libraries fund most of that program. And so we do what we can with the funding we have. It would be great to have some funding from the legislature to build out these programs, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, that's a that was a very lengthy definition of resource sharing, and we've tried to wordsmith a non-jargony definition. From my perspective, it means two things. Uh, from the patron side, it means that I can get what I want and need from my local library, regardless of where I live in Montana. If I live in a small rural community, if I live in a larger community, it doesn't it shouldn't matter. I should be able to get what I need from my library. And from the library and library board perspective, it means that we, the library, can offer the best service to our community more efficiently and more cost-effectively than if we were trying to provide everything at an individual scale. And why is this important to us? Well, I, I thought it was interesting that earlier, Erin uh, had identified some of their standards for the geospatial information program that are very similar to our priorities, saving time, saving money, reducing duplication. Those are also our priorities. We wanna create access to a larger collection for Montanans, regardless of where they live. We wanna save the time of our library users and 
creating more efficient, scaled up programs can do that and create a better quality experience for users. It will save the library money and it will save the library staff time so that they can focus on those hyper local needs. So how we do that is we provide the project management for these programs. That means helping coordinate the collaborative efforts of libraries. We manage the contracts, we manage the cost formulas and budgets. We uh, configure the software or Amy and her staff configure the software. We work with the vendors. We are constantly on the lookout for uh, better options for our vendor relationships. We help coordinate purchasing and we help those groups to strategize so that they can do better coordinated purchasing. And we can talk about that a little bit more when we talk about partners. We have a physical delivery contract for courier service with Montana Air Cartage. And we are also looking into other options for, for expanding our courier network. And in a little bit, I'm going to show you a map of what that currently looks like. So we're looking into a relationship with FedEx to see if this could improve both the speed and reliability of our delivery service, and also perhaps provide us with some better data. And then OCLC group services, which was mentioned earlier, this is a very, obviously a very large contract and it's essential to the functions of our um, libraries across the state. We have 274 members in OCLC group services and they, they use this service for both cataloging and interlibrary loan uh, tasks. And I will go into more detail on that in just a little bit, but right now I'm going to turn it over to Amy so she can go into shared catalog. Hi everyone. So I am Amy Marchwick. I am the lead system administrator for the Montana Shared Catalog. It is a cooperative project. We provide member libraries with the library software system and support. And the software and services that my group provides is very much the utilities so that the librarians can focus on best serving the library users in their com communities. They don't have to worry about the back end of the software. They don't have to worry about having a physical server in their building to host the library check in and check out software at its most basic. We handle that for them. We are a multi-type consortium. So we have public, school, academic, and special libraries in our consortium, which Kara just listed to you from that section of the Montana Code Annotated. Uh, the State Library administrates it with a five-person team. It started in 2002 with 17 libraries. If we can go to the next slide, you'll see uh, 21 years later, and we've just added two new libraries and um, bringing us to over 200 member libraries. So you can see we've grown a lot from those original 17. We're all across the state now. Um, our libraries are regularly circulating more than 350,000 items per month. And we have over 2.6 million circulations so far this fiscal year at our libraries. Uh, shared resources as a core tenant of the consortium what we share with our members is they share the system, the software, the server, they share the records on the system and they share the support that my team provides. This really enables cost efficiencies and service efficiencies that they don't have duplicated servers, duplicated staff at every one of these member libraries. It allows members to be more effective in what they do for their communities instead of spending those resources on in-house replacements for what the state library can do. The single standardized system that we have them on allows us to help develop those libraries through networked services provided by providing the connectivity and access um, for things like Montana Library to Go and other digital collections like what Kara mentioned. Uh, for instance, recently an MSC system in worked with Dave from the historical the history portal team to link their digitized records of yearbooks to the bib record in our system for those same yearbooks at the various local libraries. And so when a patron searches for them, maybe the library is closed, they can see the link and jump right to the history portal so they can see it that evening instead of having to wait. Um, the single standardized system also allows greater ease to start new services and distribute them to our member libraries. We don't have to go around and say, oh, we need five libraries to pilot this and see how it works. We can plug it into our system and roll it out to all 200 plus libraries at once. 
but our member libraries are still individual institutions with the local control to best serve their own communities. They're still individual libraries. They just are sharing the software system. Um, another example of the cooperation we enable is the sharing groups, which utilize the State Library's Career Service, both of which Carol will be talking about more. We have three sharing groups on our system with over 40 libraries. Um, in amongst those three, and they collaborate even more closely than our members generally do to give patrons expanded access as seamlessly as possible. Kara's got a great example for this coming up, but in the partner sharing group, their, their patrons have access to over 900,000 physical titles, which is more than any single library could provide based on their sizes. And they can use their card at any location and and then I'll save the rest for Kara's little <laughs> presentation so I won't step on hers, but it's the seamless access that we're going for there. The goals of the Montana Shared Catalog is to continue to provide excellent service and support for our existing members. We're, that's what we're there for, is to help them do what they need to do and get back to their serving their community. We would also like to stabilize our cost formula. The majority of our costs are covered by that proprietary fund that Kara mentioned, which is member library fees. Our members pay us, which we then pay our vendor mostly. Um, and those fees are determined by a cost sharing formula where we try to make it fair for the different sizes and types of libraries. Our current formula is pretty old, quite a few years old, and it has some variables that can cause really problematic swings. Like if something changes at the library, they're their bill can go up 27% or drop 27%, and that is really hard for them to plan around. So we'd like to stabilize that, get a new cost share formula that will um, eliminate those swings. Drink your dry throat. We'd also like to continue to expand our sharing groups. In the last, just over the last couple of years, we've had some new libraries join partners. They've jumped right in. Um, but we'd also like to grow the shared catalog. We st still accept applications and still bring on new members. Like I said, we just brought on the Billings School District, which has 32 branches, and then the Harleton Public Library. So a much smaller library, but it, they just started, went live about three weeks ago. And they're loving it so far that I've heard. So that's great. Um, there are 14 public libraries in the state that are not yet members of the system, most of those are very small libraries, very little ones. Um, so for our funding requests or priorities, oops, I forgot a couple slides, sorry. Uh, this is just some of the stuff that we provide our members. On the top left is what the check-in, check-out interface looks like. And it does much more than that, but that's what patrons think of when they think of library software. It just keeps track of the check-in and check-out. On the right, is our online card catalog that patrons see. Every one of our member libraries has a customized interface here so they can choose what they want to display and how they want things to show up for their patrons. And that patrons can search just what they can get at their library. And then in the bottom left, it's the knowledge base support portal that we provide to our member librarians so they can get help from us. And then just some basic stats there from the last fiscal year. We had 4.7 million checkouts by Montanans in our system last fiscal year. So, and we provided support for 1,300 cases from the librarians. Um, so our funding request is over, um, we would like to cover what we currently collect in member fees. Um, so we're thinking, um, if we could cover the member fees, that would significantly benefit them to members if those costs were covered because they could make their budget more available for their local programs and collection development instead of paying us to pass on if we had legislative funding to support the vendor payments that we have to make. Uh, it would also reduce the administrative burden on both the Montana State Library and those member libraries by um, eliminating the invoice process. We have to come up with their fees, invoice them, they have to cut checks, send it through their business office, that could all be eliminated. Uh, additionally, cost is a barrier for a lot of those remaining public libraries that are not on the shared catalog. Even though we prorate and 
try to make things more affordable for those small libraries. Some of them just don't have the budget to pay what we would need them to pay. And so if we could cover that, then we could bring them on board. Uh, it also includes costs to migrate those public libraries onto the system. We pay our vendor to help us bring their information over from whatever they're using into our system. That can vary between about $5,000 to $30,000 li per library, depending on the size. We can, however, reduce that amount for the migration costs if we migrate those libraries in-house, if my staff, my team does um, that migration ourselves, it just takes longer than if we pay the vendor to do it. And then additional staff to maintain existing service levels. Our team is actually very small compared to similar consortia around the country and around the world in terms of staff per library. We do run very efficiently and effectively, but consortia growth would require inst increased staff as we're currently seeing between 100 and 275 support requests per month. So our, our cases are growing higher and there's five of us. So we have to, and that is what I have. So if there are any questions. Madam Chair, um, as an example, about how much does Bozeman pay for member fees? Let me pull that up. I, I know a couple other libraries off the top of my head, but I did not look at Bozeman's. Um, I can tell you as I'm pulling up my this file that the a couple of the libraries that recently we have um, brought on board we're currently using our vendor separately from us as we um, and then they joined us so they kind of joined our sharing group and they both saved well over fifteen to twenty thousand dollars with our group purchasing power their bill dropped as they joined us. Let me see this. It's by year. They were both large libraries. Um, let's see. Bozeman, their projected cost for 2024 for this fiscal year was um, $37,000. So Bridger Public Library um, is much, much smaller. Their cost per year is 1,600. So in, in the original starting of the shared catalog, one of their goals was to make it affordable for even those libraries that wouldn't have the money necessary to pay for it. So at that point, the current cost share formula, the larger libraries are assuming a little bit more of the burden to make it affordable so that their neighboring libraries can also be members. So that's another resource sharing thing here. We've got a very cooperative team of libraries as our members. Follow up, Madam Chair. Um, you said that you would like taxpayer funds to cover what we currently collect in member fees. Are those member fees for the shared catalog? Yes, I, I, if I understand what you're asking, that just just the member fees we collect just for the shared catalog, because yeah. we so, do a, a request, we do collect fees for a couple other programs. But yeah, that in my for my request, it would be just what what my team. And what would that total be? Um, right now, we are collecting about 490000 from those libraries. It was our last, um, I think, our last budget amount. So they cover the vendor fees. Um, we have a five-year contract with our current vendor and some of the staff time for um, that provides the support for them, as well as the administrative fees that we just have to indirect services cost that the state of Montana passes down to us. And then I think Amy made a good point. We also want to make it affordable for those remaining libraries that are not so in the shared catalog the as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's 14 no. publics and there's very, a very much higher number of schools, but I don't have that number off the top of my head. Cause so it, then schools hmm. would be able to be on board also. Yes, we have, we currently have a lot of school librarians. I, there's a breakdown somewhere, but yeah, like Billings Public School just came on board, Missoula County Public School District 
is in our system, but we also have very tiny schools, the Lima School District. Well, the Lima School, it's it's one school. Okay. Does it cost, you're right. <laughs> Does it cost per school? Like if those 14 schools came on, would it be more money? Um, it it does. You mean, would it, would we have to pay more to our right. vendor? To, o, to a OCLC or where? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, It where we run into that, our cost with our vendor is based on um, system usage. So we have built in some flex there where we have room to grow between now and when our next contract is negotiated. So adding those libraries now would not increase our current our contract costs with the vendor. So that that would, if they joined and we didn't have the money to cover um, from the legislature fund to cover it, it does bring everybody's costs down a little bit as we spread it amongst more libraries, which was another reason why they've been able to grow as they have is that as every member library joined, it, it is supposed to, it spreads the cost out, but costs increase every year. As we've talked about, your mm -hmm. spending value goes down. So their, their increase, their increase in bill is less than it would be. So nobody's bill goes down on anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, um, would it be fair to say that some of those tiny libraries you just referenced, if they didn't have access to the shared catalog, they might have nothing? or a manual system of some sort. Correct, we um, have brought in many libraries in that we're still using um, the physical- Yeah, cards. They, mm -hmm. Physical cards, they date stamp. Yeah. They they automated as they joined us. And I think that's probably the case for at least a few of those 14 publics that are out there now is that they're, they're small enough that they're still doing things very manually. And there is some time burned, well, not burned, there's some time involved in getting up to speed on using the technology and learning that. But then even after that, it tends to save them time. They're not, you know, manually going through their their card. When I started at Belgrade, we every day we had this is the date and you'd go and pull out all the ones behind that and you'd write mm -hmm. the overdue notices. Mm -hmm. And now you don't you just print the overdue notice that comes in your software and you mail it. So it's a time saver that way. And not to belabor this, but um, the other advantage is that um, they have access to the collections of all of the other libraries that are on the shared catalog. Correct. So for these tiny libraries, that exponentially increases the amount of information that their patrons have access to. I think that's really worth uh, remembering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Amy? And Chair, yes. can you give an example of one of these 14 libraries that's very small? I would assume their cost would be proportional to their population served. Can you can you give an example of the cost of them joining this I uh, think, out of pocket? I think that I can. Let me um, find one. Actually, Tracy... <laughs> I was going to say, I have, I have Belt and I have Shoto Teton on this list. I just have to find a library that's in our system or existing that's about the same size, which I don't have on this spreadsheet. Who's, who's about the same size as Belt? Say Jessup? Bridger. Yeah, I was thinking Bridger. Bridger. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it would be, so if it's for Belt, which their, um, their service area population is 1,424. The last time I got that updated number, um, it would be about 16, between probably 12 and $1,600 a year. It varies a little bit with our current cost share formula based on usage, the size of their collection, and the number of patrons that they have registered, which that's part of the, we would like to stabilize that so that it doesn't vary okay. as much. Um, you also said that there would be some savings they would realize in labor. So they might save $100 a month in labor to pay the $1,200 to join the system. Yeah, and, and that is is one of the things that from our small libraries to our larger libraries that have benefited. Um, a lot of libraries that have joined, they a lot of them have had like a server, a physical server, their own machine in their building that had their, their current library software on it. And 
many times they have not had the money to upgrade those. They're sort of on their last legs. They're 10, 11, 12 years old. And so just even the, bur the burden of that, they no longer have to work. I'm trying to remember what library it was I we brought in in the last five years who they would, you know, you want a backup of your data. You don't want to lose all your cataloging and your inventory data. So they take turns, they save it to a disc and they take it home each night. So it's not on the premises, right? So they don't have to do that anymore because our system handles all of that automatically. So they, they, have, they save some costs there as well. And then there's the cost of cataloging that would be provided. I mean, would be provided by this service, mm -hmm. um, which is labor intensive and- It is. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for Kara? Thank you. Yes, I am going to share my screen. Okay, we're often talking about our programs from the library perspective and saving staff time and, and funding for libraries is certainly valid. I, I wanted to walk through what this looks like from the patron perspective and to illustrate that there are different levels of value that can be achieved through these programs and particularly through the shared catalog as it's coupled with our other resource sharing programs. So I'm using an example from my home library here in Helena, Lewis and Clark, and a partner's library, which I'll get to in just a bit. And so this is the interface for the catalog, the Montana shared catalog of which Lewis and Clark is a member. Lewis and Clark is not in a sharing group, so they have opted not to share their collection with other libraries at this time. And so whenever I search for a book or item in Lewis and Clark's catalog, what I see is what is available in their system. So they have branches throughout Lewis and Clark County. I searched for Kathy Facet, the author, and I found three titles. And you can, I know this is kind of a small screenshot, but that red button to the right says place hold. So it uh, looks like a couple of these are on the shelf. I could place a hold and have somebody pull it for me. If it were checked out, I could place a hold on it and wait for it to show up. And as the patron, I don't care which branch it's coming from, and I don't care how it gets to me. I just hope that I'm going to get it in a reasonable amount of time. Now, here is the catalog interface for the Glendive Public Library, which is also a shared catalog member. As you can see, the interface looks very similar to Lewis and Clark's. Glendive, as you can see, uh, and in the banner, they are also a member of the sharing, the partner sharing group. And so what that means is that in addition to sharing software and costs with other shared catalog members and sharing the expertise of our shared catalog staff, they have agreed to opt in to a sharing group with, I think it's 38 other locations, including branches throughout the state who are sharing collections with each other as if they are the same system. And so what this means for the user is that when, if I'm a Glendive Public Library patron and I search for Kathy Facet, I am going to find books in my results list from Missoula, books from Imagine If, and it looks like there are some books from Great Falls, Livingston, Lolo, and probably some others. And so if I would like to check out Kathy Facet's Country Garden Quilts, I can place a hold on that book and expect that it's going to arrive on the hold shelf for me in a few days, hopefully. Maybe not all the way across the state in a few days, but that's, that's the ideal state that we want to achieve. 
Uh, and I don't care where it's coming from. I don't really care that it's coming from Kalispell. I just would like to have that book and I see it's in the catalog and with one click, it is on its way to me in a matter of days. So what's happening behind the scenes here? First of all, how did these records get into the catalog? Well, every shared catalog member is also required to be a member of OCLC Group Services. OCLC is a library cooperative that is based out of Ohio, and they provide a unique suite of services for us. It's a sole source contract. We haven't found a competitor that can offer what OCLC is uniquely positioned to provide, which in this case is a worldwide database of bibliographic records. So what you see here on, on the screen, these records, they are also in the WorldCat database. And you can find library records from all over the world. There are half a billion items listed in WorldCat. And uh, so the purpose of the shared catalog being part of OCLC is so that they can standardize the records. So the way you're gonna catalog this record in Glendive is more or less the way you're gonna catalog that record in Missoula or any other shared catalog uh, location. And they can share records with each other. So somebody catalogs this record, okay, it's already in the system. All I have to do is attach my library's holding or you know, my local item to that record. So that saves a lot of time for the staff not having to catalog, not having to duplicate that effort. So as far as getting the book from Kalispell to Glendive, fortunately, Glendive and Kalispell are both using the courier. And so instead of putting that in the mail, Kalispell is gonna pull that book off the shelf and put it in transit and then put it in a courier crate. And then it's going to make its way across the state to Glendive. Glendive's gonna check that book in so that the patron knows it's ready and they're gonna put it on the hold shelf and the patron shows up and checks it out. It's really easy for everyone involved. Now, when I, I did this presentation for my 12 year old and he said, it really seems like you are throwing shade at Lewis and Clark, which was not the intent. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis and Clark has their own reasons for not being in partners and we respect that. It's, a, it's the local choice. Each board gets to decide whether or not they do this. But as a Lewis and Clark patron, I can't look in the catalog and see that Kalispell has this book. I can't place a hold on Kalispell's copy through the catalog because they're not in the sharing group. So if I wanted that book, I would go to OCLC WorldCat, that global uh, bibliographic database, and I would search for Kathy Fats' uh, Country Quilts, and then it would show me oh, there's 394 libraries all around the world that have this book, but, and then, then it's going to geolocate because I'm in Helena. It's going to say, well, the closest one, the closest library that owns this book is Missoula. And then there's, there's Flathead has it. And then going beyond Montana, oh, there's a couple of libraries in Idaho that own it. Uh, because Lewis and Clark is on the courier, they can easily request, make an interlibrary loan request for this book. It's a few more steps for everyone involved to do it this way. I'm gonna have to be savvy enough to know that I can go make an interlibrary loan request. I'm gonna have to put in my information. I'm gonna have to give them some bibliographic information about the book I want. And then the Lewis and Clark staff is gonna have to take the time to research. Where, where can I get that book? Are they gonna charge us to loan that book out? How are we gonna get it here? If it's coming from outside of Montana, they're gonna to have to mail it to me and so on. So it's several more steps involved if you're not a partners sharing group. There's just that one little red button you click if you're in the partners. If you're not in the partners, you're going through this other step. But this is an essential um, service. In fact, it's required in public library standards. You have to provide interlibrary loan services. So if you're not in partners sharing group, you're doing ILL through OCLC. And another nice thing that the shared catalog does is they automate um, the updating of OCLC records for their members so that they can stay in compliance with that public library standard. And so once that item is in process, it's hopefully coming to me in the courier. And currently we have 47 locations in the courier network. So here is our slide. You saw that slide that Amy showed you earlier, the shared catalog members, as you can see, they're all across the state. 
And then on the right, we have the existing courier network drop sites, which primarily run along the interstates and up Highway 93 and then down into the Bitterroot. And so there is uh, quite a large area in Montana that is not served by physical delivery at all. And so this ease and efficiency and cost savings that uh, sharing group libraries are able to see through their shared catalog membership is not available to a large portion of shared catalog members across the state. What that means for them is that if they want to fulfill their duty to provide interlibrary loan, they're going to have to pay a lot more and they're going to get a lot less for their money. So for example, I have props. <laughs> this is, let's pretend this is library mail. 3.38 a pound, $3.38. I weighed this with my kitchen scale. Two books, I've got Moby Dick and Frankenstein here. That's what $5 will get you in the mail. Here's what $5 will get you in the courier. I, t I promised my kids I'd bring their books back. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. <laughs> so five crates can go out for $25 a stop. And so libraries like Kalispell, libraries like Missoula, libraries like Whitefish, libraries like Polson, they are, they're maxing out their stops. They are getting that value and that that rounds out to about 30 cents per item as opposed to about you know five bucks for a couple books. You can see as a cost savings, that's not available to the majority of shared catalog members at this time because we need to expand the courier network. We would estimate, and this is a pretty rough estimate, but we would estimate that to do three day a week service for 82 library locations, we'd need about $450,000. So we're, we're far off from that capacity, obviously. And that is something we we went out for our legislative request last session. And uh, the priority at that time was hotspots for the legislature. And so we're, we're grateful to have that program sustained, but obviously we have a need in supporting physical delivery infrastructure if we want to expand the value of uh, shared catalog partners to all of our uh, shared catalog libraries. Uh, really quickly, I just wanted to mention that we also support electronic resource sharing. And these are all of our library partners across the state who participate in Montana Library to Go. And Montana Library to Go is another program that continues to grow year after year. It provides ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and the great courses and universal class uh, through the Libby app. And 14% of Montanans now have a Montana Library to Go account. That's a, about a 3% growth each year. That's 151,000 borrowers. Last fiscal year, there were 1.3 million checkouts in 124 different locations across the state. We have 66,000 items in the shared collection, which are selected by uh, librarians across the state on, this, on the volunteer selection committee. We have 63,000 holds currently, and that's something that if you talk to anybody who's a Montana Library to Go user, they're probably going to complain about the holds time. Last year, uh, the average wait time was 42 days. Now it's 49 days. And so that's indicative of the increased uh, demand on this service. Also, we've been fortunate over the last few years to receive federal pandemic um, relief funds to shore up our uh, remote library services while libraries were closed. We received American Rescue Plan Act and CARES funds. We received some funding from the governor's office to be able to bolster our uh, electronic, uh, our shared budget for our Montana Library to go, but that money is no longer available to us. And so now we're seeing that dip in being able to meet the demand. And so our holds time is creeping back up. And I will take any questions that you have. I have a question. Um, do you have numbers for how many physical books or how many checkouts 
um, happen because of the shared catalog and the partner libraries in the courier system? And how many checkouts happen through Library to Go? Here I'll have the Library to Go number, but for fiscal year twenty for fiscal year twenty three, four hundred and twenty four thousand items transited for to fill holds in the partner sharing group. So that's the number of physical materials carted around that a patron wouldn't have had access to, except maybe through an expensive interlibrary loan if we didn't have the courier system, for instance. Exactly. Not 424,000 books or pages of articles or books. That's physical. Yeah. Yeah. Books, DVDs, books on CD. Uh, Montana Library Go was 1.3 million last fiscal year. And who pays the um, you, the United States Postal Service fee? Yeah, that's a great question. That comes out of local library local library uh, budgets. Fund. Yes. And I will also mention that for OCLC group services, state libraries contribution is 36% of the overall contract and uh, local libraries are paying 64% and participating uh, annual fees. Uh, Madam Chair, um, perhaps Kara, you could also um, remind people that the academic libraries participate in group services as well. And I believe MSU Bozeman pays over 30,000 a year. They, they, yes, they definitely, um, it's a heavy lift for the academics. So we contribute to the public libraries in that respect. And we can get your books. Abs yes, through interlibrary loan. But with the courier stops at our library as well. Or did I yeah they did I'm not sure that they do now okay maybe it was just between BPL and our library mm -hmm. that they, they did it I think Mansfield has a stop okay. I had a question ma'am I'm confused about one thing you can pay to join your library to the shared library but not have the courier service to your area or yes that's correct why would you join if you can't get the books so they join the shared catalog to get the software and the support from the team. The sharing group where they can actually ship the books back and forth is an extra that they can get. There's no additional cost to be a sharing group member where the additional costs come in is that you it takes staff time and to ship the books around, which is harder if you're not being reached by that courier service. So the majority of the libraries that are not in the sharing groups that are on the shared catalog have voiced that it is the cost of shipping the materials or they're not in a place physically where the courier goes that prevents them from joining. Yes, I, I could see that. Okay, thank you. I do have one person online for public comment. Um, if we could do that now, maybe I could ship it on. Sarah Wager, are you still there? Hi, yes, I am still here. Um, can you, I don't know. If yeah, you can you, you're good. Go, yep. Okay. Can you see me? I don't know if you can. We can. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, let me find my public comment. I had it up. Um, okay. Hi, commissioners. Thank you for allowing public comment for your work session in preparation for the upcoming legislative season. My name is Sarah Widger. I am the vice president, president-elect for the uh, Montana Library Association. And I would just like to share the Montana Library Association's support of allocation of funding towards the resource sharing program for Montana libraries. MLA is incredibly proud to work with the State Library in offering solid programs, continuing education opportunities, promotions, and services for the benefit of all types of libraries in the state. And we, MLA, will be presenting a resolution to our membership in support of this resource sharing program and associated legislation. And we would be grateful for this commission's support for the statewide interlibrary resource sharing program. And because it benefits all Montana libraries and Montanans. And then as a as an aside, I just want to say I've been um, listening in all day, and I must say that it is incredibly impressive for, uh, to hear all about all of the programs that the State Library offers and to hear directly from the staff members that run them. And I'm um, greatly appreciative of the work that you are all doing. So thank you.
Thank you, Sarah. Are there any other questions for Kara or Amy before we move on to Marilyn? I have a follow up. Yeah. Um, so the 425 items on the Physical courier cost about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Is that right? Does that reflect the cost of the catalog being on the shared catalog and having the courier? And those costs enabled those four hundred and twenty-five checkouts that wouldn't have been there because you could only have had access to your local book collection. Is that correct? So I'm. Um I'm not sure there. So 424,000 items move around the state, but I'm, I don't know that we said a, the courier cost. Did you say an I, amount for the courier? I, that was a projected cost for how much it would cost to have a statewide, uh, a sufficient statewide network. Currently we are investing 65,000 into the courier this includes uh, looking into the regional uh, alternatives and shipping alternatives such as FedEx. And that serves, we've been serving 47 libraries and on basically a, a total um, contract value of about 80,000 a year. But that's that's the map that I showed you, the existing state. So. So the existing 424,000 items that got shipped last year are just along that red line that she showed you. And that is the price that she just said, right? The About the 80,000 plus, I think that's supplemented by library funds, right? They have that, to pay that's, for- Well, that's the entire thing. Okay, so yeah. So $80,000 to ship the 424,000. The larger number is, <laughs> the the larger number is what it would take to expand that red map. Okay. To the whole state. So you'd be going from 40 some libraries to, we have that discussion, 87 or 89. That that would be, uh, yes, that would be if we were serving every library system, mm -hmm. public library system, I should say. Mm -hmm. And then well, how much does it currently cost us to have the 1.3 million items checked out through the Libby app? What's the cost of the Libby the, app? Yeah, that's a good question. So the state library is paying for the platform, which all libraries use, and, the, and which is basically the Libby app and the uh, the shared platform. That's that's twenty thousand dollars for the platform, and then the member libraries pay for essentially all of the content, with the exceptional one time only investment that we might make if we have you know, surplus or we have uh, remaining funds at the end of the year. So we have ninety three participating libraries, and they. Their last fiscal, this current fiscal year, they uh, generated three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for their content budget. I would say they need at least twice as much to keep up with uh, the demand. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Kara, if we were, to, if if a funding request were to go forward. What should it be? Eighty thousand or four hundred and fifty? Four hundred and fifty. Yeah, let, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. I mean, why? Why should we not serve the entire state? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, is that just for the shared catalog, or is that including the career? That, that would that would that would include the career. So, if service. we if we think about the fact that as as Kara and Amy and actually Marilyn is going to contribute to as well, we think about the fact that. Um, all of these components are necessary for the, the infrastructure and to leverage the infrastructure so that Montanans have the, the information they need. We need all of these components. So we need the shared catalog. We need a statewide courier. Um, we want every library to, to be a member of the shared catalog. We need adequate funding for Montana Library to go so that people don't have to wait 49 days to read an ebook. And then there's a, a wealth of opportunity for other kinds of e-resources that are used um, by public school and academic library patrons, state employees, et cetera. It, it's all a part of this interlibrary resource sharing program that's been identified in statute, but never funded. So um, Marilyn, why don't you go ahead and go? 
Um, are people good at returning them? Re returning their physical books? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have a loss there or usually it's not? They get them back to, does the service like Amazon include return? <laughs> <laughs> so are you meaning the ones that, that get shipped to other yes. libraries? Yeah, the, the losses there are comparable to what che you check out from your library that is owned by your library. It's a very small percentage okay. that doesn't come back. So it's just, it's the library patrons still bring their books back, even though they're from other libraries. And then the courier service takes them back to the original library. Okay. May I just make one comment? I would like to commend you both on a great presentation, and I'm I'm super impressed that you were able to pull those numbers up so quickly. That's you tell your twelve year old that his mom did great. <laughs> All right. All right, again, my name is Marilyn Bennett, and I am here today to talk about the digital resources that the Montana State Library provides for its patrons. The Montana State Library patrons are Montana State employees, state agency contractors, and staff and board members of Montana libraries. We subscribe to research databases for our patrons' professional research needs. Oh, good, you already there. Um, <clears throat> So our databases are housed on the, at the web address that I have on um, the page right there. And if any of you would like a library card so you can tool around in any of the databases to see what we offer and um, how our patrons can get access to articles, I would love to give you a library card. Just please let me know. Um, I have three of our most popular resources listed up there, ProQuest, ScienceDirect, and EBSCO Host. And those research resources are provided through our membership in the Trails Consortium. Next slide, please. So Trails stands for Treasure State Academic Information and Library Services. I love acronyms. <laughs> so Trails is a consortium of academic tribal and special Montana libraries. And there are many benefits for having a membership in the um, consortium of trails. And one of the largest that we have found is the cost reduction and cost avoidance that they have helped us with. Um, this is done through the power of consortium buying and their ability to negotiate with the research platforms. Um, an example of this cost reduction that we have experienced is before joining Trails, our subscription for ProQuest, which I had listed before, um, just for the State Library, what cost $21,632 per year. By joining Trails and joining their subscription to ProQuest, our cost is now $4,500 a year. And that's pretty significant savings, especially with databases. Um, and we were able to take those savings and gain additional access to more databases. We gained access to EBSCO, Cambridge, and ScienceDirect. And I also manage our OverDrive ebook collection, and this is not um, gained through Trails. This is a resource that I manage on my own. Um, this is a professional ebook and e audiobook um, collection. It's professional development. Um, recently, um, Montana Department of Transportation and us at MSL realized that our overdrive collections, um, MSL or MDT had one as well. We realized that our collections were very similar. They had many of the same titles. So it didn't really make sense for them to carry their own collection when it was a duplicate. And so we decided to merge our collections and we now have a shared collection that um, the MDT librarian and I manage together. And we both contribute, contribute content to that. Um, and through that, we have gained some really awesome books about trains and roads that I'm really excited to read. <laughs> so um, we gained some really, really good content as well um, that we wouldn't have had if we did not have this partnership. And this also led to a cost savings for both agencies. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
these are the priorities I have identified. Um, first, more investment in trails. We want to continue to add more resources for our patrons, and we believe all state employees should have the same access to research resources as university students, and trails is a clearly a beneficial way to achieve that. Next is exploring new avenues for collaboration with other state agencies. Just like our shared over, overdrive collection with MDT, there are opportunities to collaborate with other agencies and with other resources. And I would like to be able to put in effort in finding those opportunities and having more collaboration with other state agencies, I think is always beneficial. And that is it, any questions? Marilyn, do you happen to know off the top of your head how much, or maybe even Brian, um, how much Trails invests in these kinds of e-resources and databases for their uh, academic libraries? I'm sorry, Jenny, I don't, but I, I do know that it has resulted in significant savings mm -hmm. for all of the uh, members of the consortium. And the other thing is that there are uh, things like uh, pu publications from Elsevier that mm -hmm. the smaller schools would never, Elsevier is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. It's a scientific publisher and, and that those smaller schools would not have access to that because it's not in their budget, but they have been able to get it because of um, being part of the, the consortium. Mm -hmm. And just to remind you, the consortium is essentially, it's a buying club. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you, you get bigger and because of that, you're a bigger customer and you have more leverage with the vendors, that's basically how it works because okay. you're negotiating bigger contracts on behalf of the whole group. Okay. Okay. I tried to go on this, this this is the one I couldn't get on, right? Because you have to be a member or something. I tried to go on it and it said, you, if you're not a school employer or university, is that, am I doing the right one here? Uh, yes, um, yep. the majority of our resources on the page that I had listed, you have to either have a library card right or be on the state network in order to access those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I couldn't see what was on that, but is that why you asked about if we wanted the cards? Yes, yes. Um, okay. I would be happy to give you a library card so you can look at that. Okay, Yeah. and that's for public schools and universities? Uh, that is for um, state agency employees and staff of libraries um, and board members of libraries and state agency contractors. Could, could I just add that you are welcome to come into um, Montana State University Library and you can use all of those resources if you're on site or you could go into Mansfield, any of the academic libraries. Mm -hmm. You just can't get remote access unless you belong to the community that has licensed it. Mm -hmm. We are student. Mm -hmm. No, you know, the public, we're, mm -hmm. a, we're a land grant university. We're a public university and the public has access to all of our resources. We can't make it all available remotely to them, but sure. they can use it in the building. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And and Marilyn touched on this. That's been a real driving purpose for us. Um, the state is investing through the university system in these awesome research resources. What sense does it make that state employees then should not have access to it? True, we can go into those facilities, but of course we're here in Helena. And so uh, that's really driven us to participate in trails and uh, to try to ensure that if state government is making important decisions here, we have access to great information uh, when we're making those decisions. And I didn't mean that as a negative. I just wanted to make sure it was no. the right one that I was trying. You gave me something on it, and then I went to look it up and couldn't get on. <laughs> I thought, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope we've really illustrated how important, uh, again, these investments are, uh, you know, Brian's point that we're leveraging resources and buying power when we come together. We're also building communities that collaborate really well together to better serve Montanans, you know, with this vision of serving Montanans really from birth to death, that entire lifelong learning spectrum. Um, you know, our approach is to think about the users rather than trying to think about, you know, is this a public or a school or an academic or a, a state agency library? It's just what kind of resources can we bring to bear? How can we leverage those resources to best serve those individual users? And, and we're doing it in an incredibly cost-effective way. Uh, I, I think that 
it's one of those opportunities where um, there's a need for more investment to make sure that everybody in the state can participate and, and then that we're leveraging the resources to our maximum ability. Um, I have a question. I'm confused overdrive versus the Libby app. The Libby app is basically public library fiction, nonfiction. Um, what's on overdrive? <laughs> That's a tough one. Dueling overdrives. <laughs> um, yeah, it is confusing because we talk about Montana Library to Go, which is kind of our local branding. Overdrive is the company that provides the whole thing. And Libby is the app that you can put on your phone. But there's also a browser version of OverDrive where you can check things out through the computer. Just most people aren't doing it that way anymore. So Libby's the name of the app. Oh. And actually, um, we uh, state agency um, employees now have to use Libby in order to access our OverDrive collection. So that has been an interesting experience um, because you have to add your library card to your other library cards in the Libby app and suddenly you see, you know, professional development books along with um, like fiction books. It's mm -hmm. interesting. I don't know that I'm any less confused. So it's, um, it's one vendor, one vendor overdrive, but they sell separate collections. So Montana Library to Go is buying the fiction collection from mm -hmm. them. The MDT MSL is buying the professional development collection mm -hmm. from them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you can hold on, Genevieve. I'm Tracy, lead consulting and learning librarian. And um, Jenny and I discussed putting me last because I have no legislative asks. And I wanted to, just the educator in me is like, this was a lot of material. I would be happy to do my presentation at your April meeting. Would you like that? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. I When I saw the agenda, I was like, I'm okay going last, Jenny, and I'm okay waiting. So, and many of you have worked with me. Um, I would, for the sake of the, the staff that work on the consulting and learning team, like to share, but mm -hmm. I just, this was a lot. Mm -hmm. So this, this was a lot. And commissioners, thank you so much for your active participation. You know, I, I, I hope we achieved some of our outcomes in helping you feel more confident in your understanding of the programs and the resources necessary. Again, today is not about making decisions. Today was about uh, helping you better understand the programs, the goals that we are setting for ourselves, where we see these programs going. Um, we've recorded this work session. It'll be posted online. So please refer back to it. I hope I saw you all taking notes. So I know you took notes, refer back to them. Uh, and then we'll have a, a fuller conversation about what of these priorities we think we can carry forward into the, the legislative session. I make a motion that we adjourn. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Please. So I've, I've been sort of upstaged by the entire team, including especially Tracy, who uh, declined to make public comment. But I would like to comment just for the trust for Montana Libraries, which is your library foundation in support of, of your good work. Before I do so, I would like to say that I just mailed a small hardback book to my friend in Michigan for $4.87. Mm -hmm. So you can see the scale of savings, which working statewide kind of gives you. So that's terrific. Um, the, the, the trust, is, I wish the entire trust board was here. Uh, one of our best members here, Robin, uh, does know all this this stuff and that's terrific. I wish that the rest of the board understood the the, the depth and quality uh, and the breadth of, of what is being offered by the state library. So I, I think that would be really helpful for us as we work to, to serve you I just will note that we are eager, really eager to go to the legislature and ask in early 2025 for a uh, aggressive resource sharing, funding of the resource sharing statute. 
so that every library in the state has a chance for this really rich panoply of library resources. So let us know how we can help you. We're eager to help.